Uh, the committee will come to order and welcome and thank you for joining today's hearing where we'll hear from Secretary Vilsack from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And uh, before we proceed, I want to take the opportunity to, uh, if you bear with me, just uh, offer, uh, uh, you know, kind of offer a blessing over our proceedings today and, and quite frankly, to lift up in prayer those who most recently have been uh, in our nation uh, impacted by just evil and unwarranted uh, violence uh, in the incident that, we, that we've recently seen. So if you will, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we, we love you so much and we thank you for, for all that you provide for us, the protections that you provide for us, how you uh, light our steps, Lord. And we're, uh, Lord, this morning we, we do lift up those, uh, those citizens of this nation that have, um, um, have been impacted and and especially those in the, in the, in the, in the just recent day have been bat, impacted by just unwarranted and, and evil vi acts of violence. And so we, uh, we pray blessings over those who were lost. We pray uh, blessings for those family members that are in grief, uh, that, you would, uh, that they would find um, comfort uh, through a relationship with you, Lord. We, uh, we, we lift up and, and we uh, ask your blessings over each and every person here, our, our members, our secretary, the, all of our staff, Lord, you, you, uh, uh, you know our prayers before we speak them. So just ask that you minister to those prayers. We pray for those who provide for this nation, those hardworking uh, farm, ranch, forestry families, those who work in processing, Lord, that offer your blessings over them. Lord, now we just, uh, uh, I pray over this, uh, this hearing that we have, that uh, um, we, um, that all that we, uh, we accomplish here will serve, uh, uh, serve this great nation, and quite frankly, bring a, bring a blessing on to you. And I pray this in the name of my Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you all. Um, and uh, uh, after some brief opening remarks, members will receive testimony from our witness today, and, and uh, then the hearing will be open to questions. And so good morning, and welcome, Secretary Vilsack. Uh, uh, first of all, on behalf of Ranking Member and myself, we want to thank you for the opportunity that we had here, uh, I think within the past month, times, days go by rather quickly here, where we were join you and Mrs. Vilsack and us, our spouses, and, and uh, Senator Stabenow uh, and Senator Bozeman for uh, uh, breaking some bread. Uh, it was a great dinner, and, uh, and, uh, and I, we both greatly, greatly appreciate that. Uh, your appearance today comes at a critical time before the committee when Congress will soon come together to debate and authorize a farm bill that will have implications across agriculture, the agriculture value chain for years to come. And, and that's where I'd like to start this morning. The farm bill is one of the few remaining pieces of legislation steeped in consensus and makes every attempt to provide producers and consumers with predictability, sensible policy, and fiscal responsibility. Uh, the return for this bipartisan, targeted, and uh, statutory investment is more than 43 million jobs, 2.3 trillion in wages, 718 billion in tax revenue, 183 billion in exports, and 7.4 trillion in economic activity. And almost like clockwork, Congress comes together to reauthorize a farm bill with specific direction to the department uh, for implementation and execution. Each chamber goes about an extensive review of current law and implementation. The House solicits input from members from both caucuses and the diverse stakeholders across the 12 titles and with technical assistance from the administration. In most instances, the bill follows regular order in both chambers. A conference committee produces consensus legislation and the final bill is voted on and sent to the president's desk. Not everybody gets what they want. Diverse viewpoints find consensus and we all agree to move better policy forward. It's this process that creates buy-in and trust, it's this process that makes it work, and it's this process that provides sustainable solutions. Now some may wonder why this is worth reiterating. It's because when parties begin to act unilaterally, trust begins to erode, and our process fails, and our work of meeting the needs of all Americans becomes that much harder. Unfortunately, this administration has consistently, and without hesitation, upended congressional consensus through a series of unilateral executive decisions that will resonate for decades at a time when both the farm sector and debt is skyrocketing and the farm safety net is dwindling. Whether it be the expedited shoddy updates to the Thrifty Food Plan 
or the multi-billion dollar eliminate smart, uh, pi climate smart pilot, uh, rulemaking outside the, the scope of authority granted by Congress or the demonization of certain industries, frankly, we're at a crossroads. Now, despite these frustrations, with Secretary, I, I know that our members in partnership with you and your team at USDA and our counterparts in the Senate have the capacity to work in concert. In the wake of record inflation, a global pandemic, and geopolitical turmoil, American farmers, ranchers, foresters, producers, and consumers are suffering. The best way to support them is to pass an effective farm bill that addresses deficiencies in the current safety net and builds on the many tools that we have to support current and future generations. Uh, you say so yourself, Mr. Secretary. Our country depends on it. So, Mr. Secretary, thank you uh, for your time here today, and I look forward to a productive meeting. And with that, I'd now like to welcome the distinguished ranking member, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, for any opening remarks he would like to give. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. And uh, Secretary Vilsack, welcome. Uh, Secretary Vilsack, I am very disturbed about the direction we're going in at this time with the Farm Bill. I'm very concerned about the impacts that certain pieces of legislation is having on SNAP. And let me just give you some data. AgriPulse recently reported an estimate that Dusty Johnson's bill would kick 1.5 million seniors and families with school-aged children off of SNAP. An analysis published by the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities has much more dire data. They say three million parents and grandparents of school-aged children are at risk of losing their SNAP benefits that impacts more than four million children, another two million older adults without children are at risk of losing benefits. Just right there, that total comes to 10.5 million seniors, children. And let me tell you about our veterans, USDA's, USDA's, your own economic research service reported that between 2015 and 2019, that more than 11% of working age veterans lived in food insecure households, and that veterans have a 7.4% greater risk of food insecurity than the general population. Now, Mr. Secretary, as I'm talking about this, I'm reminded of those great words from David in Psalms 40 and 41, where he says, blessed is that person that helps the poor, for the Lord will help him in his time of trouble. I cried unto God, and I waited with patience, and he delivered me. He lifted me out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. He set my foot upon a rock, and he established my goings, and he put a new song in my mouth. We have got to make sure that this farm bill is a new song in the mouths of our veterans, our children, all of that, and not to mention our farmers who are struggling. As the New York Times recently reported, we're losing 17,000 of our small family ranchers every year. And many thousands of them haven't earned a profit in five years. So Mr. Secretary, let us make this farm bill 
Sing in the night with a song for our veterans, our poor, those who need our help. And let that song be entitled, Congress is helping us who need the help the most. I thank the gentleman. Uh, with, um, the chair would request that other members submit their opening statements for the record so our witness may begin his testimony and to ensure that there's ample time for questions. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome back to the committee our witness for today, USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for joining us and, and we will now proceed your testimony. You'll have five minutes. Uh, the timer in front of you will count down to zero at which point your time has expired. Secretary Vilsack, please begin whenever you're ready. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And to the ranking member, thank you as well. And to the members of the committee, uh, it's an honor to be here today. I think members of this committee would probably agree with me that one of the major responsibilities, certainly not the only one, is for the USDA to work in concert with the Congress to advance the economic well-being of our rural areas. And certainly the key to that is the economic health and well-being of our farmers, ranchers, and producers. The reality is in the last two years, we've experienced record levels of net cash income in farm, in farm income. But not all, or for that matter, many have benefited from that record level of income. In fact, uh, the ERS recently reported that nearly half of our farmers over the last several years have not made any money at all. And that roughly 40% of farmers have made money, but the majority of money they make actually comes from off farm income. So that means that the top 10%, those who sell more than a million dollars of product, have done quite well. And they should, because they're extraordinary farmers, ranchers, and producers. But I think we have to focus as well on the 90% that haven't fared as well. The President likes to talk about rebuilding the middle class from the bottom up and the middle out, and I think we have a classic opportunity here as we discuss the Farm Bill to do just that. I think we have two choices uh, that confront us. We can either get big or get out, as uh, Secretary Perdue once suggested, or we can build more new and better markets, providing entrepreneurial opportunities for that 90% so that they benefit beyond just simply selling livestock and crops and government payments. I think we have a new opportunity. Uh, as a result of resources that are available to the Department of Agriculture, we've worked, <clears throat> we've worked very hard uh, to expand value-added opportunities to create uh, an opportunity for our farmers to take full advantage of uh, emerging ecosystem markets where they're paid for the environmental result that they can achieve on their farms. Uh, looking for ways in which they can convert agricultural waste into ingredients for bio-based products, like sustainable aviation fuel. Working to establish a local and regional food system which complements our production agriculture system. And working, of course, to take full advantage of the opportunities to embrace renewable energy on the farm and to provide that to their community. Mr. Chairman, these are real opportunities for us uh, to expand more new and better markets and to create an entrepreneurial surge in rural places. Now, this is not a new issue and not a new challenge. In fact, in 1979, uh, then Secretary Bob Berglund came to this committee and essentially talked about the same issue. And in fact, it goes all the way back to the beginning of this department. If you look at the first report of the Commissioner of Agriculture, at the time, a fellow by the name of Isaac Newton, not the real Isaac Newton, <laughs> Commissioner Isaac Newton, uh, in his preface to a 632-page report that he made to the President on the first year of the Department of Agriculture, uh, he mentioned the concern about the consolidation of real estate in the hands of a few. So this is an issue we've been dealing with for quite some time. But I'm optimistic and I'm hopeful uh, that as we work together to fashion a farm bill, that we indeed can create uh, real opportunities for small and mid-sized farming operations. Because when they survive and when they thrive, it means that there are more people living in rural communities. With more people, we can keep those schools open. We can expand hospital and healthcare opportunities. We can create new opportunities and new customers for those small businesses uh, that are so vital to a, a, a small community. So this is, a, I think, a, a significant and pivotal and transformational moment for this committee, uh, and we look forward to working with you. Just a, a word about the other major responsibility which we have at USDA, which is to provide not just food security, but also nutrition security. 
I'm more than happy to talk to the chair and to the members of the committee about the Thrifty Food Plan, uh, about work requirements, and about the SNAP program and some of the other nutrition programs. I look forward to questions that you may ask about what we did and why we did it and the statutory authority for doing it. Uh, but I will tell you that we are excited about the opportunity to see real opportunity not only to reduce food insecurity and nutrition insecurity, uh, but also to create a connection between those in need and those who produce. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I look forward to the questions uh, from the committee members. Uh, and with that, I'll yield back my time. Well, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much uh, uh, for your important testimony today. At this time, members will be recognized for questions in order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority members, and in order of arrival for those who joined us after the hearing convened. You'll be recognized for five minutes each in order to allow us to get as as many questions and as possible, and I'll try to be, uh, quite frankly, I, I'm anticipating great participation today, so I promise to be heavy on the gavel at the five minute mark so that we can uh, uh, have everybody an opportunity to be able to ask their questions. Um, and with that, I recognize myself for, uh, for five minutes. Mr. Secretary, as, as you know, the most recent omnibus appropriations bill contained the Sustains Act, which allows USDA to accept third-party donations to fund all Farm Bill conservation programs. Now that the Sustains Act is law, recognizing that was signed into law just a couple months ago, uh, the end of December, uh, where is the department with using this expanded authority across USDA conservation programs? Mr. Chairman, we are uh, working extensively to try to ad address the need to get information out uh, to producers so that they can take full advantage of our conservation programs, which includes the opportunity for us to uh, partner with uh, those who are interested in supporting conservation. Uh, I think there are a number of opportunities and a number of, of uh, partnerships that are already being developed. Uh, we're looking at a number of environmental and uh, conservation organizations that have indicated a desire to partner with us. Uh, you mentioned the Climate Smart uh, Commodities Program. Uh, that is also an example as well. Uh, we have uh, in, in incredible numbers of partnerships there that will be advancing significantly climate smart conservation practices. Uh, so I think it's, uh, we're well under our way uh, to trying to meet the needs of that uh, and the goals of that particular legislation um, and expand beyond it. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, there's some definitions that are just, um, I think there's a lot of uncertainty and confusion about what they mean, but uh, within, uh, uh, for example, uh, you know, and maybe you can define for us, uh, ultra-processed food. Um, any, <coughs> any idea how that would be? I mean, that, that's one that's creating a lot of confusion. Do, does the, the department have a clear definition for what is, I mean, we're using that definition, the department is. Do we have a clear definition of what ultra-processed uh, ultra food is? Um, Mr. Chairman, I think what we're attempting to do in the dietary guidelines is to ask a series of questions about the nutritional value uh, of foods that are being submitted to folks. We, we I think ultra-processed obviously involves uh, sort of ready-to-eat kind of uh, uh, foods that have been prepared that can be uh, put in a microwave, uh, that can be um, uh, put in a, a pot of boiling water uh, to be able to produce more quickly the food and to put it on the table. I think the challenge, I think, is to find out whether or not, as, as you are producing that food for your families, whether or not you're fully aware of the nutritional value of that compared to maybe some other options and choices that you might have. Um, and that's why we've asked the question uh, in the dietary guidelines to give, give us information. I think we're all in a learning process on this. Okay. Um, I mean, does that apply also? I mean, the, a word that, that I think everybody feels like they understand what it is, but within the dietary guidelines, uh, define what does healthy mean? Um, uh, you know, it, well, I, you know, <clears throat> I think the reality is that we now know, and we're learning more each and every day about precision nutrition, uh, that there are many uh, challenges with reference to the connection between what we eat and diet-related diseases. Uh, and I think the, the reality is that a significant amount of our health care costs are directly connected to diet-related diseases. That is to say, diseases that could potentially be mitigated or even avoided with proper nutrition. And I think that's the reason why we're investing uh, in learning more about precision nutrition so that we're in a position to be able to provide consumers information so they can make appropriate choices for themselves and their family. 
Yeah. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why it's important to have dietary guidelines. It's important to take those guidelines and roll them into the nutrition programs that we administer at USDA. Yeah, the term I use for that coming out of healthcare is prescriptive nutrition, and, and quite frankly, everybody's different. So it is really try to, it's hard to paint with a broad well, brush. The, the yeah. prescription addition, uh, 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 a definition is one in which, and we've got the GUSNIP program which does this, which essentially says to doctors, instead of prescribing medications, you might think about prescribing the use of fruits and vegetables, for example, as a way of treating a particular uh, diet-related disease. Right. Um, nutrition is fundamental to health, a fundamental building block, no doubt about it. Um, and, uh, and with that, it uh, looks like my time is going to expire before I get my question in, but I will... Uh, uh, I'll submit one uh, to you. Uh, it really is on the uh, implementation of the Packers and Stockyards Act and uh, concern I have with uh, uh, the, the GIPSA role, which is coming up for um, kind of a third, third time at bat. Um, uh, so we'll, uh, that said, I now recognize uh, the ranking member for five minutes questions. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Um, Secretary Vilsack. I'm very concerned about the drastic and dramatic loss of farms in our agriculture system. As I said in my opening remarks to you, the New York Times has reported an average of 17,000 small rancher farmers being lost every year. That is absolutely staggering and that many of our uh, farmers have not made a profit in five years. And so we went to work and we got a bill that we're moving on that was set up a safety net for our small uh, rancher families. We have got to save the small family rancher and the small farmer. They're the heart and soul of our system. If we don't save them, who's going to be producing and growing and farming these huge combines? That's what happened at the other end of the supply chain with our meat packers. We had thousands of meat packers in this country at one time. Now it's only four, basically, who control 88%. Now, we've got to move, so I'm asking for your help on getting our bill that will set up a safety net for our small farmers and will provide you with some money so that you can help set up some excellent marketing opportunities so that their products can be sold. I hope you will um, support us uh, with that. Now for the veterans. Your information said that between 2015 and 2019, more than 11 percent of working age veterans lived in food insecure household and 7.4 percent of them risk food insecurity. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen and, and chairman, our food is now becoming a national security issue, especially when we can't feed our veterans. And you know, you and I have been working on this. And I've talked with you as recently as a few days ago about the problems we are having just trying to feed our veterans. Could you please comment on helping us feed our veterans and help the poor communities so that they are not cut off of food stamps. Will you help us? Uh, well, obviously, uh, Congressman, we'll be more than happy to do that. In fact, we are working uh, with the Veterans Affairs Department in an effort to get information out uh, to veterans concerning the availability of the various nutrition programs. We're also working with the Defense Department uh, to try to figure out ways in which we can make it easier uh, for military families that are because of the nature of military pay uh, find themselves in a position where they need SNAP benefits. So there are, those are two issues that we are. We're also working with our friends at HUD uh, uh, in terms of uh, multi-family uh, housing opportunities that HUD is supporting in, uh, in cities 
making sure that those facilities are, are making information available about the various uh, programs. And we'll obviously work with state, uh, states who administer this program, the SNAP program, to make sure that they're doing everything they can to get the information out to veterans. And the small farmers <clears throat> are well, able to do that, I think. It will also give you some funds to help create marketing we're, opportunities. We're, we're certainly happy to work with you, but I would also point out that we've just recently announced 31 uh, uh, grants to expand uh, processing, uh, and there's more to come. We've also helped 277 existing facilities expand their market opportunities so they now can sell uh, across state lines. And we've helped nearly 3,000 very, very small packing facilities uh, with their inspection fees based on the resources that Congress has provided to us. Thank you very much, Secretary. Uh, gentleman yields back. Now recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it's kind of hard to believe, Mr. Secretary, it's been 14 years since the first time we had one of these conversations. <laughs> Thank you, you for being back. You still look the same, and I don't. <laughs> you always were the handsome one of the two, though. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, uh, I was pleased to see in your written testimony how you note the historic relationship between federal ag policy and the health of our rural communities. As you've heard me say many times, uh, my beliefs on this topic were instilled in me by my grandparents and parents and various elders in my home community. These were the people who experienced firsthand the depths of unforgiving persistent droughts, markets upended by faraway conflicts, and monetary and physical policy that made capital more expensive and running a business much more complicated. These stories seem to have a more relevant uh, point now than ever due to the record high inflation in a surging input cost erratic weather patterns that producers are currently experiencing. And today I'd like to focus on the impact extreme weather has on production and the programs farmers and ranchers need to weather that storm. Over the past six years, impacted producers have received ad hoc assistance for extreme weather events through the WHIP Plus program, administered by the previous administration, and the ERP program administered by your agency. ERP phase one followed the WHIP Plus model basing 2020 and 2021 coverage on crop losses. Producers who were left out of phase one were given assurances that they would be captured under the ERP phase two. However, when the regulations came out for ERP phase two, FSA had completely changed course and moved from a model based on crop losses to one based on revenue losses calculated by tax year. The reports I'm hearing from Oklahoma is that due to the vast changes in the program, the drought impacted producers that were left out of phase one are not qualifying for phase two under the new parameters. So I ask, what is the status of ERP phase two? Or as my constituents would ask back home, who's qualifying? <laughs> uh, well, Congressman, I think part of the problem and the challenge is the congressionally mandated 70% threshold that has to be met in terms of uh, the ability to, to access those resources. People are bumping up against that 70%, but they don't meet the 70% threshold. So you may want to take a look at that uh, in terms of what Congress has directed us to do. Having said that, um, you know, the challenge is that programs uh, sometimes leave out very, very small producers. They leave out folks uh, who have, have not received any assistance or, at all and who are on the cusp of losing their farm. And so uh, the, the desire for the department was to create this revenue-directed program so that we'd be able to help those farmers out. And if there's resources left over after we do that, and there may very well be, we, will, we can come back and take a look at maybe those folks who were bumping up against that 70% congressionally mandated threshold. Which leads me to my exact, that exact question. If there's money left over, will you go back and address producers who are uncovered under phase one model and the unreached under phase two? Potentially both. So the answer is yes, and I would just simply point out you're going to get a lot of complaints coming out because of the 2023 effort. Uh, you gave us $10 billion before for 21-22, $3 billion for 2022 issues. Uh, we're going to be faced with a serious disconnect between the level of, of help and the amount of money that's available to us. And certainly that's our responsibility to address that. Uh, and what are the odds that we would potentially go back to a phase one approach for the 2022 losses? Well, we will learn from the experiences of the first 
uh, iteration of ERP, and we'll certainly factor that into how we administer the, the, the program for, for this next phase. And I'd point out, too, that I encourage all of the members to t take a look at this on the farmers.gov website. It basically lays out all of the programs that are available uh, for disaster assistance and particular disasters so that you have an idea of what programs you can direct your constituents to. And I would, in cl closing note, how much I still appreciate your help on the 2012 that became the 2013 that became the 2014 <laughs> Farm Bill, Mr. Secretary. We have a very similar set of challenges, both budget-wise and the lay of the congressional land here. We're all going to have to work together to get this done. We, we are, Congressman, but I think it's really, really important for people to understand that there, there are a number of tools in addition to the Farm Bill that we have to figure out how to creatively use to be able to meet the need that's out there. Absolutely, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. <coughs> Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Costa, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, uh, Secretary Vilsack. Uh, it's, again, uh, I think uh, my, my uh, honor and pleasure to work with you again on my fourth reauthorization of the Farm Bill. And uh, clearly we have a history. I uh, uh, concur with uh, Congressman Lucas's um, reflection on the fact that uh, we got to work together on this. And it is important, as the chair and the ranking member indicated, for all the reasons that are are essential to America, which is that food is a national security issue. And uh, I think we all feel similarly about that. Uh, I, I, I want to focus on a couple areas quickly on the questions. As you know, I'm a third generation farmer and represent the heart of the um, uh, San Joaquin Valley in California, the uh, uh, incredibly productive agricultural state of California. Um, and as I look at the Farm Bill um, um, and the 12 titles, <clears throat> I'm challenged by how we overcome on a bipartisan basis the essential challenge of baseline funding on very popular programs in the 12 titles that historically in recent years have been oversubscribed. I'm talking about the EQIP program. I'm talking about the MAP program. The list goes on. I think that's going to be a real challenge as we try to put this uh, reauthorization effort together. would like your thoughts about the baseline funding challenges that the department faces. Uh, Representative, I think that uh, can lead into my comments to Congressman Lucas. Uh, as you know, the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act provides an historic level of resource for conservation, for EQIP, for CSP, for the easement program, and for the RCPP program. Uh, and I think it's important and necessary for us to understand the utilization of those resources can complement and supplement what you have to do and can do within the Farm Bill so that at the end of the day, you use all of those tools to meet the demand out there. There's clearly a backlog, and IRA is going to help us address that backlog. It's going to allow us to get more technical assistance to producers. So I would say making sure that you understand the full utilization of the resources under the IRA is one strategy for dealing with this. Well, the strategy I, is, as the chairman indicated, partnering yeah. with organizations that are equally interested in conservation well, what we're doing. And, and good, and more to follow on that, and you and your department have been very accessible in trying to work on some of these things. Time doesn't allow me, but we'll go on there. Um, also, like I think almost everyone here on the committee, the nutritional programs are a part of it. I, I look at the Farm Bill as America's safety net, and whether we're talking about for, for, for American agriculture, whether we uh, look at the nutrition programs, uh, working poor, young and old alike, uh, uh, many of the folks that uh, uh, Congressman Scott referenced in his opening statement, um, particularly in the school lunch and breakfast program, but there are a lot of other facets to it. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about the reduction of the uh, Women, Infants, and Children's program on milk and dairy benefits and reducing uh, access to dairy uh, nutrients uh, and the dietary guidelines and, and, and how we uh, work on this. Uh, I just think the school lunch and breakfast program is something that, and there's a lot of food wasted uh, that I think we also have to try to figure out how to address. And I'd like your comment on that, please. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you raising the issue about dairy uh, with reference to WIC because the reality, Congressman, is that actually more dairy is going to be consumed. Uh, I think you have to distinguish between fluid uh, consumption and, and what, we, what we drink and what we eat in terms of dairy. There, you're going to see an increase in yogurt. You're going to in, uh, see an increase in cheese, cheese uh, consumption under WIC. Why? Because we're looking at containers that are more, uh, more popular uh, with WIC. And avoids waste. Th th this is really an important issue. 
because the WIC program is supplements. And the reality is that we were providing 128% of the daily intake of nutrition, uh, of dairy. So we've knocked it down a bit. We're going to expand the number of people using uh, WIC. And so the, at the end of the day, you're actually going to see significantly more dairy being. Okay, well, well, we'll discuss that more. I just, my time's expiring here. Uh, we've had, as you know, uh, uh, a deluge of rain. We, we prayed for rain. I guess maybe we prayed too well. Um, and. Uh, but the emergency assistance program uh, on agriculture in California is really critical right now. We're assessing the totality of the costs impacted by farmers, ranchers, dairymen, and women, and I'm interested in the USDA support uh, as we deal with this emergency assistance for the losses that have been sustained. I, I actually met with uh, uh, Secretary Ross and other uh, secretaries and commissioners of agriculture from the western states last week uh, in Denver uh, and committed to working with them to try to address both the drought and the flooding challenges. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. <coughs> now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Austin Scott, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Vilsack, you have talked about the declining number of farmers in the country, as uh, my colleague, uh, Ranking Member Scott, did. Uh, the 2023 Farm Bill is currently projected to spend approximately 4% on commodity programs and 7% on crop insurance. That's less than 12% that would actually go to support production in agriculture. 82% um, of it goes to SNAP. We've all seen what happened with the price of eggs with the supply and demand issues. And um, I, I guess my question for you is, do you think that the decline in and the percentage of spending on actual farm programs is right. I mean, we're, we're, we're less than 12% of what we call the farm bill actually go into commodity support programs. Do you support that number being so low? Well, you know, I, I, I support a strong commitment to nutrition and food security, uh, Congressman. There's no question about the importance of that, not just to the people who need that food assistance, but also farmers. Now, remember, 18 cents, 16 cents to 18 cents of every food dollar uh, ends up in a farmer's pocket that's spent at the grocery store. It's also about jobs. So uh, there are a multitude of issues involving SNAP. Having said that, I think you have to look at the other steps that we can take at USDA that are, in fact, providing assistance and help to our producers. And what are those steps? Well, those steps are creating additional market opportunities. For and what are those market opportunities? Well, uh, let's start with the, the Climate Smart Agricultural Commodity Partnership Initiative. 141 partnerships, uh, investing resources to provide assistance to roughly 60,000 farmers, 25 million acres, a value added, additional value added opportunity where they'll make more money for the commodities they produce, plus they're also going to be able to comply with and, and, and take full advantage of ecosystem service markets, expanded processing capacity, providing opportunities for more uh, local and regional sales of livestock so they get a better price, a more competitive price. The conversion of agricultural waste into a variety of new bio-based products by virtue of the uh, infrastructure law and by virtue Secretary of Secretary Vilsack, I'm, I'm going to run out of time, but I, I want to, I think everybody in America who's watching this is smart enough to recognize that the volume of food, as we've seen with eggs, I mean, there are supply and demand issues there. And so now, no matter how much you give somebody in SNAP benefits, if the cost of groceries continues to go up because of inflation and bad policy, um, then they have less food to eat at the end of the day. Even if you doubled their food stamps, if the price of eggs goes up threefold, then they can buy fewer eggs with the same number of dollars. Well, the, now, let's, let's, let me, 90% of the food supply in this country, 90% of the food supply in this country comes from 12% of the farms. Now, I'm all for beginning young and small farmers. But if you don't have those large farmers out there that produce 90% of the food supply in this country, then you're not going to have the groceries on the shelf. And so I, I want to ask you again, the Farm Bill, you, you've been the Secretary of Ag for 10 of the last 20 years, if I'm not mistaken. When you were, the, when you were originally Secretary of Ag, what percentage of the Farm Bill went to production agriculture? It, it, it's roughly the same as it was. No, sir, I, don't, I, don't, I think you're, we'll, ch we'll check those numbers. But, but do you think that the farm bill, that less than 12% of farm bill spending should go to production agriculture? 
You know, that's a difficult question to answer because you're, you're, you, you are limiting the conversation to the Farm Bill when there are other things that are, that are being done by the departments. ERP, for example, that's a good example. S sir. It's ad, hoc it's ad hoc disaster assistance. There's research. There's a whole series of resor resources that are being provided that you're not including in the equation, Congress. I absolutely so support research and extension. I think the majority of that that's, that's, done, that's done right is actually done at the state level through the land-grant institutions. But let me, uh, let me ask you one other question. In the, in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, there was mo money set aside to pay off loans. You had phase one, you had phase two. You're about to come out with phase two, as I understand it. But phase one, am I correct that the loans that were paid off, if you were more than 60 days late, if you were more than 60 days late, your loan got paid off. But if you had sold your car and other assets to pay off, to, to make your note current, then, then you got nothing. Let's be uh, clear about this. If you were more than 60 days delinquent, you were brought current. Your loan was Plus next year. Off. Plus next year. Exactly. I'm, I'm, but you... Be, well, well, I'm, well I'm, no. If, you're, if, you, if, you, if, you're, if your I, loan would have matured previously, no. you, got, you got paid off in some cases. Very, very, very few cases. But, the, but, but you the, did get paid off in some cases, correct? Maybe a handful of cases, but the vast majority of people got their payment made. And then we also were, just I'm answering your question, Congressman, we're also bringing uh, the, those folks who actually did the right thing, we're also giving them the same benefit. My, t my time's expired. I'm going to be asking for more detailed information on that. Now, please to recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. McGovern, for five thank, minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Vilsack, first, I want to Thank you for saying that access to affordable, nutritious food is a fundamental human right, uh, and I couldn't agree uh, with you more on that. And I want to thank the Biden-Harris administration for hosting the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health last September. It was important, and the national strategy released at that conference is bold but achievable, and it calls upon every sector of society to do its part, and if we do, we can uh, make significant progress in any hunger in this country. For Congress, the national strategy calls upon us to expand SNAP access for underserved populations, including those subject to the harsh three-month time limit. Secretary Vilsack, can you please explain to the committee what the research shows about time limits on SNAP eligibility? There was a study done, uh, Congressman, of nine states, uh, Pennsylvania, Colorado, uh, Oregon, I can't remember some of the other states that were involved in this, but basically took a look at the three-month, uh, and, and several things came out of that study. First of all, who we're talking about. When we talk about these uh, uh, adults without dependents, who are these people? Well, they're mostly male, and they're mostly homeless, and they're mostly people with uh, educational achievements and aren't quite as high as you would expect them to be. So that would include, obviously, a lot of the homeless veterans that we talk about a lot. The second point of this study was that, in fact, it didn't impact positively when you tried to constrain the work requirements. It didn't impact the earnings or the employment opportunities for those individuals. So in other words, you can talk about constraining that, but it's, it's not going to do what you think it's going to do. Plus, you're going to hamstring governors uh, in terms of being able to deal with uh, 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 incidents and events like the one in uh, East Palestine. All right. Uh, to be able to deal with the unemployment that may result in a community by having that flexibility. So there's, uh, there's some real concerns with that. No, and I think it's important for this committee to, to focus on the research. Mr. Secretary, a few weeks ago, President Biden said in a speech on the economy that if Republicans try to take away people's health care, increase costs for, the, for middle class families, or push Americans into poverty, I'm going to stop them. Would you agree that the proposals we've started seeing from some uh, Republicans that would cut SNAP eligibility or benefits, including by expanding SNAP's existing harsh work requirements and time limits, would push Americans into poverty? Well, uh, clearly it's going to create some challenges, Congressman. And, and more importantly, I, I think we, we are seeing a reduction in the number right. of folks on SNAP because, uh, you know, the, the employment uh, folks are getting jobs, and that's good. We need to work with states uh, to do a better job of using the employment and training resources. Right. Now, that seems to me to be a more viable uh, strategy in terms of trying to get people uh, to move out of, uh, out of poverty and out of yeah. SNAP. Yeah. Now, I, I find it interesting that these bills with all these new uh, requ work requirements, there's no work requirement for people who receive farm subsidies to actually work on a farm, but I don't want to go down that road. Um, in the last farm bill, Congress passed um, on a bipartisan basis. It directed USDA to reevaluate the thrifty food plan based on four factors. 
Uh, and that update uh, has meant an additional $1.19 per day for SNAP recipients, which, which has been a lifeline, especially as we're dealing with high food costs. Uh, I think for a lot of, I want my colleagues to appreciate, this is the, this is, uh, the first time in nearly 50 years that a reevaluation re actually led to a higher SNAP benefit. So I want to set the record straight on a couple of matters, Mr. Secretary. I have a copy of the law here. I don't see anything requiring the reevaluation be cost neutral. Is there anything in the 2018 Farm Bill that required the reevaluation to be cost neutral? No, nor is there anything in the Food and Nutrition Act of 2008 which directed the Department to do this assessment and laid out the conditions and circumstances under which it was supposed to do it. And as a follow-up, would you, uh, as follow -up, would the reevaluation have been able uh, to fully incorporate those four congressionally de determined factors if U USDA had held it to cost neutrality? No. No. And, and so, look, I, I, you know, I don't know why, but as we're getting to, uh, to, to a farm bill here, we have, you know, people coming out of the woodwork, again, beating up on, on poor people. And I think we ought to be striving uh, to create a country where there's nobody who is hungry. There is nobody who is food insecure or nutrition insecure. Uh, and it goes back to your statement about food being a fundamental human right. Uh, and that ought to be the goal of every single member, Democrats and Republicans, on this committee. Uh, if we want a farm bill, uh, we ought not to screw around with SNAP. And I yield back my time. General yields back. We now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Dr. Desjardins, for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for being here today. It seems like a lot of time is being consumed today talking about the nutrition program, and, and I'm going to continue that. Uh, as we get ready to write a farm bill that uh, is going to be a piece of legislation that will set the stage for feeding the American people for the next five years, I think it's an imperative that this legislation uh, focus on putting the needs of our citizens first. Uh, Eighty percent of the spending in the Farm Bill budget goes to the SNAP program, so I, I think it's probably the most important topic we're going to talk about today. Uh, the ranking member indicated that up to 10 million people could lose SNAP benefits if uh, Mr. Johnson's legislation were to become law when uh, basically I find that interesting because about 80 percent of people across all political spectrums, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, agree that able-bodied people who can work should work. So I'm not sure why that's an argument. Do you agree that able-bodied people who can work should work? Well, it depends on your definition of able-bodied. Okay, uh, I'll let uh, Representative Johnson get to that. Okay. But most people <laughs> agree that they're, you know, if you get too many people in the cart, no one to pull the wagon, there's going to be a problem. But what I want to focus on today, uh, that I've been trying to get answers to uh, for over a year, I asked uh, Under Secretary uh, Dean last April about uh, what we're doing with the immigration problem at the border. I think that. Uh, there's no one in this room that can't look at the news and agree that we have a problem at our southern border with uh, illegals flowing in. How many people roughly are on the SNAP program in America? I'm sorry, sir, what? How many people are on SNAP program in America? Uh, pr approximately 41 million. 41 million. What percentage of those are non-citizens or illegals? Well, uh, I'm not sure that uh, illegal people can qualify for SNAP. Well, there's about 11 exceptions to those rules, and I'm sure you're aware of them. Two of the ones I'll talk about are the most common. One, if you're 18 or under, you qualify for SNAP. Do you agree with that? Yes. Okay. And if you're seeking asylum, you qualify for SNAP. Those are the two biggest of the 11 exceptions. Do you agree with that? Well, yes. Okay. So how many people... Are those 18-year-olds, were they born in the United States? No, people that came here illegally. Well, they're, if they were born in the United States, they're American citizens. Right. I'm, I'm talking about people that came here illegally. So we've had roughly 5 million border crossings since President Biden took office. He ended Title 42. He ended the public charge rule. So the question I've been trying to get answered is how many people of the 41 million receiving SNAP benefits are here illegally? Can you answer that question? Well, I, I would I would pose the the, uh, the question this way. I would say that there 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 may be exceptions to this rule, but for the vast 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 majority of those 41 million, you're probably talking about American citizens or people that legitimately are getting. Stuff. Okay, that's the that's the answer I always get. But 
the, the number the of children answer. that have come here illegally that are 18 or under automatically qualify. That's a large number of people. And the people seeking asylum qualify. And that's almost everyone that is coming here illegally. They, they know the game. If you come here illegally, you say you're seeking asylum, you get released into the United States. And uh, right now, you know, there's millions of people. When I first came to Congress back in 2010, it was said that there's about 10 million people living here illegally. Now there's estimates of 20 to 30 million people living here illegally. And uh, the, the uh, Center for Immigration Studies shows that 45% of non-citizen households are on SNAP benefits, and 21% of citizen households are on SNAP benefits. So you can do the math and extrapolate. Uh, I, I think that it's fair to say that anywhere between 10 and 20% of the SNAP benefits are going to people here illegally, and no one's given me the information I've asked for yet to disprove that. I sent a letter to you and Secretary Mayorkas last week trying to get those answers. I would urge you to look at that and see if we can get some answers before we write this. I agree with Mr. McGovern. We need to worry about feeding Americans first. Can we all agree that Americans should be our top priority when it comes to the SNAP program? Done. American I, citizens, I, soldiers, people who are needy. Sure, all okay. of those people are in, in, incredibly important to feed. Okay, so what I need from you or from your department before we write this farm bill is how many people are on the SNAP program uh, that are receiving these benefits that are not citizens? How many asylum seekers? How many children under 18? Because those right here in this rule says that they qualify, and I would challenge that 90 percent of them fall into that category. Well, a significant percentage of the people receiving SNAP are moms and dads with children who are in the workforce. Are, so when are they American under 18, citizens? you're going to see a lot of numbers, but they aren't necessarily kids who came here uh, in your words, okay. Well, well, you're not answering my question either. Hopefully, you'll respond to my letter, and we can have an answer before we try to budget 80 percent of the farm bill for this important topic. I yield back. Gentleman, gentleman yields back. Uh, now, please recognize the gentlelady from North Carolina, Mrs. Thank Adams. For thank five you, minutes. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to the ranking member as well, and uh, thank you, uh, um, Mr. Vilsack, for coming back, Mr. Secretary. I appreciate you the opportunity. But, you know, it's just really too bad that we want to penalize people for being poor. Uh, but let me just um, um, uh, raise a couple of um, questions with you. Uh, the number of, of black farmers in the United States has rapidly decreased over the last century. And as you've noted in your testimony, in 1950, there were over 500,000 black farmers in this country. And by 1997, that number fell to about 20,000. That precipitous drop in black farmers is, is part of why I joined with Senator Booker uh, to lead the introduction uh, for the, of the Justice for Black Farmers Act, which seeks to undo the harm discriminatory practices have done to the black farming community over many decades. And while we did take an important step in the Inflation Reduction Act uh, by providing over $2 billion for farmers that have suffered from discrimination by USDA, you and I both know that there's more work to be done. And I'm curious to hear from you about, uh, about the progress that's being made on the disbursement of these funds and how realistic, uh, Mr. Secretary, is it that uh, money will start flowing by the end of 2023? And what barriers have you faced determining who is most deserving of payments and what other efforts uh, are you taking to address this critical issue? We, we put out a solicitation for the national administrator of that program, Congresswoman. Uh, who is supposed to, uh, that's the deci decider, the decision maker, uh, in terms of uh, which individuals who suffer discrimination should get financial assistance. Uh, we also put out a, a solicitation to establish the regional hubs that will be the collectors of the application. We're also working with cooperator groups so we can get, ensure that the word gets out uh, to all those who believe they've been discriminated against uh, at USDA uh, in farm loans and farm uh, activities. Uh, to be able to make sure that they do uh, get the information necessary for the application. Our goal is to try to get resources uh, uh, distributed by the end of the year. And we have a very aggressive timeline, and we're going to try to meet that. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And I'll probably be in touch with you uh, later um, uh, to talk further. But as you know, uh, prior to the pandemic, USDA approved a, a pilot program to allow for SNAP beneficiaries in a select number of states to use online grocery delivery. And as we've seen during the uh, outset of the pandemic and continuing today, grocery delivery services are here to stay and are being utilized by more and more SNAP households. And in your view, how successful has this expansion into grocery delivery been? And can you speak a little bit more broadly about the importance of SNAP, 
keeping up with the way modern consumers engage with their grocery shopping and modern lives. 49 states have now uh, worked with us to create an online opportunity for SNAP families, uh, and 170 retailers, major retailers, have agreed uh, to participate in that effort. So you are going to continue to see an expansion uh, to try to make sure that we are doing everything we can to make sure that the utilization of SNAP is, is modernized. That's also true uh, in our WIC program. We've also got a very extensive modernization effort there as well. Thank you, sir. I am a, a proud uh, two-time graduate of North Carolina A&T State University, a fierce advocate for 1890 land-grant universities, and HBCUs across the country. And my colleagues and I will continue advocating uh, for a variety of funding streams for 1890s uh, through the appropriations process, like the Evans Allen and Capacity Building Grant programs. So can you speak briefly to the importance of maintaining strong partnerships between the Department of Ag and 1890 institutions and how you plan to ensure that those partnerships are strengthening, strengthened moving forward? We meet with the President's Council uh, on a regular basis. I meet with the President's Council and, and our senior staff does as well. Uh, we've increased the funding uh, on uh, both the capacity and the facility uh, portions of the budget. Uh, we've also de developed a next-gen leadership initiative for uh, not just historic black colleges and universities, but minority-serving institutions to try to create more internships and opportunities for young people to access uh, uh, scholarships. Uh, so there's a significant amount of assistance and help uh, that we are directing now to 1890s. Uh, we're also making sure that every college and university has a liaison uh, so that there's a direct connection with the, with the department. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and thank you for your uh, positive comments about uh, the need to make sure that uh, no person, no family should go hungry. Um, it is really important. It is a basic right. It's a human right, and I certainly hope that as we move forward with the Farm Bill that um, we will address that as needed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The lady yields back. Now recognize the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Crawford, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, as you recall, you and I had a conversation a couple of years ago at the beginning of the previous Congress talking about the threats to uh, production agriculture uh, and, and how that has really kind of become a, a gap in our national security. And as we were talking on the phone, I indicated then that I was offering a, a, a bill to introduce what I call the Ag Intelligence Measures Act, the AIM Act, which essentially gives USDA Title 50 authority, brings them into the intelligence community as a full-fledged member. Um, and I just wondered, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that you still support that. Um, you know, as we see foreign uh, state uh, state actors and non-state actors that are trying to undermine U.S. ag and steel technology and things like that. And so my question is, do you still believe that at this critical moment in time with the way that China and some of our other adversaries are behaving and posturing, that this sort of an office is needed, is necessary at USDA? I think it would be helpful. Okay. Good deal. Well, I appreciate that. And when establishing the office, uh, do you believe there are other capabilities that, that we should be taking into consideration that we haven't discussed? Well, we continue to work with the Treasury Department and others in terms of the CFIUS process okay. to make sure that USDA is uh, connected when it's appropriate. Uh, we've seen better cooperation uh, uh, recently in that in that space, but there's probably always uh, continued work to do in that in that area. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned CFIUS because that's exactly where I was going to go. In, in fact, uh, another priority of mine has to do with, uh, in this ag security space, has to do with a bipartisan bill that myself, Representative Stefanik, uh, Representative Costa on this committee, um, Senator Rounds and Tester all support, and uh, um, it's called the Promoting Agriculture Safeguards and Security Act, or the PASS Act. Basically, it establishes a permanent role uh, on CFIUS for the Ag Secretary, um, and, and I wanted to get your, your comments on that. I think your, your comment just now sort of is, is in line with what we're trying to achieve. So would you explain how you think your experience and the experience of future Secretaries of Agriculture would play into this new role on CFIUS as it pertains to considering agricultural needs, protecting that vital asset, uh, reviewing foreign transactions that may affect our national security? I think, I think what we're learning is that sometimes it's difficult for people to see the direct connection with agriculture, but once it's explained, uh, then, it, then it's fairly clear that there is, in fact, an agricultural interest in a particular company or a particular uh, transaction. So being a permanent member would allow us the opportunity to educate the other members of CFIUS about what to look for and what to be sensitive to 
when it comes to agriculture and agriculture production. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to shift gears on you, Mr. Secretary. As you know, producers across the country are struggling to find reliable sources of labor. Uh, many have uh, turned to H-2A program to help get the seasonal workers they need, yet recent changes to the wages for those workers will make costs skyrocket for those producers. The Department of Labor is utilizing the Farm Labor Survey conducted by USDA to set wage rates under H-2A. Yet that survey was never designed with the intention of being used in this manner and it skews the wage rates to unworkable levels for farmers. So, Mr. Secretary, I, my question is, will you work with stakeholders in the Department of Labor to address these out-of-control wage, wage rate increases? What I'm happy to do is work with the members of this committee and others uh, to pass the Farm Worker Modernization Act, which could have solved this problem, Congressman. We had a chance to get it solved. This, this body, uh, the previous Congress, passed it bipartisan way. Senate didn't get it done. If they had gotten it done, hundreds of millions of dollars could have been saved. That's the answer. That is the answer. Get that Farm Workers Modernization Act passed. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Uh, Secretary. I'm going to yield the balance of my time to my colleague from Georgia, Mr. Scott. Secretary Vilsack, um, Ms. Adams brought up the, the issue of the loans as well. Uh, my question, if, if you're going to do it based on discrimination, are they going to have to have some evidence of discrimination or are they going to be allowed to self-certify discrimination? There, there will be a requirement, uh, Congressman, for uh, establishing these, the, the nature of the discrimination that took place. So, th so they will not be allowed to self-certify? They will provide the information uh, under penalty of perjury, uh, which we think is a pretty significant one. That's, that's what, but, but self-certification, that's self-certification. So that's self-certification well, with no have, evidence. They have, to provide, they have to provide information and documentation as well, Congressman. So it's not that, it's not that they just... So they're going to have to pr provide evidence. They're not going to be allowed to self-certify. They're not going to be able to just walk in and sign the form that says I was discriminated against. No, no, that's, that's more. They're going to have to provide evidence. More than that. Okay, yes. they're going to have to provide evidence. Okay, thank you. The gentleman yield back, Ms. Crawford. The gentleman yields back. Now recognize the general lady from Virginia, uh, Ms. Spanberger, for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here, and welcome back, Secretary Vilsack. I am excited to have you here today as we continue our work on the 2023 Farm Bill. Uh, your expertise and experience are invaluable. I also appreciate your comments related to the Farm Workforce Modernization Act, which is something I continue to hear about um, from producers across my district. I was really grateful for the time that you spent in my district a few years ago as we were discussing uh, our efforts to recover from the COVID-19 crisis. And before I begin my questions, I would like to once again invite you to spend some time with Virginia's farmers and producers uh, to hear the issues on their minds as we prepare for the next Farm Bill. So I hope we can have you back in the district. Um, my first question is about the conservation title. I appreciated how your testimony uh, really seized on a point that often gets missed in the context of USDA's conservation programs, and that these are, and that point is that these programs, while really good from a conservation perspective, good for the planet, they are also essential economic components of a successful farming operation. I hear that from producers across my district who utilize these programs. Um, as farmers are both responding to the impacts of the climate crisis and looking for new markets for their crops, investing in climate smart agriculture not only protects our planet, but increases resilience of the farmland, increases marketability, reduces input costs, and raises crop yields. Um, and so I'm really proud that in the last Congress we passed the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which included the largest single investment in conservation since the Dust Bowl. And these investments will soon be paying dividends uh, for producers across the country through programs like EQIP, RCPP, and CSP. So as we approach the 2023 Farm Bill, there is broad consensus among groups representing growers, including the Farm Bureau and the National Farmers Union, that conservation funds included in the Inflation Re Reduction Act should stay in place, and I agree, um, but I am concerned about not sustaining higher funding levels for these historically oversubscribed and underfunded programs into the future. From your perspective, how should this committee be thinking about future funding for conservation programs in the context of the 2023 Farm Bill? And what might the value be to farmers if we were to sustain these higher levels of investment over the long term? Well, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, Congressman, provides us the opportunity to actually address the backlog, a significant backlog of, of farmers who want work done 
but haven't been able to get the approval. Uh, the expectation is that, that we could actually, within uh, several years, be able to eliminate that backlog and actually provide additional resources for advancing climate smart practices, and that will in turn allow farmers uh, additional income opportunities. So it's, I think it's critical. And it's critical, essentially, reducing the backlog. So these are producers who want to employ these programs on their farms, voluntary programs. Uh, we made the effort to reduce that backlog, but recognizing the value of these programs into the future, we want to ensure that they're there, uh, not just for farmers who want them, but for future generations of farmers. Would you agree with that? I would, and I'm concerned about suggestions that we reduce the overall budgets uh, by a significant percentage. That could result in as many as 84,000 fewer farmers getting the assistance and help that they want. And when we're talking assistance, we mean money out of the pockets of Correct. farmers, investments that they can't make on their properties, and, and investments that help them lower input costs, produce output, or increase output, uh, and, and impact their day-to-day -day operations positively. And, and the technical assistance that allows them to create those concepts and those plans. Important issue on the technical assistance. Thank you. I'd like to pivot uh, in the minute I have left to livestock and competition. Um, I hear often from Virginia's farmers and livestock producers about the trend of greater consolidation in the food and farm system. Um, and the anecdotes are startling, but also the statistics are jarring. Um, I am thrilled that the Packers and Stockyards Division received a significant increase in funding in FY23 to improve its enforcement of the Packers and Stockyards Act, a law to deal with anti-competitive behavior that, as you well know, was put in place 100 years ago. Um, but can you please share an update on how the department plans to spend these new resources to improve competition in the livestock sector and ideally positively benefit smaller producers like those I represent? It's a combination of three things. One, uh, making sure that we work collaboratively with attorney generals around the states uh, that are concerned about this issue. Two, making sure that we continue to invest in additional competition, additional processing capacity. Uh, and, and three, uh, making sure that we expand and make clear the powers under Packers and Stockyards. That's the reason why we've proposed a number of rules of greater transparency, uh, more predictability in terms of what these what the scope of the, uh, of the rule actually means. And I thank you for, uh, through your ability, putting forth uh, much of what we've proposed in the Butcher Block Act uh, through USDA. And I know Dusty Johnson and I continue to work to get that passed legislatively into the long term. Thank you. I yield back. General Lee yields. We now recognize the gentleman of California, Mr. LaMalfa, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Secretary, for spending time with us today as we uh, tackle the, the Farm Bill on time this year. So um, first, I also want to thank you for the quick response by your agency for the issues on the disaster declaration we had for uh, uh, tree nuts, more specifically walnuts uh, in, in California, where uh, a terrible uh, uh, pre-harvest um, drought and heat wave really, really negatively affected that crop. And so they're they have a, a, a pretty large carryover of low quality nuts that are are still stuck in the supply chain. So um, section 32 was was helpful for a good portion of that on the, on the disaster declaration and some low interest loans. But as we know with loans, they have to be paid back and uh, that sector who has really never asked for much of anything in this uh, type of um, vein. Uh, they're, they're looking for enough relief to move this backlog of crop through. And so what, um, under, other than the emergency relief program, what avenues do you think we're able to help them get a direct result with uh, this backlog for these uh, tree nut growers and most specifically the, the walnut folks? We, we've provided resources to the state uh, agriculture departments to uh, essentially allow them to purchase local and regionally f produced foods for food banks for school meal programs and for other uh, benefits and purposes. This would be one avenue that I would suggest uh, the walnut growers take a look at in California to see whether or not those resources could be used. Appreciate it. Uh, there's, um, and that's for the ones that maybe aren't perfect quality, but they're still very, very edible. There's also a, a considerable amount that are uh, of not edible that would be better for, in some cases, cattle feed or use in energy plants. What can we do to uh, further and speedily get that out because they're, they're still stuck with them. Well, I, I, I guess we could work with uh, uh, the energy companies to see whether or not there's a possibility or uh, utilizing the resources under the Renewable Energy for America program to, to allow conversion of those 
uh, those walnuts into uh, feedstock for energy on the farm. Okay, thank you. A little while ago we were talking also about um, uh, the processing plants and um, you did mention there's 277 existing facilities that are receiving help. Uh, there's a perception by some of the existing plants that, uh, that they're uh, unauthorized, that their support, drought support was, they were in ineligible for that. And are you finding that that's an, an issue that's coming up because we're hearing that from some of our that, processors? That's news to me, Congressman. I'm happy to look into it if you'll provide us more information. Okay, thank you for that. Um, lastly, you know, we've, we've have had a pretty, well, tremendous success with uh, uh, many of the con conservation programs, EQIP, RCPP. Um, my concerns on, uh, on the Climate Smart one are that this is going to be competing for the same narrow group of dollars here, and that uh, although, you know, there was an influx one-time money that ongoing, that it's going to be uh, uh, competing with already oversubscribed programs that are indeed voluntary. So, and when I look at the Climate Smart, basically that boils down to if we're trying to keep carbon in the soil, basically no-till. And a lot of crops are not adaptable to, to no-till. So oh, it's go, go much ahead. more than that, Congressman, much more than that. But the, the, the goal here is to create market opportunities. So the individuals who are embracing climate smart practices and utilizing some of the conservation resources to do that are going to see a higher price in the market for what they sell. So it creates a value-added opportunity that they don't have today. Because people are, there's a perception by buyers that they're doing such practices, but such practices are not adaptable for everybody in their types of crops. So but what I'm afraid of is that they're going to be aced out of that ability to be in the conservation. Every crop is involved in this. All specialty crops are engaged and involved in a variety of partnerships. So this, this covers all commodities. It's not limited to uh, just the, the basic, uh, you know, corn, soybeans. It, it, it covers all commodities and all producers. Okay. Um, lastly, uh, India Tariffs are really negative effect, uh, affecting our ability to get ag products into India. Are we going to be able to work with the, the U.S. trade rep to quickly expedite uh, an ability to overcome these tariff, this tariff situation? I think that's one of the reasons why we're engaged in the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. It's also one of the reasons why we're engaged in conversations with Indians. Recently, we, we were able to get tariff reductions for, <coughs> for cherries so that we got cherries into the Indian market. Walnuts are saying that, too. Thank you. I'd like to yield a little bit of time to my colleague, Mr. Kelly, from Mississippi. But the, the gentleman only has eight seconds left. <laughs> yeah, that's I, I was going to ask a question for the record, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Secretary, my home state of Mississippi has been a big user of the Conservation Stewardship Program, or CSP. In 2018 Farm Bill, statutory changes made the program impacted the way uh, the program is delivered in my state, dollars versus acres. Can you update the committee on how the department plans to utilize the conservation dollars received in the Inflation Reduction Act to better accommodate producers that can't get a CSP contract under current conditions? And, and if you'll take that for the record. Uh, very good. Uh, thank the gentleman. <laughs> uh, now I recognize the gentlelady from Connecticut, Ms. Hayes, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much, Secretary Vilsack, for being here today. Predictably, I will focus my questions today on the SNAP program. But before I start, I do want to highlight something because words matter. A person seeking asylum is not here illegally. They are following U.S. law as it's written, and regardless of how they entered the country, if Congress deems they're eligible, they're eligible. Undocu undocumented immigrants are not and never have been eligible for SNAP benefits. People are not illegal. This month, I led a letter to the House Budget Committee urging the committee to avoid cuts to SNAP benefits in fiscal year 2024 budget resolutions. I'm committed to making sure that we are producing, putting forth programs and legislation that feed more people, not less. When COVID-19 emergency allotments were in place, the likelihood of food insecurity decreased by roughly 9% with larger impacts for blacks and Hispanic families with children. We know that increases in SNAP benefits from the reevaluated Thrifty Food Plan kept nearly 2.3 million people out of poverty. Last month, the USDA Equity Commission presented its 2023 interim report to your office. Of the recommendations they provided, I'm strongly interested in their recommendations to continue reevaluation of the Thrifty Food Plan. And I also want to note that uh, the conversation surrounding able-bodied workers, there are many people, as you know, Mr. Secretary, who benefit from this program.
program and are already working and still living under the poverty level. Um, Secretary Vilsack, are there things that Congress and the USDA can take into consideration for the next reevaluation? Because it shouldn't be every 50 years. But and how will these changes impact food security for our for the most vulnerable in our communities? Well, the Food and Nutrition Act of 2008, Congresswoman, basically directs the department to do this every five years. So that, that's going to happen uh, and should happen every five years. And it's appropriate for it to happen every five years because there are changes in consumption patterns. There are changes, obviously, in food prices. Uh, there are changes in physical activity uh, uh, in families. There are multiple factors that need to take, be taken into consideration. Uh, so I, I, I think that it's important for folks to understand that this needs to be done on a periodic basis. If you do it once every 45 years, you're going to see uh, uh, an increase. You're going to see a pretty significant increase. If you do it every five years, that increase may not be quite as significant. Um, and so uh, that would be my uh, advice, which is make sure that the department lives by that five-year rule and make sure that you're very clear about what they want, what you want them to look at in terms of developing what an appropriate uh, family is, uh, uh, that's, that's getting by, what they would need uh, as a supplement. I couldn't agree more, and I think especially as we are emerging from this pandemic and we've seen so many shifts, um, five years would be an appropriate time to reevaluate the Thrifty Food Plan. We also know that during, econo during the economic downturn, every dollar in new SNAP beneficiaries can increase GDP by $1.54. So as we continue conversations about supporting farmers, we should also think about what happens if we limited the spending dollars of those customers in their communities. We saw food delivery being increased. We saw local grocers um, having to increase inventory as people moved into, in, more people moved and relocated into communities. Can you share how rural communities benefit from SNAP and why it's imperative that we expand SNAP to rural beneficiaries and rural economies? And just before, I'll yield you the rest of my time, but I also wanted to make one last point about fraud in the SNAP program. The instances are very low, and EBT payment accuracy has reached about 96%. So I want to make sure that people know that the SNAP program is functioning at the highest level of integrity that they have ever seen. So I yield to you, Mr. Secretary, for benefits in rural communities. Well, it, it, one of the challenges we have in rural areas uh, is the the ability to actually act, not only make sure folks sign up for the program, but also make sure that they have a grocery store available to them where they can use uh, the SNAP benefit and that those stores have a wide enough variety of choices that they have advantages for nutritious food, which is one of the reasons why the online ordering and, and, and shopping could potentially be of, of some significant benefit, and that's why we've been focused on it, and that's why we're excited about 170 retailers joining us with that effort and modernizing the program. Uh, look, it, it, it's important regardless of where you live, whether you live in a rural area, suburban area, or uh, urban area, it's important. It's important for the families. It's important for the jobs that are connected to those people who, who purchase groceries, and it's important for farmers as well. General Lee's time has expired. Now please recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Carolina, Mr. Rouser, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, uh, before I address the uh, secretary, uh, I just want to mention that uh, it's it's always been striking to me this conversation about consolidation, and uh, I think it's important to understand why why consolidation uh, happens. Uh, you know, it's driven by the need for economies of scale, and uh, what drives the need for economies of scale? It's a combination of things, but lower prices, higher input costs affected by inflation, certainly now, uh, the war on American energy, uh, American traditional energy uh, affects it unnecessary rules and regulations that add a lot of costs. All that, uh, all that drives economies that, the need for economies of scale, uh, which leads to consolidation. So, you know, we get more of what we incentivize, not, uh, not more of what we disincentivize. So I think that's a, an important point. Uh, Mr. Secretary, great to see you. Uh, as always, thank you for coming uh, before the committee today. Uh, in the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, when I served as uh, chairman of the Livestock uh, Subcommittee, uh, we worked very hard to establish the uh, National Animal Vaccine and Vet Veterinary Countermeasures Bank. Uh, I just want to get a quick uh, update, if we can, 
on uh, where that stands. I know that according to the agency's website, uh, APHIS has invested more than 56 million to amass a stockpile of uh, foot and mouth vaccine. Uh, can you provide an update on where we are <clears throat> with that? And, and uh, follow up to that, uh, is where we are sufficient to where we need to be? And then a third follow up to that is, what do we need to do with this farm bill to improve it uh, and, and to help the agency respond? Well, we are looking forward to the transition from Plum Island to the MBATH facility in Manhattan, Kansas that uh, is ongoing as we speak. Uh, and that's where the vaccine bank and the counter uh, me measures will be, will be housed. We're gonna continue to invest uh, in building up the vaccines uh, and we're going to continue to invest in research to create vaccines. Uh, I think we've got a lot of work to do in that area. I think we've learned a little bit about that uh, in connection with uh, uh, some of the recent challenges with uh, uh, high path avian influenza and the need for us to develop and continue to develop a, a, a vaccine that's workable. We're not there yet, we've got work, more work to do. We've got African swine fever uh, it, it, literally in our hemisphere, uh, which is of deep concern and the need for us to make sure that we have a vaccine uh, ultimately to, to, uh, to provide protection for our pork industry. So my advice would be to focus on, on the ability to develop and create and commercialize these vaccines. Well, I appreciate um, you and your team's work on that front. It's uh, critically important. Uh, you know, we live in a day and age, it seems, of the perfect storm uh, in every, in every uh, industry, every, every uh, situation. And um, I worry about uh, a disease outbreak in this country and what it would do to our food supply and uh, the economic uh, consequences of that as well. Uh, speaking about economic consequences, uh, disaster assistance programs, we obviously have a lot of hurricanes, uh, flooding, et cetera, in my uh, uh, part, of the, part of the world uh, there in North Carolina, southeastern North Carolina. Uh, can you speak a little bit to uh, the need, uh, in your view, for some type of permanent disaster program? I know sometimes, for example, we might have a hurricane in North Carolina, it doesn't hit anywhere else, but it's three years later before we can get some ad hoc disaster assistance passed. Cash flow is critically important to, to producers. Um, I personally am in favor of some sort of at least initial payment uh, once a disaster hits without having to wait for Congress. Curious your thoughts. I think it's important to understand the importance of having a number of tools in addition to crop insurance, uh, NAEP, and other uh, uh, risk management tools, uh, and disaster assistance would certainly be one of them, certainly for the livestock industry in particular. I would say that if you're going to craft a livestock uh, or a disaster assistance program generally, you want to make sure that there's uh, significant flexibility in the crafting of this because not a disaster in one place doesn't necessarily equate to a disaster in another place. Um, you know, we, we're, we're seeing significant differences between what's happening, say, in the western part of the United States versus what's happening in the southeast versus what happens in the Midwest. So the degree to which you can provide flexibility to meet the moment, I think that would be very important. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my time's expired, so I'll yield back. I thank the gentleman who uh, yells back. Now I'm pleased to recognize the general lady from Ohio, Congresswoman Brown, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member Scott, for holding this hearing. Um, I also, Mr. Chairman, want to thank you for opening this hearing with a prayer um, for the victims in Nashville, because prayers for comfort are kind. But I pray for courage to do what is right and necessary to end the scourge of gun violence. I pray we stop offering empty words but effective actions that have been long overdue to ban assault weapons. Weapons that time and time again have been the source of these mass killings. Now as a person licensed to carry and a Christian, I believe in the Second Amendment and the power of prayer. But let us not forget faith without works is dead. It is imperative we do the work, like passing long overdue laws to make our nation safer. Our faith without works has resulted in too many needless deaths. So let's be sure to couple our faith with the courage to do what is necessary, the necessary work by passing responsible gun safety laws that the majority of Americans demand and deserve. So I'll start my questions for you, Mr. Bill Sack, thank you for being here. As a ranking member of the subcommittee on general farm commodities, risk management, and credit, 
I have heard from farmers and ranchers about the need for strong upfront investments in the farm safety net and disaster program in the Farm Bill. My constituents have unanimously expressed this preference over patchwork and ad hoc payments and unpredictability as was common in the last administration. Secretary Vilsack, my constituents and I thank you for all your hard work. So can you elaborate for us on the need for strong upfront investments in our commodity and disasters programs in the Farm Bill? Uh, well, Congressman, I think it's important uh, uh, to have a, a set of tools to assist folks in disaster. I think it's important to have a strong crop insurance program. I think it's important to have a program that uh, the, the non-crop insurance assistance program, the NAEP program. I think it's important to have a, a disaster assistance program that triggers uh, when we are faced with a, a, a serious disaster as we've seen recently. Uh, I think you need all of those tools and I think you need flexibility to be able to meet the moment, as I uh, said earlier. Uh, and I think it's also important to make sure that we're not, we're not focusing the relief on just a, a, the, a small percentage of our farms, that we make sure that we have resources available, particularly to small and mid-sized uh, production operations. Uh, what we found for, during the pandemic was that the initial CFAP payments were made to production agriculture, but they left uh, some of the commodities and some of the producers out or that they didn't meet the moment. Uh, for example, those who had to depopulate uh, their livestock because there weren't processing capacity because of the pandemic didn't receive assistance. And so we, we took a look at ways in which we could provide additional resources and, and more flexibility and creativity in where those resources go so that a wider range of people received the help that they needed to stay in business. Thank you. Furthermore, we know that there have been disparities in the past on how these payments have uh, been distributed, particularly for socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. So, Secretary Vilsack, can you talk about things the department has done or could do to address the disparities in payments? What can be done to ensure that disadvantaged producers are able to equitably access benefits in assistance programs? Well, I think the first step in that process is to make sure that they are aware of when they, in fact, benefit from these programs. Oftentimes, we find that folks are not aware of the, of the programs that are available and feel uh, disconnected with the ability to apply appropriately. That's one of the reasons why we've entered into roughly 85 contracts with a variety of cooperator groups to basically go out into communities of, of, uh, of underserved folks and basically provide them with information about programs that are available. I mean, it is, I mean, if you look at disaster assistance, it's a bit daunting when you look at this document the number of programs there are. You may not know that there are programs that might be of assistance and help. So working with these groups, we're getting information out to producers and then we're using those groups to help them apply and make sure that they are getting the benefits they're entitled to. Thank you again. And as we discuss nutrition and spending in the context of the Farm Bill, it is important to remember that investing in nutrition does not take one penny away from farm programs. It is misguided to suggest that investing in families comes at the expense of our investing in our farmers. So with that, I'll close with this, Romans 12, 20. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. No one is exempt from the call to feed the hungry. God calls us to meet the needs of even those we might call our enemies. And with that, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back, uh, now recognize the uh uh, the gentleman from South Dakota, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'll start with some thank yous, Mr. Secretary. We had Undersecretary Torres Small in South Dakota a couple of weeks ago, and she did a great job. She really cares about adding capacity in the meat processing space, as I know you do. My able partner, Abigail Spanberger, and I were able to pass the Butcher Block Act out of Congress last year. And I know you all, not through that program, uh, but through a different, uh, different funding source, uh, have been able to do really good work out there. And we look forward to adding some permanence to that program by codifying it through the Butcher Block Act, uh, this Congress, hopefully. Secondly, I want to thank you for the work that the Forest Service is doing in really being innovative and in trying to ship timber to mills in the Black Hills of South Dakota who otherwise would not be able to get inventory and for being willing to use LIDAR flights to give us a better sense of what is going on in the hills. And then finally, sir, I want to thank you for uh, talking about the importance of developing a high pathogenic uh, avian flu vaccine. And as we together decide how to move forward, 
I would just ask you to give uh, full consideration to the platform technologies being developed uh, like uh, in South Dakota with an animal uh, health company. Uh, others are doing it as well. I think it's very promising technology and gives us a real opportunity uh, to move forward in a good way. But I want to turn my uh, attention now to some truly unfortunate comments that were made at the top of the hearing by Ranking Member Scott, who called me out by name. And I think, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, yes, American families need our help. There's no question about that. They need our help in no small part because of the hyperinflation for food that has been caused by multi-trillion dollar giveaways in the past two years. Yes, American families need our help. And I would tell you, sir, that their plight is not well served by the kind of fear mongering that we have heard. The reality is that uh, when we use words like extreme to talk about work requirements, let's, uh, let's review the facts. Uh, were these work requirements extreme when they were put into place uh, with Democrats and Republicans working together in 1996? Were those work requirements extreme when a bipartisan group of Democrats or Republicans stood together to renew them in farm bill after farm bill? Are they extreme? sir, in the way that they are being uh, implemented and deployed in your state of Georgia? Were they extreme when, pre when Senator, then Senator Joe Biden said from the floor of the Senate, the culture of welfare must be replaced with the culture of work. The culture of dependence must be replaced with the culture of self-sufficiency and personal responsibility, and the culture of permanence must no longer be a way of life. Let's set the record straight because we're talking about millions of needy people being kicked off. So let's make sure we understand what current law and what these proposals would do. No one who is pregnant would be denied benefits. No one with young dependents at home. No one who is disabled. No one who lives in an area with high unemployment. And yes, I realize that there are some hard to serve populations that fall out of those buckets. And that's why existing law provides flexibility to states to select 12% of their caseloads to give them additional flexibility because, yes, we want to help people who are trying to help themselves. Work is not punishment. Work is opportunity. There is no pathway out of poverty that doesn't include some mixture of work, education, and training. And we want to lift up those families that need that work and that education and that training. There has been plenty talked about today with regard to research and data, so let's be clear about that. When work requirements have been reimposed in those places where they had been previously held in abeyance, they have not put uh, the multitudes into poverty. In fact, when you look at Arkansas after work requirements were reimposed, caseloads fell by 70%, not into poverty, but instead the incomes of those people who moved off the program tripled. I will say that again. The income of those folks who moved off the program tripled. American families do need help. And I think we have an opportunity in a bipartisan way to talk about what kinds of flexibilities and what kinds of support would help them move out of poverty. Instead, when we use the language to demonize people who are trying to uh, continue what has previously been a strong bipartisan commitment to work. We do not give this issue the dignity that it deserves. And with that, yes, Mr. Chairman, I would yield back. Gentleman yields back. Now recognize uh, gentlelady from Kansas, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Davids, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I do have a, have a slightly different uh, approach than some of my colleagues. Um, I would, I guess I would just say that, uh, well, in 1996, I was uh, 16. Um, and there were plenty of decisions that were made that I would probably very much disagree with on both sides of the aisle. Um, and so I just will put that out there. Uh, yes, some of those decisions were extreme. And plenty of us disagree with uh, people who were on both sides of the aisle at that time. Uh, granted, I was in high school, so I didn't know at the time what I agreed or disagreed with because I wasn't like the youngsters today who are so involved in this stuff. Um, so, Secretary Vilsack, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm Sharice Davids. I represent the 3rd District in Kansas. And um, my district is actually really interesting. Uh, we have uh, quite a range of, of folks, medium-sized family farms, we have uh, urban areas and rural areas. We have everything ranging from 
uh, hobby farms to poultry producers, specialty crops, row, uh, some row crops. And the Kansas City region also happens to be home to some really key intermodal hubs uh, that our ag economy from across the country uses to move their, their products um, to, to feed our country and to feed the world. And over the last two months, I've, I've spent a lot of time, I'm new to this, uh, I'm new to this committee, um, so I've been visiting with dozens of, of farmers, producers, I've had um, uh, quite a few roundtables and listening sessions, and um, I've heard a lot of ways that USDA works, um, and some ways that maybe uh, uh, some of the programs don't uh, work as well as they could. And uh, one of the common concerns I've heard about is um, around the supply chain, uh, around supply chain issues. And in your testimony, you mentioned uh, farmers and consumers at all points of the supply chain needing a more resilient system. So um, I'm curious about uh, if you could expand on that a bit and uh, share a bit about uh, flexibility of the supply chain and improving um, that resiliency from your point of view. Well, there, I think there are a couple of things that we need to be uh, focused on, and that is uh, the rail industry, uh, the trucking industry, and the ports uh, in, in terms of being able to move pro uh, product more efficiently and more effectively. I think it's uh, fair to say that we have some serious issues with reference to the rail industry uh, and the fact that they may very well be understaffed at this point. Um, we've seen a significant delays that have occurred as a result of the transition and transportation of uh, grain that's being produced in the Midwest uh, out to the West Coast that is needed for their farms. Uh, that's a deep concern that was expressed to me uh, when we had a series of roundtable discussions with, with uh, ag groups and producers. Um, there's an issue with reference to, to uh, encouraging more individuals in the trucking uh, industry so that we have more, more trucks, more capacity. Uh, and we still have some challenges with reference to the ports. So part of the challenge that we have to undertake at USDA is to make sure that we express those concerns to the boards and commissions that are in charge of surface transportation, in charge of, uh, of ports, to make sure that they know that, that, that the problems have not been totally solved, that we still have issues, and that we still require uh, a, a very keen eye uh, on, on all of this. And then I, I do want to switch over um, to a, a different important topic, and I might have missed it if it was discussed earlier, but um, one of the things that I, I'm, I'm very concerned about is our farmers and producers uh, have a very demanding lives. Uh, growing um, and producing the, the food that feeds us requires demanding days. They're dealing with supply chain disruptions and extreme weather events. And... Um, there's a ton of stress uh, that is associated with that. And I know that uh, ranchers, farm workers, rural, rural residents um, are having a hard time accessing mental and behavioral health resources. Um, that's materials, support, um, the full range. And I know that the, the Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Network um, has been uh, doing a lot of work to fill the, the gap. Um, and I, but I'm I'm curious if you could uh, talk about that program. And actually, my time is running out. So um, we, we, we've provided would... more resources for that program, which is, and we've also worked with uh, secretaries and commissioners of agriculture at the state level to encourage more out, um, information. We've also invested more in rural mental health services and facilities through our community facility program. Thank you so much, and I appreciate that work. Uh, I yield back. Uh, General A's time has expired. We now recognize the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Mann, for five minutes. Uh, Chairman Thompson, thank you for hosting this hearing, and Secretary Vilsack, thank you for being here today. I represent the big first district of Kansas. We're the, the number one beef, sorghum, and wheat producing district in the country. My district has more than 60,000 farms and ranches, feedlots, ethanol plants, and agribusinesses, and farm country has made it loud and clear that they cannot survive when the government burdens them with nonsensical regulations and red tape. Uh, Mr. Secretary, your proposed packers and stockyards rules are especially concerning to me because while I understand USDA was directed by Congress in the 2008 Farm Bill to undergo a prescriptive rulemaking under the Act, I also understand that ma that mandate was satisfied by a rule finalized during the Trump administration. Yet. The department ignores con congressional intent and legal precedent regarding harm to competition. 
Congress has weighed in and made it clear that competitive harm or likelihood thereof is a requirement to establish a violation of the act. As chairman of the subcommittee on livestock, poultry, and dairy, I can say that I concur with my predecessors on this point. And if we as Congress did not make it crystal clear, the courts certainly have. The harm to competition standard has been challenged in federal circuit court eight times, and on eight occasions, the courts have upheld the will of the legislative branch. In my opinion, this issue is settled, and I'm looking forward to working with my colleagues to craft sound, comprehensive livestock policy that honors the work of every link of the American agriculture supply chain. Uh, next topic, Mr. Secretary. Um, as you know, President Biden's budget eliminates the stepped-up basis and impose a new capital gains taxes on the unrealized gain of assets held in family trusts um, for more than 90 years. This is the farm killer tax. We have to understand that these taxes the administration is, is putting down is, are not game changers, they're game enders for American agriculture and our family farms. My question for you, Mr. Secretary, in your opinion, what would the elimination of the stepped up basis or the imposition of the farm killer tax due to family farms and small businesses? You know, I'm, I'm not sure that that's what the, the president proposed because I think there, there, are, uh, there is a, um, a limitation or, or a, 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 I don't know what the right word is, but there's an exemption that's attached to that, um, it, which will cover 99% of the farms that we're talking about. So I'm not sure that that's what he's proposing. But, but, but Mr. Secretary, I mean, clearly the intent uh, repeatedly by this administration is to do away with the stepped up basis. We no, fought this fight three I, times I, now, and then a new tax, the farm killer tax, everybody needs to understand. So I, I lands owned by correct, farms, I'm gonna finish by, for 90 years, in 2030 would be subject to a one-time capital gains tax. This is the one-time capital gains tax. This is devastating. Um, I've co-sponsored legislation, I've introduced legislation introduced last week. We have bipartisan support to keep the stepped up basis. Um, and I don't understand how we can talk about food security if we're not willing to stand up for our ag producers. I'll, I'll, I'll let you uh, finish, Mr. Secretary. Well, I, obviously you and I disagree in terms of what the president has proposed. And, and I would say that we are, at the Department of Agriculture, we are working every single day to, uh, to work for producers, for ranchers and farmers. And I could go through a litany of all the things that we've done and are doing to try to create additional markets, to expand markets, to provide credit, to provide disaster assistance. So I think it, it, it would be unfair to suggest that we're not concerned about our producers. We are. Well, I would um, encourage everyone on this committee to join our legislation to uh, tell the administration loud and clear that we want to keep the stepped up basis for our ag producers. Next topic, uh, June 2022, the EPA announced proposed revisions to the September 2020 proposed interim decision for atrazine that included a pick list of mitigation measures that producers would be required to implement when using atrazine. In the development of these mitigation measures, the EPA refused to incorporate any feedback provided by USDA. The public comment period on these revisions closed in October 2022, and USDA once again provided uh, feedback. Mr. Hurdy, have you had any conversations with Administrator Reagan about the importance of atrazine and why USDA feedback should be incorporated into these proposed mitigations? I've had a number of conversations with the, the administrator about the important role that USDA has in terms of providing input uh, to the EPA. But frankly, Congressman, I, I, you know, this is a tough issue. I don't want the EPA administrator calling me and telling me how to do my job. Our job is to basically provide the information, provide it as best we can, provide the documentation behind it, uh, EPA makes the decision, and then it's our job to figure out ways in which we can help farmers comply if they can, and uh, that's what we're going to do. I understand. I would just say if those of us in this room don't stand up for our ag producers, no one else is going to, and it's on us to make sure that we get it right for them. Last question. I know my time's expiring. How much were you involved in the rewrite of the Woodruff rule that went into effect, and at the USDA, were you able to provide input um, into that process? So, Chairman, do you want to give me a minute to respond to that, or do you want me to respond in writing? Uh, respond in writing, please. Okay. As much as I'd Thank like you. to hear it myself, we'll, we'll keep, with, keep within the expectations I set. I yield back the time that I no longer have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And is gladly received, Mr. Mann. Thank you so much. Uh, now, represent, uh, now recognize uh, Congressman uh, Sockman from Michigan. 
Um, hi. hi, Secretary. Great to see you. Um, I'm proud to be the only Michigander on this side of the, the Ag Committee on the House side, along with uh, Senator Stabenow, obviously, the queen of agriculture um, on, the, on the, the Senate side. And um, th you came to my district uh, in 2021 and did a town hall with farmers, actually on the stepped up, the, uh, the capital gains tax issue, and you were a strong proponent of saying there should be an exception for farmers. So just want to make, make that note. Um, you know, I'm a former CIA officer and Pentagon official, so I tend to look at things through a national security lens. And I think, at, you know, reauthorizing the Farm Bill is a national security imperative. And learning the lessons on supply chains that we all learned so clearly from COVID, um, I think, to me, are an area of focus. And um, I led a defense supply chain task force in 2021 with Representative Mike Gallagher picking up the rug on um, defense supply chains, our military supply chains. And there were some creepy crawlies under there, um, particularly as it relates to dependencies on China. And the Defense Department is now taking a proactive approach to diversify, to get rid of those dependencies. And I guess my question is, I hear from farmers all the time about all the different ways supply chain issues are affecting them, fertilizer, chemicals, inputs, outputs, the whole thing. What comprehensively has the USDA done um, in order to look at this as a national security issue for our food security? We began a process of uh, trying to establish more self-reliance on terms of fertilizer and the inputs necessary to put a crop in the ground. Uh, we recently announced eight uh, awards uh, in the fertilizer initiative. There are 21 that we, uh, in phase one uh, of this effort to try to become more self-reliant that we're going to fund. Uh, everything from uh, additional fertilizer production to substitutes to new and more efficient ways to use fertilizer. So that money is being invested. Uh, roughly $500 million is going to be invested in this effort. There will be a second round that will be focused more on longer term, larger scale capital projects that will be announced later this year. So there's a significant amount of activity. Uh, we got uh, several hundred applications for these resources, over a billion dollars. Uh, actually, uh, over $4 billion of, of requests. My guess is it will probably score about a billion dollars of those projects, try to figure out resources that we can put towards greater self-reliance. Great. Uh, just a comprehensive approach, I think, is really important after what we've all, what we've all learned. Um, can you talk a little bit about the legislation? We know that in this committee there's going to be a lot of debates. You've seen some of them um, uh, you know, expressed already. There's going to be debates on SNAP and on food assistance. I think also it seems clear that there's going to be an attempt to claw back some of the legislation that was in the Inflation Reduction Act in August. Can you talk a little bit about what that legislation opened up for farmers specifically? Well, specifically, it gives us the opportunity first to reduce the backlog that exists and EQIP uh, and some of the other conservation programs, number one. Number two, it allows us the opportunity to, uh, uh, once we learn uh, more from our Climate Smart Partnership Initiative, uh, we'll be able to make uh, wiser and more targeted investments that will be of benefit uh, to farmers and producers, uh, creating additional market opportunities, value-added opportunities, allow them to participate in ecosystem service markets. It will basically generate new revenue streams. One of the challenges here is that we're limited. We either sell a crop, we sell livestock, we get a government payment. We've got to have more revenue streams, for the, particularly for small and mid-sized producers. To do that, you need those conservation resources to be able to get the environmental result that then can be marketed or sold, if you will. So there's tremendous opportunity. Yeah, I think in, in, in spirit, the incentivizing of farmers to do things on conservation, I've heard only positive things from farmers who want those incentives. Um, and I just hope that we have a conversation that's based in fact and what helps our farmers versus what's based in politics. Last comment, I know you've gotten a few questions. Chinese ownership of American agricultural land of of uh, food manufacturing, food production. Um, just tell me your top line philosophy um, on, on foreign purchase of agricultural land and components to the sector. <laughs> the top uh, five countries in the, in, in the world today that own American agri agricultural land are Canada, Netherlands. I'm not, we love our Canadian brethren. No, I'm no, talking look, about look, this, is the, this is the point, Congressman. The point is, in terms of Chinese ownership, is a, it's less than one percent of one percent. It's a relatively small amount. I think the key, the, the real challenge is, is a structure and system that we can get more consistent information about foreign ownership. 
Right now, we are reliant on people basically self-reporting. There is no mechanism for us to collect from 3,000 county organizations uh, that, that record deeds every single day. Uh, so I think that if you want to focus on this, you need to focus on it, some kind of reporting. system that will allow us information. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. General Lady's time has expired. Uh, now recognize the General Lady from Illinois, uh, Congresswoman Miller, for five minutes. Yes, thank you, Mr. Secretary. As you know, there's a growing concern over the foreign purchase of our farmland, especially by Chinese Communist Party. And I was wondering if you could tell us what the USDA is currently doing to enforce the Agriculture Foreign Investment Disclosure Act and what you're doing to investigate foreign purchases that have not been reported. We have uh, doubled the number of people uh, focused on uh, implementation of the current law. But Congresswoman, here's the challenge. Uh, the challenge is we do not have any investigative power. That's not, that's not, we don't have that power. We have essentially the ability to penalize, uh, to, uh, to assess penalties, but we don't have the capacity to investigate. You're, you're looking at 3, 000, more than 3,000 counties in this country. Every single county has a recorder's office. Every single recorder's office receives deeds. There isn't a process now for there to be a accumulation of the deeds that are, that are being filed today uh, in those recorder's offices. It is dependent on people making the report to us voluntarily. So it's, it's a system that, where there's a gap in terms of our ability to know what transactions are taking place. Well, it's too bad that we've let this go on so long and, and not sought to rectify it. Uh, it's a more, I, I, when you think about rectifying it, basically what you'd have to have is a, a, you'd have to have a clearinghouse where information would be filed on every real estate transaction in the country, okay, so that that clearinghouse could then be looked at. Now, I mean, you just think about that, whether people really are. Yes, which is why we, that's why I have a bill to stop foreign purchases of farmland until we can get this in place and figure out, number one, how much land is owned already by foreign it's about 40 million acres and foreign adversary uh, China and um, how we're going to enforce the disclosure of those purchases secretary on March 2nd I sent you a letter outlining concerns with Brazil's beef imports after they were late to report an atypical case of BSE given Brazil's repeated history of failing to report diseases and failing to meet international standards, what steps are you taking to ensure beef from Brazil does not pose a risk to U.S. consumers? We continue to provide significant surveillance at the border to make sure that uh, whatever's coming in from this country is, is safe. Uh, I would say that you have to be very careful about atypical cases because we've had, we've had atypical cases here in the U.S., and so we have to be very careful about bans on, on exports because... Yes, well, I wasn't talking us. about bans. Okay. It was the fact that they didn't report it. I mean, I understand that we have that also. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's, a, that's a situation, an issue where the WTO is, is basically, uh, uh, you know, advised. We always express concern. We're going to obviously continue, and we have expressed concern about the, the lateness of it, but we want to make sure that you know that we are uh, making sure that we're doing extra, extra vigilance at the border. Uh, not Great. just for Brazil, but also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, African swine fever. That's a really significant issue. Thank you so much. And my constituents are concerned with Mexico's import ban of G GM corn from the U.S. I was happy to hear that the U.S. Trade Representative requested technical consultations earlier this month. Can you talk more about what happens after the technical consultations and if the USDA would encourage the White House to bring a dispute? Well, the, the, I've been very clear about this. Uh, we, we're going to take this as far as it needs to go to be able to uh, reverse the decree that, uh, uh, that Mexico has in place today. Good. Thank you. Illinois corn farmers appreciate that. And one last question. The EPA continues this to create this overburdensome regulation for farmers as it relates to pesticides. So what is your message towards the EPA I mean, the message of the USDA towards the EPA when it comes to overregulation of crop protection tools. We have a division within USDA that basically provides information to EPA on any proposal that they have 
uh, relative to crop inputs to make sure that they understand and appreciate the impact and effect that a particular course of action might be on producers and on production. If you find that they're overburdensome, do you follow up with them? Well, basically our job isn't necessarily to tell the EPA exactly what they're supposed to do because I don't want them telling me what to do. My job is to figure out, is to basically provide them the information as best we can in terms of the impact, and then whatever decision they make, it's our job to try to provide resources so farmers can comply with whatever the regulation is. I'm sure you're very influential with them, and the overburdensome regulations are a great burden on the farmers. Thank you so much. Generally, time has expired. Uh, now, please recognize the uh, general lady from Colorado, uh, Congresswoman Caraveo, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Thompson, um, to you and to Ranking Member Scott for uh, hosting the hearing this morning, and Secretary Vilsack, thank you for taking the time um, to come and provide your testimony, and in particular for coming to Greeley in my district uh, last week. Earlier this month, I also had the opportunity to meet with a great dairy farm uh, called Colorado Cow that's in my district, with Undersecretary for Rural Development, Torres Small. Uh, this dairy has received a value-added producer grant from the USDA. This grant, they told me, really helped expand their company's market, uh, a product line of A2 milk, which is friendlier to individuals with lactose issues, and frankly, they said it, it saved their business. Uh, the USDA has incredible grant opportunities for our farmers and ranchers, but it was also clear that the grant application process was difficult for a small family dairy to maneuver, and they actually had to employ an outside grant writer that um, came at a significant cost uh, to Colorado Cow. I know that uh, helping small uh, and family ranchers is a priority for you. Can you tell me what the USDA currently does to help smaller groups apply for grants that the agency offers, and how can we continue to work in making um, sure that the process is easier to best serve our communities so that all of these programs are both well-known and accessible? We've invested uh, nearly $100 million in 85 organizations uh, that have access to and are connected to uh, underserved producers. Uh, and communities to basically give them uh, an opportunity to go out and sort of extend our reach with information about programs that we have and to provide assistance and help for folks to be able to qualify and apply for programs. Uh, so we're doing that on the, on, the, on the farm service side and that would include uh, opportunities like the ones you've suggested. We were also doing it with NRCS in terms of conservation. They have a, another program where they're providing resources to about 118 organizations. So we're extending our outreach. We're also taking a look at our application process. It's fair to say that uh, some applications can be pretty cumbersome. Um, just most recently, our farm application used to be 26 pages. Now it's 13 pages. Uh, I, I would suggest it's probably still too long, but it's better than 26 pages. And we're encouraging uh, all of our mission areas to take a look at how complicated things need to be or how simple they could be uh, and, and encouraging them to do so. I certainly appreciate those efforts, and um, the Undersecretary in particular uh, highlighted that um, uh, that grant application process and how it has been shortened. Um, to kind of switch uh, uh, gears a little bit, I do want to thank you again for visiting, in particular, Maplewood Elementary School in Greeley, um, and we really hope you were able to have some great conversations on the innovative nutrition programs at that school. I was excited to hear your announcement on actions the USDA will be taking to expand support for and access to school meal programs, including for increased collaboration between schools and food partners, expanded uh, nutrition education, and options for providing more healthy meals um, uh, to children at no cost. As a pediatrician, uh, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of children being able to have access to healthy foods for their well-being as they grow and so that they can focus on their schooling. Can you speak more to the importance of investing in school meals for our students and how Congress and the USDA can continue to work together on this issue? One of the things we're attempting to do is to try to uh, allow uh, school districts that are interested in participating in universal free school, school meals uh, to be able to do so through the community eligibility program and reducing the threshold uh, for compliance or the ability to participate in that program. The President's budget also pr proposes additional resources to support financially those school districts. Uh, of course, your, your benefit from the fact that Colorado voters basically approved a a, a referendum that allows you to have universal free meals starting in 2024. That particular school district actually put resources of their own to make sure that it was available this year. Um, I, I would say uh, community eligibility is, is one issue. Um, I would also point out the fact that for, there is pretty good research 
that there is a direct correlation between healthier outcomes and nutrition and better school uh, performance and nutrition. And that school, uh, school meals need to be looked upon as truly a s integral part of the school day. Uh, that school district was pretty smart because they put recess before, uh, before lunch and not after lunch. Uh, it basically it resulted in, in kids actually having uh, appetite, but also uh, having sort of the jitters left out, uh, out of them before they went into the school line. So uh, a lot of creative things in that school district. They do, they're doing a great job. Uh, well, I thank you also for the, your emphasis on um, child, edu uh, child nutrition and the ties to um, education. Um, before I yield back, I want to reiterate what so many of my colleagues have talked about, the importance of SNAP, particularly for children. Um, you know, with uh, changes to the program, there would be 50,000 children um, in my district alone um, who would have benefits that are at risk, um, and we should be investing in children, making sure that they have the nutrition that they need to, to focus on what they need to do in school. Uh, John Lady yields back, or time's expired. Appreciate that. Just for clarification, so many members are aware, uh, WIC, the WIC program, although it falls on the shoulders of the, of the secretary administer, the WIC program and school nutrition was in, is in with the jurisdiction of the Education and Workforce Committee, as near and dear as it is to most of our hearts. Uh, it's not outside the jurisdiction of, of this committee. Now I now recognize the uh, gentleman from Alabama, Congressman Moore, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Secretary Vilsack. I appreciate you being here today. Um, I was listening to the debate and the discussion here today, and I, and I need clarification. Now, how many uh, people did you say are receiving SNAP events in America? To uh, roughly 41 million, Congressman. 41 million people. Um, you, you don't, we're not tracking how many illegals at this point. We really don't know, I guess, is what you were telling us. I, I, Dr. Desjardins kind of brought, he, he kind of had the gears turned. I've been to the border a few times, and when he asked that question, I, I was just kind of curious, so we're not tracking that at all, or do you have any kind of estimates? Well, as has been pointed out, those who are undocumented uh, are not entitled to participate in the SNAP program. If so, they are, but if they apply for asylum, they're automatically qualified. Well, but then, then, then they're not illegal because they've applied for asylum okay. and the law and, allows them to do And that. then that brings a valid point. I think that's something. I've been to the border three times, and this is something I just want to bring to your attention. I uh, was down the border in Yuma, Arizona a couple of weeks ago, and this is for my friends across the aisle. Anybody who hasn't been to the border, we need to go and see what's going on. But uh, the minute folks cross the border down there, Secretary, they are offered a motion to appear. It's an MTA, basically, and they turn themselves into the border agents. And so that qualifies them instantly. They, they, they consider that a, their asylum request. And uh, what happens then is they automatically, according to the locals that I've talked to there in Yuma and different areas, is they're automatically qualified for uh, taxpayer-funded subsidies. And so, in a sense, the way the border's working right now, and, it, and even the cartel are actually doing this, they're, they're sending a groups of people at a time, four or 500 in certain spots, and they will turn themselves into the CBP. Our, our border agents basically have become concierge, and so they instantly get that motion to appear in court, and they get a free cell phone so we can call them when it's time for them to appear in court. Now, they take our phones, but they're not taking our phone calls, right? And with 95% of them, we don't know where they went, but. My, my concern is we've had 5 million encounters on the U.S. southern border. You're telling me we have 41 million people now that are currently on subsidies or SNAP program. Uh, the 5 million are turning themselves in instantly. They're getting the motion to appear, and they're becoming eligible. But at this point, we really do – you, do you, are you concerned, Mr. Secretary, at some point? I, I know you – I'm not trying to make this political, believe me. I just, I'm just curious. Are you concerned at some point that we'll have more people no. receiving benefits than the American taxpayers no. can afford? No, no. Look – First of all, let's take a look at who's actually getting SNAP. Somewhere between 80 and 85 percent of the people receiving SNAP are in one of three categories. They're a person with a disability, they're a senior citizen who worked and is living on a fixed income, social security check, or working moms and dads with children. So if we're, we're not tracking it, so we really don't know if the five million people that, that have applied for asylum actually are, well, I, are we I, come I, in contact with their eligible I, at this I, point? With due respect, Congressman, I think it's absurd to suggest that there are five million people who have applied for SNAP. Oh, I'm not suggesting. I'm just asking if you can give me a number. I'm just curious. <laughs> if, we, if we don't know the number, then how can it be so absurd to ask the question? I'm just trying to get we, to the be, bottom. Be, because we would know if there were five million people. There's uh, 41 million now, right? Well, there are 41 million. We would know that 5 million of the Well, I, I was just, just curious. Ridiculous. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm not trying sure. to – I just want to let you know that down there people are getting instantly benefits when they turn in as a motion well, to appear in court. I so, don't believe that they're uh, – My concern is for the American taxpayer and the program itself. And, well, and one of my colleagues and – and she made a valid point a while ago. She said, uh, 
You know, for every dollar we put in SNAP, that's 80 percent of the program now. I, you know, I've kind of been in Congress 25 months. I was stunned to find out that 80 percent of the program is actually SNAP. About 20 percent actually goes to the producers in the country. But, but one of the colleagues pointed out a while ago that for every dollar we put in SNAP, we get a dollar and 54 in return. But where does that dollar that goes into SNAP come from, Mr. Secretary? Well, it, 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 it comes from uh, the people of this country. The American tax. Let me ask you a question, Congressman. And hopefully I can what, answer. What, what do you think about the fact that, that there are working men and women with children who require SNAP because they're working for $7.50 an hour? You think it's a, it, you, do you think we should increase the minimum wage? No, you can't increase the minimum wage. Oh, you can't increase. Well, it doesn't work. So, because that then would reduce, everything, that would reduce, that would every, when you increase April. the minimum wage, it's a simple economics. Everything in the economy increases in price. We have seen nothing else. It, it would Milton reduce, Friedman said himself, and he's it would a reduce economist, the snap. It would that reduce. every time we print dollars in D.C., basically we're creating inflation. And that's the problem the American farmers are facing right now. Whether it's fuel costs with the domestic energy policy or us printing money like runaway sailors up here, it is making it harder and harder for the small farmer to survive. And then we're going to ask the taxpayers, we're excited about spending money, a dollar a person to get a dollar fifty-four back when every bit of it comes from the American taxpayer. And then as these people are pouring across the U.S. southern border, we're giving them MTAs and instant benefits. How much longer can the people that are pulling the wagon pull the wagon if everybody's riding in it? And, I, and look, I, I, I've got to yield back. I'm running out of time. But, I, you know, I, just, I was just curious if we knew how many people were on SNAP. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, now recognize uh, the Congresswoman from Oregon, Congresswoman Salinas, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the ranking member for holding this hearing today. And I want to thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for being here. Um, you understand the limitations at USDA um, to continue to assist specialty crops, especially in an era of increasing, devastating um, wildfires and natural, um, different natural weather-related events that really risk the entire livelihoods of many of the farmers in my district. And we really are a specialty crop industry in the Willamette Valley. And I, uh, I look towards this farm bill. I'm interested in finding a solution that really puts specialty crops on par with other um, commodities, which have long had protections for market stabilization and, and other things. So my goal is really to leave no farm behind, especially for the Lamet Valley specialty crops. So my question is, are there any specific authorities that would be helpful for Congress to provide USDA in order to address this specific concern? Well, I think it's important for, the, for Congress to continue to support crop insurance and to encourage the risk management agency to continue to do what they've done recently, which is to expand the number of policies that are available. There are now over 600 policies available, and that covers a great number of specialty crops, and we're seeing more and more of that opportunity. Uh, and to the extent that we can get the data that will allow us to create those policies, that's one mechanism. We, we talked about a disaster assistance program earlier. I think that uh, also is another thing that ought to be considered. Um, uh, we are focused as well on creating additional mar local and regional market opportunities for those producers. And I think it's important to, to be very supportive of that because that's going to help the small and mid-sized producer have additional income opportunities that they need to have to be able to keep the farm. Great. Thank you. And on a topic that we really haven't discussed very much today, or at all, I don't think, um, um, I'd like to ask a broad question around forestry policy. As I previously alluded to, um, one of the natural disasters that's been really devastating a lot of my growers and farms back home have been these, you know, more frequent and intense wildfires that Oregon has seen in the last few years. And the health of our forests obviously is essential for curbing the magnitude and scale of any future wildfires and the impacts extend far beyond our farmers, though they often feel the damages most immediately. As new science becomes available on forest management, how can we best facilitate the Forest Service adopting and implementing new practices that would have the potential to limit wildfires and conserve our forests? I think we're doing that, Congresswoman. Because of the infrastructure law and other resources that have been provided as well under the Inflation Reduction Act, we've identified uh, roughly 250 fire sheds, which we think represent the greatest risk based on their most recent science. Uh, we just recently announced 21 priority landscapes, some of which are in uh, the state of Oregon and, and, and in the area that you're talking about, uh, to essentially put resources, nearly a billion dollars of resources over the next couple of years at better forest management, utilizing a number of strategies, thinning, uh, uh, prescribed fire, et cetera. 
Um, and so that's going to happen. We're also, uh, because of the lifting the cap on the Replan Act, we're also uh, engaged in a reforestation effort, uh, which will be helpful as well. So I think that's happening. You're going to see a much more aggressive effort uh, in the forest to basically minimize over time if this resource is going to be continued and supported. Part of the challenge is to make sure that we continue to support this. this is, we've got resources for the next couple of years, but then the question is what happens after that? Um, but if, if those resources are continued, I think you're going to see significant improvement over the next several years. Thank you. So we really need the funding behind that. And no question about it. Thank you. I yield back. General Lee um, yields back. I uh, now recognize the gentleman from, from Iowa, Mr. Feenstra, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Scott. And I just want to say uh, thank you, uh, um, Secretary Vilsack, for being here today. I've always appreciated uh, what you've done for Iowa over the years. Um, I've had a lot of conversation with you over the years and uh, highly respect um, what you've, uh, you've done. Uh, I, I have concerns, uh, obviously, with the administration, which you're a part of, you know, we're from Iowa. Uh, we are the breadbasket to the world, literally the breadbasket to the world. And I, I just wish the administration would talk about it once in a while. I, I never hear the administration ever talk about rural America. I never heard it in his you know, State of the Union address. You know, we have so much to offer this great country, especially economically. And, and it just I don't, I don't know, sort of hurts me. Uh, and then also, you know, it, if I look at what's happening in trade, you know, we had Kathleen Tai in Waze uh, a, a week ago, and we have this significant ag trade deficit that is, again, it could be very concerning to our, our farming community. And then obviously waters of the U.S. Uh, with EPA doubling down and, and just penalizing the farmer. And then finally, which I want to talk about with you, and I know my good friend, the Congressman Tracy Mann mentioned this, is the budget uh, that, that the administration put out. I mean, this is really going to, to hit hard if it were to be uh, passed uh, when it comes to like-kind exchange and stepped up in basis. And he noted to him that 99% of the farmers would not be hurt. Um, you know, th that's probably pretty inaccurate. When I think about Northwest Iowa, I talked to our accountants, I just got off the phone with them, and they said virtually every one would get hit, especially when it comes to like kind exchange, when you're exchanging out uh, your, your tractors and stuff like that. And I just wonder, in, any thoughts or anything that you can help, um, you know, the, the people, the producers that are listening right now, the breadbasket to the world, what is your thoughts on, on, on this matter? Well, Congressman, I, with all due respect, I, I, first of all, the President did mention and did talk about farmers in his State of the Union address. I was there. I, I heard it, uh, number one. Number two, uh, on the trade side, uh, we've had $15 billion of new and preserved market access during the course of this administration. Uh, fresh potatoes in Mexico, uh, tariff reductions on beef in Japan, uh, corn, wheat, and pork opportunities in Vietnam with tariff reductions, et cetera. I could go on. There, there, there's, you know, there's. But was there any new markets? More. Pardon? Was there any new markets? Yeah, uh, fresh potatoes in Mexico is a new market. Okay, I, I there, understand there, that. There, but how about okay. corn or soybeans? You know, I mean, uh, we're Iowans. <laughs> well, we we reduced the the tariff uh, for corn uh, and pork in Vietnam, for example, and that expanded the market opportunity there. Uh, opportunities for ethanol in Panama. Opportunities for uh, poultry in the Middle East. So, uh, but we're we're still. I mean, this is the first time in decades that we're at an agricultural deficit. No, I mean, oh, this no, no, no. I'm not sure where, where that does. That's not accurate at all. We've been at a trade surplus in agriculture, uh, and there was a suggestion that we might have a trade deficit this year. But if you look at yes. the recent trade numbers, what you're going to find is that exports are actually. Uh, exceeding expectations and that we're still operating at a trade surplus. Yeah. So c can you address uh, the topic of, of, of tax, like kind exchange and stepped up in basis? You already talked about stepped up in basis. The like kind exchange is obviously very significant. Um, what, what is your thoughts there? And can you advocate, advocate uh, to the administration that these are sort of big topics for the farmer? I clearly have provided information uh, to, to the administration on the notion of stepped up basis, which is why uh, when this was proposed, there was an exemption that basically would cover, well, I'll, I, 
it, we've done the research on this, it's 99% of the farms, it's not gonna, it's, it, what it touches really, and this is, the, to me, this is where we ought, there ought to be concern. You can talk about farms and farm families, but the reality is a growing number of investment bankers are the owners of, these real, of this real estate. Roughly 4% of the top 10% of, uh, uh, of production facilities in this country are essentially owned and operated yeah, by investment uh, yeah, okay. banks. So, I, mean, I, I understand. Uh, let me yield back my time. But uh, you think about Northwest Iowa, uh, Secretary. I mean, every farmer, yes, their corporate, their LLCs are no, no, no. partnerships. This, this I mean, not, they're going to get hit. This is not about partnerships and corporations. This is about investment bankers owning farmland. Yeah and basically owning very, very large amounts of farmland. Right. But I'm and talking the about the regular is, producer. The regular producer in Iowa that owns 500 to 1,000 acres, they're the ones that they, they might be asset rich, but they're, 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 they're poor when it comes to what they have to pay in tax. We might disagree on this, but this is a really significant topic for a lot of our farming community. And thank you for being here again, and I yield back. Gentlemen, time has expired. Uh, now, please recognize for five minutes, Congresswoman Glusenkamp Perez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for being here. Um, I want to touch on some of the big issues facing my district in southwest Washington. Um, Mr. Secretary, I'd like to get your perspective on how USDA relief programs can work better for producers in my district. I recently visited Pacific County, uh, which sits on the Pacific Ocean, as the name suggests, on the western edge of my district. The county produces over 50 million pounds of oysters and clams a year, valued at over 10 million, and supporting almost 600 jobs. Uh, when I was there, I spoke with an oyster farmer who was so excited that aquaculture is now eligible for ELAP, uh, but that she and her fellow oyster farmers face some challenges in accessing the program. A as you know, ELAP requires the oysters to be completely containerized while they grow in order to distinguish between wild and seed oysters. This is challenging in Pacific County where wild oysters often intermix in order to be eligible for the payments, the producer then has to identify which of their oysters are wild versus seed, and to get this information verified. So as you can imagine, this is extremely difficult to determine and leaves the program out of reach for many, many producers in my district. So my question is, what can the USDA do to help shellfish producers access these ELAP payments? What technical assistance or other services are available to help them navigate this program? Thank you. Uh, well, Congressman, I think first of all, uh, working with uh, the, the the Farm Service Agency folks uh, to try to make sure that they understand the challenges. Uh, appreciate you bringing this to my attention. I'll be happy to take this back to our team and uh, ask them to take a look at how we might be able to not only uh, simplify the process but also make sure that information gets out about it. Thank you so much. Um, I've also heard about challenges with ERP. Both rounds of ERP require crop insurance in order to access the funds. For many specialty crop producers in my district and across the state, crop insurance is incredibly expensive and many have never had it. So for too many uh, who consider purchasing crop insurance in order to be eligible, they find that the cost of insurance is actually higher than any potential USDA payout. So what can we do to ensure that specialty crops are not left out of these vital programs? Well, first of all, they are entitled to ERP programs. Uh, there are two phases to this. Phase one involves those who have crop insurance and NAEP coverage. Phase two uh, is basically covering those who don't have access to those programs. So they are entitled to ERP programs. And then secondly, we are um, trying to work with uh, folks to, to better understand how we can price and market crop insurance so it becomes more available to folks. I think it's a challenge for us in some cases, but but your, your producers can qualify for ERP uh, even though they didn't sign up for crop insurance. And in phase two, okay, thank you. I'd like to shift a little bit and talk about rural development, specifically broadband. So I live in a rural area and like many rural areas, I have terrible internet. I get it from a radio tower. Um, I'd like to talk about how the USDA can provide more services to our rural communities. Broadband is obviously critical to this, and that's why it's so important uh, that the bipartisan infrastructure law provided almost $2 billion for reconnect programs. So I, I read in your testimony that Congress can reduce barriers to accessing USDA programs without spending a dime, and I would love to hear more about that. I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last part of that. In your testimony, um, you stated that, that Congress can reduce barriers to accessing USDA programs, such as rural broadband, without spending a dime? Well, I, I think what we're, what we're encouraging uh, 
Well, first of all, let me just say about the reconnect program. We will have most of those resources that were provided under the infrastructure law obligated by the end of probably the end of uh, this this spring. Uh, so we are getting the resources out the door. The secondly, I think the the challenge for us, I think, is to figure out where else we need to be focused on our our efforts. Uh, it, to the extent that we know where uh, where there is lack of service, insufficient service, inadequate service. The more we know about where those places are, the better we can target yeah. those resources. Yeah, that, and that leads into another issue that we've seen. So the FCC's national broadband map um, should be a, a key tool for identifying rural communities that underserved and guide broadband investments. But when I looked into this, I actually found that the only way for uh, logging challenges against the, the map is online. And if we don't have internet, how, you know, so there's a mismatch there. And, and I'd like to talk about how the USDA has engaged to create the national broadband map and how the agency can improve coordination for rural broadband deployment programs. We can certainly convey those concerns. I, that is something that we're not actually drawing the map or we're sure. not actually participating in that. Yeah. The Commerce Department and the FCC are doing that. So I'll be happy to. Thank you. Sincerely, you thank you for your work. I yield back. General A yields back. Now recognize the uh, uh, gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Fenstad, for uh, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Ranking Member Scott, for uh, having this important hearing today. And also, uh, thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for being here. Uh, food and farm security is national security. It's been stated a few times, and I don't think we can state it enough. Uh, and as a proud fourth generation farmer from southern Minnesota, raising that fifth generation, I understand, uh, you know, very clearly uh, how important it is that we write and pass a strong farm bill. And I would just say that this farm bill needs to be by farmers and for farmers, by rural America and for rural America. It can't be written by those of us in a small room here uh, in D.C. for D.C. So uh, the more we can do to listen to real folks uh, that are making real things happen, the better this farm bill process can be. Uh, I just want to make a statement here, Mr. Secretary. Earlier today, you uh, responded to our colleagues from Kansas about, uh, and I liked what you had to say. You said, I don't want EPA calling me and telling me how to do my job. And I'll just tell you, as a farmer and someone that represents a lot of farmers in southern Minnesota, I don't want the EPA telling us how to do our job. I don't want them showing up on our farms and, and telling us to farm with one hand behind our back. So I agree with you on that statement. Uh, I want to switch gears a little bit here. Uh, Mr. Secretary, last September, it was revealed that the Feeding Our Future, a Minnesota nonprofit, alleges, alleges, allegedly exploited USDA child nutrition programs to defraud American taxpayers of over $250 million. It was intended to feed hungry children during the COVID-19 pan, COVID pandemic. Indictments later revealed that the items purchased at the taxpayer's dime included luxury vehicles, real estate, and even an airplane. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit into uh, the record a letter I sent to Secretary Vilsack on September 30th of last year, along with you and the Education and Workforce Chairwoman Fox and Oversight Chairman Comer, requesting documentation to enable congressional oversight on how USDA and its partnering state agency, the Minnesota Department of Education, failed to prevent this fraud. So, Mr. Secretary, uh, I know a lot of folks from Iowa. I do a lot of phone calls, texts, emails. I write letters to my friends in Iowa. They respond right away. It's been six months since we sent this letter, and I haven't had a, heard a word from you or your, uh, your office. So, would you comment uh, today on provide, uh, would you commit today to providing the committee staff uh, information that we've requested in this uh, letter um, within two weeks, then that would allow us to do our job as Congress and enable uh, congressional oversight of this feeding our futures fraud. Uh, Congressman, I'll commit to you that we'll get a response. I, I, I don't want to necessarily commit to a two-week time frame because I don't know how complicated the response is. I don't know whether or not there is litigation involved, investigations involved. I, I, I would like to have the opportunity to basically we, we receive over 300,000 inquiries uh, a year from folks across the country, including members of Congress. Uh, so give me an opportunity to get the letter, read the letter. I'm certainly, uh, I, you're entitled to a response, and you'll get a response. Well, and I hope you see the wisdom in the, res in the needed response. When we're talking about rewriting a farm bill, we've heard a little conversation, or a lot of conversation today around SNAP and the importance of making sure that we as you know, good neighbors are willing to give the shirt off our back to those that are in time of need. 
It's hard to say that with a straight face when you see this kind of fraud that has happened. Uh, and and uh, so with that, you know, what measures has the USDA taken to enhance integrity measures across all of the FNS uh, programming to ensure that fraud on this scale will never be allowed to happen again? Well, as you know, the, the programs that are, are administered by the states, and so we're going to work closely with the states to make sure that they understand the response, the joint responsibility we have to make sure that these programs are operated in a fair way. I think during the course of the pandemic, um, you know, things were, were, were not as uh, focused on this as perhaps they, cut, they could have been uh, because of the nature of the pandemic and the challenges that that presented and the need to get information and, and, and support out to folks that were in need. Um, but I'm happy to take a look at this particular circumstance and figure out what we should be doing or can do to make sure this doesn't happen again because it, it shouldn't happen. You're right. I appreciate that. Uh, switching gears here quick with my uh, remaining few seconds. I want to thank you for moving quickly to provide certainty for the pork producers in, in southern Minnesota uh, and all across this nation for following, um, following the letter I sent to you in February requesting an extension of the NSIS time-limited trial for pork processing plants. Um, I, I guess my question to you is, in the closing seconds here, is what, do you agree that a permanent solution is needed to provide certainty for our pork uh, and poultry plants to ensure that they continue to operate safely and efficiently at this full operational capacity? Sure. Perfect. Hawaii, uh, Congresswoman Takuda for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. You know, the difficult part about going towards the tail end of a large committee is I know we've discussed a lot of issues already today. Wanted to um, go into an area about statistics. I'm a self-professed data wonk myself, and the National Agriculture Statistics Survey recently conducted the Census of Agriculture, and we'll see that data in the summer of 2024. We're still using some data from before the pandemic to make critical policy decisions, as you know. Furthermore, while speaking with agriculture producers across my district, which is a very rural community, I've heard concerns about the lack of agricultural data, making their decisions as farmers and business owners much more challenging. What barriers to data collection has the USD identified, and what more can the committee do to ensure that we have the data we need to do our jobs? And how can the USDA ensure data is up to date, it's accurate in a rapidly changing environment of market changes, consolidations, global crisis and conditions? Secretary? Oh, part of our challenge, I think, is to make sure that people understand the importance of filling out the survey. Uh, so we have done and continue to do an aggressive outreach effort to make sure that people understand and appreciate the more people who respond to the survey completely and fully, the better the information and data is. Uh, so we have actually put resources behind further uh, extension and outreach to make sure that we are dealing with underserved populations uh, who uh, need to fill out and need to be part of that survey. Uh, and I'm hopeful that we'll see uh, increased uh, data, increased uh, a reflection of that in the data that's going to be created from this particular survey. Thank you, Secretary. And hopefully with that data, we'll also understand where best we can apply resources and support as well. You know, when I talk to a lot of the farmers and producers and ranchers in my district, we're mostly small to medium-sized farms in Hawaii. One of the big things that come up is um, farm workers, labor issues, shortages that we're dealing with. And I know we've done the Farm Worker Modernization Act, but what more can we do to support um, our farm workforce? And I think of housing, I think of healthcare, mental health services. Um, as our farms struggle um, to get workers and we need to support our workers, what can we do in this area? Well, passage of the Farm Worker Modernization Act, again, by this Congress would be helpful. It didn't get through the Senate, uh, and That's that would be pretty significant. Uh, Number one. Number two, we are uh, working on a pilot program uh, to try to create uh, a, a pathway or a model that could be utilized to show, uh, showcase how that Farm Workers Modernization Act could work. Uh, and we'll be uh, launching that, I think, sometime this spring or summer, uh, which addresses some of the issues in, in a pilot way. Um, and so look for that. Um, we are also using our rural development resources uh, and we are encouraging better utilization of the farm worker assistance programs within USDA. Uh, there are still significant resources available for housing uh, that we want to make sure people are aware of and can utilize uh, to provide better housing. On the mental health side, we, as I uh, have indicated, we, we've used our community facility program resources to expand the facilities for mental health services, and we've continued to work with uh, commissioners and secretaries of agriculture at the state level to expand access and support for uh, uh, the uh, hotlines and 
uh, uh, telephone opportunities for folks to call in if they need help and assistance. Thank you. And touching a little bit on that, you know, one of the big things that I hear often is that it's just too difficult to make use of the, to, you know, to apply for, to qualify, to comply with a lot of the programs that exist out there or potentially will be coming through the pike. Um, so really, how are we doubling down on technical assistance to farmers to make sure, especially for our smaller, um, you know, farmers, um, you know, a, a lot of them also are newly arrived citizens to this country. How are we making sure that that technical assistance is there so that they can actually draw down these programs that are important to them? The uh, NRCS on the conservation side has agreements with 118 organizations that are linked to uh, the populations that you just mentioned um, to basically extend our ability to reach out into those unserved populations to get information out about programs. Uh, FSA uh, and FPAC have also entered into a series of, of contracts with 85 organizations uh, to get information out about farm loans and, and, and uh, other programs that operate through the Farm Service Agency. So there is an extensive network that's now been supported and created to try to get information out and to provide assistance uh, to apply for the programs that are available. Thank you. I appreciate those programs. I would often say, too, we need to um, always make sure that our ROI on those programs are, in fact, getting to the people that they need to get to, I'm not questioning any of these organizations or its effectiveness of these programs, but I often hear from at least our rural farmers that it's very, very difficult to even get that tech assistance um, to be able to comply. So thank you very much. I have a number of other questions, but I yield back, Chair. I uh, thank the general lady. Now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Congressman Rose, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Scott uh, for holding the hearing, and thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for taking time to be with us here today. Mr. Secretary, in addition to record inflation and crippling input costs facing the cattle producers in my district, depredation by predatory birds like black vultures has taken a real financial toll on our producers. According to USDA APHIS, nearly a third of calf loss to predators each year in Tennessee is attributable to predatory birds, vultures being chief among them in our state. These scavengers are a nuisance to livestock producers and they take a significant chunk out of agriculture's bottom line each year in Tennessee and across the country. What tools and flexibilities does USDA provide to farmers and ranchers to deal with this issue? Congressman, I, I, I've been asked a lot of questions today, and I have answers to most of them, but this one's I don't. I, I'm happy to take a look at what we do in this particular area. Sure, and if, if you might, and I would appreciate that, if more legislative flexibility was given to USDA's wildlife services to address this issue, would you direct the agency to expand their efforts to control and take species that are currently listed up under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, including the black vulture? I'm happy to, to take a look at this and figure out exactly what, what we need to do. I appreciate you bringing it to my attention. It's something that, that uh, is the first time I've heard it. Well, thank you, and, I'll, and we'll certainly follow up on that. Secretary Vilsack, you know, and I'm going to shift gears here a little bit, you know that science and consumer surveys show that when all forms of produce are present, people eat more fruits and vegetables. And I learned this a long time ago. My mom was a county home agent home demonstration agent back in the days. I guess today we'd call her a county extension agent. And she taught me growing up on the farm that when you preserve fruits and vegetables by freezing them, and she was from that era when freezers were a new thing, uh, that actually it, the, the freezing process retains the nutritive value of those fruits and vegetables. And in fact, recent science has uh, shown that perhaps it actually improves the nutritional value of vegetables and fruits when they're preserved by freezing. However, any time USDA puts anything out, the agency highlights one type of produce, and that's fresh, uh, which you and I know uh, doesn't always provide families the choices they need, particularly for our low-income neighbors. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are some days when frozen is the only option to make sure my own family uh, gets the fruits and vegetables that they need. Uh, I want to know what USDA, what are you doing to make sure that all USDA agencies are supporting the availability of all forms of fruits and vegetables to families in the manner that best serves them? Well, we are providing resources, uh, uh, partnering with states uh, with 
resources under our temporary uh, emergency food assistance program uh, to provide resources for food banks and, and for our schools. And they uh, end up purchasing a lot of canned and to the extent that they've got refrigeration capacity, frozen, frozen options. So that, that is a way in which we are providing resources. And I want to focus your attention uh, specifically on the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program, or GUSNIP. You're probably familiar with that program, which supports fruit and vegetable consumption for low-income families through point-of-sale incentives and a produce prescription program, also separately a produce prescription program that USDA has currently. But they only promote the consumption of fresh, pro fresh produce and so while USDA has the statutory authority, at least since the 2018 Farm Bill, to fund frozen projects, they never have. If the goal is to get more people uh, entering, uh, more people consuming fruits and vegetables, particularly those utilizing federal assistance, then why would we limit their options, especially when frozen produce is just as nutrition as fresh, and more affordable, last longer when families need it, and particularly in rural areas uh, where we don't get to grocery stores every day. Let me look into it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, just quickly, as in the minutes that remain, uh, this past year, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission proposed a rule entitled Enhanced and Standardized Standardization of Climate-Related Disclosures for Investors. Um, Mr. Secretary, I feel fear deeply that if this becomes, if this rulemaking is put into place, that farmers, particularly small farmers all across the country, are going to be adversely impacted. And I hope that you will commit to uh, pushing back against that rule. And uh, with that, I see my time expired. I yield back. I appreciate General. I also appreciate General's question, given it's Frozen Food Month. So it was uh, perfect timing. Um, and I. Uh, was uh, had missed the opportunity, so I want to enter into the record uh, Mr. Finstead's unanimous consent uh, to submit a copy of his correspondence uh, is agreed to without objection. Uh, now, please recognize the general lady from Illinois, uh, Congresswoman Budzinski, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, Secretary Vilsack. It's great to be with you, and thank you for making time to be here. Um, I'm really honored to get to represent the 13th District in Illinois, which is really located in central and southern Illinois. And I think this area actually has some very unique agricultural opportunities. Um, from Decatur to Champaign, we are the ag tech corridor of the country. Uh, we have ADM, we have the University of Illinois, my alma mater that's in this district. We're really leading um, with some of our community college partners, with Parkland Community College and Lincoln Land on precision agriculture. Um, I'd say second, also Piatt County is the top soybean producing county in our entire state. And then of course, we're very excited to share the Farm Progress Show with the state of Iowa, which we're, um, we're hosting actually in Decatur later this year and, and extend that invitation. My first um, question though is really about how we're supporting our young and beginning farmers. Uh, the USDA launched a pilot program to increase access to land, capital, and markets for underserved producers, including young and beginning farmers, which I hope to make permanent. Removing barriers to entry of the farming industry will serve to strengthen the pipeline into the agricultural sector. I understand the rollout is underway, and can you tell us about why the program is so vital and some of the barriers to entry that you've observed thus far? Well, the big challenge we face, one of the big challenges we face in agriculture is the aging nature of our farm population, mm -hmm. which it means that it's important for us to be able to figure out ways in which we can attract uh, younger people who are interested in this. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's no, no secret. Uh, it's, it's a challenge to get into this business from a credit perspective, from a capital perspective. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we've proposed and suggested in the president's budget that we increase the microloan program uh, from $50,000 to $100,000 to make it easier. That's why we have proposed changes in the qualifications for participating in FSA loans, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. perhaps not requiring as much level of experience as in the past to be able to access those larger uh, credit opportunities. It's why we have uh, resources that are outstanding uh, uh, in our uh, effort to try to figure out ways in which we can expand access to land and markets. Mm -hmm. Uh, for new and beginning uh, farmers and for underserved producers. Uh, we've received a significant number of proposals 
that we're in the process of reviewing and uh, sometime this summer we would expect to make grants uh, to organizations that will help us figure out creative ways to provide access to land. So if you provide access to land, you make it a little bit easier to get credit and capital, and then you create new market opportunities mm -hmm. by linking those young uh, beginning farmers to a local and regional food market, maybe a local school, maybe a local grocery store, a local restaurant, you can create the opportunity for them to eventually get started and grow over time. Yeah, I'd love to be a partner with you in that work for sure. Um, I also just wanted to share, um, this is more disheartening information that I just received last week in one of the communities that I represent in the district. The Walmart um, in Cahokia Heights, Illinois, um, which is in the Metro East region, right near St. Louis, near other communities like East St. Louis, announced that it would close its doors in April. And I know we talked a little bit, you've spoken a little bit about food deserts, um, but this closure really has the potential to exacerbate an already existing food desert situation in a very underserved um, area of this district, limiting access to healthy food options for many of the residents in the 13th district. Solutions exist, as you know, like the Food Deserts Act to support the operation of grocery stores in underserved communities. I'm very proud to be a co-sponsor of that legislation. But could you talk a little bit more about what USDA is doing to help address the food desert crisis? We have a, what we refer to as the Healthy Food Financing Initiative, uh, which, in which we provide resources to community development uh, uh, financial institutions who in turn provide credit and resources to those who are interested in establishing a grocery store, expanding a grocery store, or the capacity to uh, better serve underserved or food desert areas. Uh, so we have uh, roughly $130 million that we've allocated uh, to, uh, to that, to that uh, actually $155 million uh, that we've allocated to that initiative. And so that would be one place where I would suggest the community might begin to think about accessing potentially those resources to see if there would be someone else who would be able to provide um, grocery uh, services. Great, thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentlelady as she yields back. Now I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Congressman Jackson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here today. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, numerous times throughout your testimony, you mentioned addressing the many challenges the agriculture industry has facing it today with outdated agriculture policies initially designed to address challenges from the 1930s and the 1970s. And obviously, I couldn't agree with you more on that. Uh, America's farmers and ranchers are still facing historic levels of feed, fuel, and fertilizer uh, costs that, that, they're, that they absolutely rely on to produce the food and the fiber that feeds and clothes the world. Not to mention the issues with finding qualified, reliable labor, disruptions to the supply chain, and barriers to global markets. America's agriculture is, I think anyone would argue, is uh, struggling to survive. The natural disasters that have wreaked havoc on most of the U.S. over the past few years have created many unique challenges and hardships for America's agricultural producers. To provide relief for farmers and ranchers throughout the country, Congress, has, Congress was quick to implement disaster assistance for crop losses in 2020 and 2021. While farmers were extremely pleased with the effective approach taken to expedite payments under the Emergency Relief Program, Phase 1, the, the changes that were implemented in the rollout of ERP phase two have been less well received. Uh, phase one provided straightforward relief for producers and minimized the paperwork burden for local farm service agency employees. Now phase two is requiring farmers and ranchers to disclose Schedule F tax information in order to get the program funds that were appropriated uh, to support them. Additionally, it has been brought to my attention that the USDA has instructed FSA employees not to help producers complete the documents necessary to apply for the ERP Phase Two in person, and if they have additional information, they, uh, they should contact a, a tax preparer. Another issue I have been hearing from producers in my district has been about timing issues regarding the winter wheat growers and, and when uh, losses were verified by their crop insurance agent at the end of 2021. Wheat farmers that suffered losses from the same disaster event but had their losses adjusted in early 2022, just a few days or weeks later, are still waiting assistance. The process used for ERP Phase 2 has become too burdensome and complicated for farmers and the FSA agents that are responsible for providing this assistance. With these issues in mind, sir, could you please discuss what, what's the department's plan for offering disaster assistance for eligible 2022 losses? Well, uh, Congressman, uh, the farmers that we're talking to about phase two are, con are, are small, uh, very small producers who've never accessed 
any of these programs because they don't have crop insurance, they don't have NAEP coverage. Uh, and so we are looking at a revenue uh, structure to be able to provide resources to these, to these, uh, these producers. So there's an element of agriculture that doesn't get benefits under the traditional uh, disaster assistance efforts. So we're trying to address that and keep those people on the farm. Um, once that phase two is completed, if there is additional resources available under that uh, uh, under the 10 billion that was originally appropriated, we're going to go back and take a look at any other farmers that may not have been able to meet the 70 percent threshold that, that is required uh, that, con that Congress has set and provide potential resources for those folks as well. We're going to learn from this experience and we're going to figure out ways in which we can improve uh, the, the $3 billion that you've provided for uh, uh, 2022 uh, disasters, and we hope to be able to do a, a good job of getting that resource out very quickly. Uh, I've made a note about the weed issue that you've mentioned, and I'll, I'll be happy to take a look at that and see whether there's something we can do to expedite those payments. Thank you, sir. And also, do you, do you think, I mean, I, I think one of, the, one of the things that I hear the most also is, is about the new, the new information that's required regarding, uh, you know, tax information and stuff. Is that absolutely necessary? Is there a way that that could be, uh, you know, uh, re-looked at? It, it, it's essentially, we're, we're actually looking at it from a revenue perspective as opposed to a production perspective. It's a, it's a different way of addressing those uh, farmers who don't have crop insurance. The reason why the ERP worked very well the first time was because we were using doc information that we'd already received about damages, losses that have occurred because they filed for crop insurance so they had NAEP coverage, right? If you don't have that coverage, how else, how do you establish the loss? One way to establish it is whether or not your income has significantly been impacted, and if so, this is how we're going to provide help and assistance to those, to those small, very, very small producers. That's who we're trying to help here. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. I think part of the heartburn is also, I think a lot of people are just worried about it. I understand where you're coming from it and what your issue is and how you're trying to use the information. But honestly, I think people in my district, in combination with things like, you know, the Biden administration's new, uh, in, you know, uh, the, the money that's just been provided for 87,000 new IRS agents is making people in the, in my district a little bit nervous. But I understand where you're coming from, sir. I just wanted to, uh, to pass that information. That is a concern for farmers and ranchers in my district. And thank you, sir. I appreciate your time. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chair. Gentleman yields back. Now, please recognize for five minutes the gentleman from Illinois, Congressman Sorensen. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for your time today. Uh, your insight, your leadership is essential to help Congress craft a bipartisan farm bill uh, that ensures our farmers, rural communities, and food systems are resilient and thriving. And from my district on the eastern banks of the Mississippi River in Illinois, uh, my thanks to you for your service across the Mississippi and the Hawkeye State. Um, I'd like to talk about crop insurance. It's one thing that I hear from uh, a lot of folks in my district in Western Illinois. Since the last Farm Bill, producers received $13 billion in response to extreme weather events as it has impacted their yield, which is why I will work to protect and expand the crop insurance program in the upcoming Farm Bill. The current safety net does not reflect the current levels of risk, especially in a warming climate as we see more increasing weather disasters. Uh, so my question to you, Mr. Secretary, are there options available and or being developed uh, through the federal crop insurance program to help farmers manage these increasing risks? Uh, we are always taking a look, Congressman, at, at ways in which the uh, risk management tools available to uh, to our farmers can be improved, whether it's expanding uh, coverage or whether it's making sure that we are keeping uh, abreast of prices uh, and, and what the risk actually is. That's an ongoing process and we're committed to it. Uh, we're committed to crop insurance, we're committed to it as a tool. Um, it's by no means the only tool, but it's a very important one. Um, I'd like to talk for a minute about uh, biofuels. Uh, last summer, uh, President Biden took bold action to address high fuel costs. Um, issuing an emergency waiver to allow E15 uh, to be sold. As a result, consumers saw the savings um, in my district of up to 30 cents a gallon uh, and across the country where E15 was sold. Um, as summer approaches, we may see an increase in the price of gas unless actions taken to permit the sale of E15 again. Do you foresee the administration permitting the sale of E15 yet this year? I know that that's uh, currently under advisement, but the good news is that there's been an indication from uh, the EPA administrator of a desire to make that a permanent 
fixture in 2024, which obviously would be beneficial. I think one of the challenges, I think, from a national perspective is making sure that the infrastructure that allows for these higher blends to be available to consumers, and that's one of the reasons why it's important to continue to get resources out the door under the, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law for uh, the infrastructure and the, and the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, we intend and expect to make, uh, uh, over the course of this year, quarterly uh, awards of resources to retailers to be able to expand distribution systems so that E15 and other higher blends are more readily available. Uh, in Illinois, we're proud producers of ethanol. Um, as transportation goes electric, um, I've heard from our producers saying, what's going to happen to us um, as we were producing the corn for ethanol? Um, as their trusted meteorologist for many years in Western Illinois, um, I said, hey, listen, we need to talk sustainability. Um, how do we make sure that we advance biofuels um, such that airlines and aircraft manufacturers are going to be able to utilize biofuels in the aviation industry? There, there, there's a grand challenge that the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Energy, and Department of Transportation are engaged in. The goal is to get 3 billion gallons of sustainable aviation fuel by 2030. Uh, our, our role at USDA is to really focus on feedstock and feedstock supply and logistics. And so we have, uh, uh, I think, roughly 26 of our experts basically working on this piece of it, uh, trying to figure out what is the best feedstock, how, how can we convert it, how do we make sure it's available. Uh, the Department of Energy is providing grants for the production of sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, this is a massive opportunity. It's a 36 billion gallon uh, industry that doesn't exist today that will exist and, and will more than uh, help those farmers who are concerned about what the next level is. By the way, we're going to have to have combustion engines for a long period of time, so I, I, I don't foresee that we're going to not have the need for ethanol, and we're seeing greater export opportunities as well. And I think you and I both agree that uh, farmers are going to be the heroes in the climate solution. And with that, thank you, Secretary and Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Gentleman yields back. Now I recognize the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Nunn, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, it's always good to have another Iowan who's championing not just agriculture, but serving in our government here. Um, sir, I want to first off begin with E15. You know, I want to highlight the fact that are you first of all aware, Secretary, that the EPA has recently announced a proposed rule that would allow the year-round sale of E15? Yes. Are you further aware that that does not go into effect until 2024? Yes. Do you realize that by pushing this out until 2024, we're missing out an entire summer that would basically result in uh, the lack of eight, uh, 1,888 new jobs, $20 billion reduction in consumer motor fuel spending, and uh, would prevent a $66.3 billion uh, contribution to our nation's GDP by not having year-round E15 starting this year? You, you're making an assumption that we may not have it. I'm not willing to, uh, to, uh, to agree to that at this well, point in time. Thank you, Secretary, because I'm very much on the same page with you. I think we do need to move forward on this. The EPA has the ability to move forward right. with the, uh, emergency powers. Right. Would you support year-round E15 starting this summer? I always have. Very good. I'd like to move forward then on uh, our rural broadband programs. Uh, both you and I work together in the state of Iowa on making sure that Iowa had access to rural broadband, but still one third of Iowa counties sit in broadband deserts. USDA has a huge opportunity here uh, to be a leader in this, and Congresswoman Spamberger and myself, through bipartisan efforts, have pushed forward with the support of 83 members, a House Appropriations Committee urging Chairman Granger and Ranking Member Delaro to provide adequate funding for our rural broadband programs. Are you also committed to making sure that high-speed internet for all of our rural communities is something that USDA uh, will stand with us on? You know, I'm, I'm pleased that we are uh, the $2 billion, roughly $2 billion, that was allocated under the bipartisan infrastructure law to USDA for the ReConnect program, that we will have all those resources obligated by, by this summer. Uh, and, and those are the first resources under the bipartisan infrastructure law for expanded access uh, that will actually be obligated. I'm looking forward to uh, our colleagues in the Department of Commerce and FCC 
working collaboratively with states to make additional resources, $63 billion of additional resources available. States are obviously going to play a very big role in making sure that the unserved or underserved areas receive the benefits of those once these maps are completed. So I, I look forward to continued working with our ReConnect program, but I think the real big opportunity is with the additional resources under the infrastructure law. So in Iowa, obviously, we, we know where those needs are. We allocated $300 million of our own money towards it. We look forward to the federal government actually allocating those resources forward so they can actually go to those communities. I'd like to move on to pesticides here. Um, in November of 2022, the EPA issued a proposal, an intermittent decision, um, restricting the use of common rodenticides. The USDA then provided a comment to this rule stating that proposed restrictions on the use of rodenticides would devastate U.S. agriculture, resulting in potential loss of rodent control, increased crop damage, and spread of animal and human diseases. Mr. Secretary, do you agree that these restrictions would result in the loss of rodent control? And have you personally been in contact with the EPA about restricting the use of those rodenticides? The process that we use, uh, Congressman, is for uh, our office uh, that works on these issues to work collaboratively with the EPA to provide them information, uh, which we have done and which we'll continue to do. Uh, the reality is at the end of the day, the decision is obviously the EPA's, and it's then our responsibility at USDA to figure out if there are ways in which we can use the conservation resources or other resources at USDA to provide help and assistance to comply with whatever regulation EPA is, is, uh, is adopting. Well, Mr. Secretary, I appreciate that, and uh, I know that you do a great job of listening to people across the this country on this. Um, you know, uh, Representative Bedinsky and myself, a Democrat from Illinois, we have a number of these type of issues that are very acute for our communities. We would offer you the opportunity to come out to either Illinois or Iowa in a bipartisan fashion and hear again firsthand from individuals in your home state and mine on why this is so important to them. Uh, and I guess I would ask, would you be... We've tried to communicate several times. I know you've got a very busy schedule on this, but would you commit to coming out and joining us here in the Midwest to hear firsthand from farmers on these issues? Congressman, I live in the Midwest. <laughs> As do I. <laughs> <laughs> and I have talked to a lot of farmers in the Midwest. I, I'm happy to come out, and obviously I'll be in Iowa uh, from time to time, and I'll be in Illinois from time to time, and I make myself available uh, to farmers all the time. We're, we're acutely aware of the issues that are out there. I yield my time back. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, gentleman's time has expired. Now please recognize the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Vasquez, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Vilsack, uh, I want to first thank you for the work that you and all of USDA do for New Mexico's farmers, ranchers, cattlemen, and farm workers, as well as those across the country. Uh, New Mexico is at the heart of the American agricultural landscape. Our state produces staples ranging from beef to our famous green chili, including my very uh, my district's very own famous Hatch Chili. Uh, but I am worried about the future of family farms in my district. During my first district work period, uh, I met with Dale and Dwayne Gillis, and in fact, actually brought Dale to the State of the Union address. Uh, Dale is, uh, and Dwayne are two brothers who own a multi-generational onion and chili farm in the Hatch Valley. And I'm not gonna redo They told me that they're finding it difficult to sustain their small family farm these days. And they consistently hammered one message. The biggest issue that they had wasn't water, it was farm labor, and how their farm and nearby operations have struggled to find local workers since the pandemic. Dell and Duane told me that they had 100 acres uh, worth of produce that they left on the ground because they could not hire enough workers despite a wage increase that they offered. And so at a time when our country is losing record numbers of farms and ranches, we can't afford to leave crops unharvested. Uh, Secretary, short of what Congress can do, and should do. What can USDA do to address labor shortages on farms like the, for, uh, the Hillis Brothers? Uh, we have a uh, pilot program that we're working collaboratively with uh, USAID uh, on identifying the potential of uh, workers uh, uh, in the Northern Triangle that can be identified, uh, that can be trained appropriately, uh, that can be brought into the U.S. Uh, properly, uh, and then basically uh, located in farms that would be willing to uh, embrace uh, these workers. Uh, we want to be able to show what the Farm Worker Modernization Act would, would actually be like if it were in fact enforced or enacted. Uh, uh, honestly, at the end of the day, there's very limited what we can do at USDA in terms of this. We can do this pilot. 
But at the end of the day, it really requires members of Congress to have the courage and, and, and the, the fortitude to get this Farm Worker Modernization Act passed, both in the House and the Senate. Thank you, Secretary. And as a follow-up to that question, uh, some of the issues I heard around is specifically with the H-2A visa program were around the housing requirements and also the lack of work authorization uh, for spouses and dependents. Uh, what are your thoughts on H-2A? How could that work program work better? Well, you know, in terms of the housing, we, we have resources at USDA uh, that potentially could be utilized uh, to expand housing opportunities and would encourage uh, producers uh, to take full advantage of those, of those, uh, those resources. <laughs> Uh, you know, we'll continue to work with our friends at the Department of Labor to make sure that to the extent that we can, we make the H-2A program work as effectively as it can. But frankly, um, I, I'm going to beat a dead horse here. If I, at the end of the day, it really does need the Farm Worker Modernization Act to get it done because then you would have a guaranteed number of people. You would have guaranteed uh, conditions for workers. You would have guaranteed uh, income stability for the farmers. Uh, it's the right thing to do, and it's amazing to me that it hasn't been done yet. Thank you for that answer, Secretary. Uh, there's over 24,000 farms in, in our state. Most of them are smaller operations, about 75%, uh, make less than $10,000 in sales. And as you noted in your testimony, we've seen record profits for large operations, but our small family farms are struggling. Small farms not only face higher costs, but don't have the resources to market their products the same way that large farms do. Uh, with growing seasons in competitive places like Mexico, overlapping with our own, our farmers are getting crowded out of the market. Uh, Secretary, how could we increase opportunities for these small farmers to advertise and sell their products in a competitive both state and national and global market? Well, there are four programs in particular. There's a local promote farm uh, promotion program uh, that has resources to be able to help farmers with marketing. There's a regional uh, farm uh, uh, marketing effort to try to create a local and regional food systems that can service schools, uh, can service hospitals, other institutional purchasers. Uh, there's a value-added producer grant program. Uh, there is a effort underway uh, to in encourage local procurement by state agencies that are using our resources to, to uh, uh, purchase food for food banks and for schools. And so, and we're also giving resources to local schools to be able to be able to purchase locally. So there's a number of different ways in which we're creating new market opportunities for small and mid-sized producers to access resources uh, and, and new markets that they have advantages to. The, the other issue would be farm to school. There are farm to school grants. We recently did $10 million, just to give you the power of this, we recently did $10 million in farm to school grants. It impacted and affected 123 grantees who in turn provided opportunities in 5,000 uh, schools across the United States. That's 5,000 new markets. Thank you, Secretary. I yield back. Gentlemen's time expired. Now, please recognize the lady from Texas, Congresswoman Dela Cruz, for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chairman, and thank you, Secretary, for being here with us today. You know, um, I I am in South Texas, on the border of Mexico, and of again, of South Texas. Uh, the Biden open border policy has affected many communities and specifically our ranchers and our farmers who have uh, suffered property damage, uh, loss of crops, loss of livestock, as well as the mental anguish of finding abandoned children, dead bodies on their farmland. That being said, uh, like my colleague uh, across the aisle, Congresswoman Slotkin said, uh, looking through this as a, in a national security lens is important. That being said, I'd like her and my colleagues across the aisle to look at border security through the lens of, as my colleague said, facts versus politics. Let me give you some facts and my colleagues. Do some, to, some of these flat facts include a 1,221% increase in Chinese nationals crossing through just the RGV sector, just one sector, where they're paying up to, car, paying the cartels up to 30, up to $50,000, from 30 to $50,000 each person. We are under great stress and our farmers and ranchers through their experience of, again, property damage, uh, loss of crops, loss of livestock, as well as the dead bodies that they find on their ranch lands. 
Now, Mr. Secretary, us Texans, we're resilient. And we look tough times in the face and we take them head on. With that being said, um, sometimes we do have to ask for help. And there is one thing that we do need help on, and that is the fever tick issue happening in South Texas. You see, the fever ticks pose a great threat to our agricultural economy of Texas and our domestic beef industry as a whole. These ticks carry cattle fever, uh, which attacks and destroys animals' red blood cells, causing high fevers and enlarged spleen and liver. That being said, um, in the unlikely chance that these parasites get out of control or out of the quarantine zone, which we have several quarantine zones in South Texas, we're looking at herds being devastated and livelihood loss. Can you ensure us that the necessary resources are put toward keeping the quarantine zone from growing and even commit to shrinking it? Uh, we're continuing to work on this issue, uh, Congresswoman. I appreciate you bringing it up. I know that we've invested resources and we'll continue to do that because we understand the challenge. And I would also say, just as a parenthetical to your comment about the, the uh, damage that farmers have experienced, uh, we have provided equip resources uh, to assist them in repairing of fencing and things of that nature. You might want to be aware of that. And I will make you aware of that the farmers and ranchers have said while there is that system, they have had great difficulty in actually accessing the money. And we hear that time and time again. And Mr. Secretary, I invite you to my district so you can hear from the farmers and ranchers in what difficulty they've had. In fact, we have so much difficulty that in the in Brooks County, one of the districts or one of the counties in my district, they've actually had to build a morgue just to hold the amount of dead bodies that they have found on ranch lands. It's completely unacceptable. And again, I invite you so that you can hear it from our farmers and ranchers in South Texas. With that, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Uh, now, uh, please to recognize, uh, I think Mr. Carbajal, uh, well, let me give me just a second salute just to make sure. I'm right here. Why don't I go and you could go back later. I, I know. Yeah, and you'll have me check later. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of tempted to put you last, but I'll be glad to <laughs> recognize my good friend from California, Mr. Carbajal. For five thank minutes. you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for being here today. I also would like to, uh, like everybody else before me, invite you to my district. I know we've been talking about finding a date. I hope we can make that happen. Uh, I think my constituents would really benefit from an exchange with you. Secretary Vilsack, the recent storms in California have resulted in losses of crops and millions of revenue. On the Central Coast, which I represent, there has been growing frustration from growers of specialty crops about their inability to receive disaster relief support. With climate change, these storms will not be the last to hit the Central Coast and other regions of California. Uh, what can Congress do to better support farmers in the aftermath of climate disasters to help them keep up with the food demands of our nation? Well, I, I think first and foremost, uh, it would make sure that uh, we get you a copy of this, which provides a full uh, a listing of all the disaster assistance programs that are available for producers. Uh, secondly, I think it's important, and, and we've talked about this today, about the need for a disaster assistance uh, uh, provision, if you will, in the Farm Bill that provides the flexibility to be able to respond uh, instead of the ad hoc uh, assistance that you've been providing. You know, one of the challenges will be, you know, always trying to figure out what amount is the appropriate amount. Um, you know, we did $10 billion one year, we do $3 billion the next year, so people's expectations are that this is what, you know, they're going to get a certain amount, and they're obviously going to be uh, surprised when that amount is significantly less than it was uh, two years, you know, for disasters two years ago. Uh, so I, I would say a disaster assistance uh, would be helpful. Thank you. And I'm really glad uh, I was hearing the testimony in my office before I came for my remarks. And I'm really glad that you are providing clarification to a lot of the misinformation that is put forward. You know, when I come to my hearings, I don't mind having a, a healthy debate with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. But when there's outright misinformation and BS that's coming forward, 
I think it really demeans the institution by not having the integrity of information that is put forward, like five million undocumented individuals on SNAP, which couldn't be more ridiculous uh, on its face value. You mentioned in your testimony that SNAP is a vital economic engine, especially in rural areas where there's a greater percentage of households that receive benefits. During the COVID-19 pandemic, SNAP was a key player in feeding families and helping farmers find markets for the remaining produce. Cutting this program will leave millions hungry through the country. Can you touch on additional impacts that would occur should SNAP be cut? Well, in addition to reducing uh, the, uh, the benefits and, and the access to groceries, obviously there is a, a number of studies that have shown uh, that by having adequate SNAP, you, you basically have better health outcomes, particularly for children. So that's at risk. Secondly, you've got the jobs that are associated. Every time somebody's able to buy more at the grocery store, they do that, uh, which obviously creates a, a series of jobs in the supply chain. Uh, and obviously, uh, every time there's a dollar spent at the grocery store, there are resources that end up supporting our farmers. Uh, so there's an impact there as well. Uh, so whether you, if you're interested in poverty reduction, if you're interested in healthier outcomes, if you're interested in jobs, if you're interested in farm income, this is a program that is part of, this, of the overall comprehensive nature of how we provide resources uh, uh, to, to assist people. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, you mentioned in your testimony that SNAP is a, am I getting these wrong? There are several challenges facing the farm workforce right now, especially with the recent storms in California that have left many unemployed. How can we best support the next generation of agriculture producers through the Farm Bill and other methods like immigration reform or workforce development legislation? Well, Farm Worker Modernization Act being passed would be very, very helpful. Uh, providing additional resources for beginning farmer and rancher programs, helpful to get people as they transition from being a farm laborer to a farm owner. Uh, ultimately, that's what we'd like to see more of. Uh, the ability to make sure that we can provide additional support for housing, uh, which has been uh, discussed here today as well. And there are a variety of ways in which there can be significant help. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Now I recognize the uh, gentleman from Missouri, uh, Congressman Alford, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for being here today. I want to talk about Chlorpyrifors, a uh, critical crop production tool for soybeans, alfalfa, cotton, and wheat important to our Missouri farmers. EPA Administrator Reagan frequently claims the Ninth Circuit tried to tie the EPA's hands and force them to revoke all tolerances for chlorpyrifos. However, they actually gave EPA the option to either revoke all tolerances or modify the existing tolerances. Secretary Vilsack, in a letter from September 20 of 22, you broke with the EPA's decision to revoke all tolerances and said, quote, OPMP scientists believe EPA could retain certain chlorpyrifos uses that meet EPA safety standards, end quote. The 2020 Democrat Party platform even stated the party's desire to ban the use of this provided further evidence that this decision was political. Mr. Secretary, do you agree that this decision was based on political science and not actual science? Yes or no, sir? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't think it that would be based. a yes or no, sir. Please. No, well, no, you can't. You can't define how I answer a question, sir. You can ask the question, but you can't define how I answer it. Is it? And the yes answer. Or the no? answer is: I honestly believe the folks at the EPA are acting in good faith. Now, do we disagree with them from time to time? For sure. And we provide information. At the end of the day, they make the call. But I don't think this was a decision that was political in nature. So it was not a political decision, correct? I don't think it was a political Okay, decision. do you, since the, the answer science. is no, do you, you no longer agree with the USDA scientists that certain chlorpyrifos's uses could have been retained? Why? What changed? Nothing changed. That, that is the opinion that we provided. You don't, sir, you don't understand the process. The process is we don't get to dictate what EPA does. We get to provide information to EPA. We get to provide the best information based on the science as we see it. We give it to EPA, EPA makes the call, and then it's our responsibility to figure out ways in which we can help farmers comply with whatever regulation. We don't make the regulations. Okay. I'm going to move on to the next question regarding China, because I know a lot of people have asked about this. is a big concern in my district as well. We have 95,000 farms. Um, you said earlier that foreign-owned land is uh, uh, 40 million acres? Correct. 
and that 1% of 1% is owned by the Chinese? Roughly 383,000 acres. That's a lot of acreage. It is less than 1% of 1% of... of I'm, I'm here to tell you, Mr. Secretary, this is a big concern, and one acre that is bought or owned by the Chinese Communist government or any agent thereof is a big concern, especially when it is near Whiteman Air Force Base in my district, no, home of the B-2 stealth bomber. Something I, has to change in I this. Agree, I, I, agree, I agree with you, Congressman, that we have to be very, very careful about the ownership of foreign land near any of our defense installations, which is why a recent situation in North Dakota was brought to everyone's attention. I agree with you on that. You know, in real estate, I, I had to give up my real estate license to do this job. Um, we, there's disclosures for mold, uh, radon lead, uh, sexual predators even. Um, the Chinese Communist government, it is a serious threat, as you know, to the future of our nation in all aspects. They have their tentacles in everything we do. Would you be in favor of a, a, a buyer's disclosure to the seller and that would go to the USDA uh, stating exactly where the money is coming from to buy sir, uh, farmland in America? Uh, the more information we have, the better job we can do of, of uh, implementing the law that's on the books. Right now, we don't get the information uh, that we need to fully, completely comply with that. Why aren't you no demanding question. that information? Well, we are demanding it, but the reality is we're talking about three, th as you know, because you're in a real estate business, every county officer gets deeds every single day, and they're supposed to report to us. The question is we don't have any investigative power. We don't have any uh, ability to know on a particular day whether it's Well, what would you suggest, and we have 30 seconds well, left? clearinghouse. What do we need to do to make this right before some, it's too late? Some kind of clearinghouse. Some, kind, some way of basically making it easy for us to know precisely what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Are you committed to working with this committee to make sure. sure that that happens? Absolutely. I would love to have a personal conversation with you. I know many others on this committee, especially those who are also on the House Armed Services Committee, because we see what's going on. The veil is being lifted. The Chinese Communist government is the number one threat to America right now. And we've got to do something before they buy up farmland and they start firing missiles at our stealth bombers. It's got to stop. Thank you. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Now recognize gentleman from Florida, Mr. Soto, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Secretary Vilsack, uh, for your leadership, uh, for showing your class act through what's been a long hearing. And thanks for traveling to Polk County, uh, areas near my district uh, just recently. I know you were very well received there by our citrus growers and our ranchers. I also want to thank you for helping dispatch uh, Under Secretary Torres Small uh, to Osceola County in our district to meet with uh, our good friends at Deseret Ranch, the biggest uh, cattle herd in the nation. And uh, we got to go to communities like Kenansville to talk about uh, rural broadband that we're helping fund uh, through the American Rescue Plan and the infrastructure law. Seven million already that's connecting hundreds of farmers and ranchers in the south part of our district, as well as meeting with folks in, in Orange County, too, who are doing urban and suburban farming. You know, we're home to citrus, cattle, ranches, farmers uh, with uh, growing strawberries, blueberries, tomatoes. Uh, uh, you heard firsthand about their challenges, as well as uh, Secretary, uh, Undersecretary Torres Small. And citrus greening is one of those challenges that you know very well. Uh, how critical from your experience from going there is the research and, uh, and making sure we have the uh, right waivers for um, certain herbicides and pesticides and for emergency relief uh, programs after hurricanes, the, the future of America's vitamin C source? Well, the, the citrus industry has been devastated by citrus greening in Florida. Um, and research is incredibly important. Uh, and the good news is that they, they, there appears to be uh, some research that is showing very, very good signs of, of, uh, of working. The, the challenge will be the cost of application of that research. And so there needs to be something that we can potentially do at USDA to provide encouraging more of that, uh, of that solution to be utilized. Um, it, and it's important to obviously have programs that provide assistance and help uh, to, uh, to those who are impacted and affected by disasters. And in fact, we in Congress have to make sure we get you the right resources, right? We saw a cut in some of the emergency relief uh, programs that uh, you lamented about when you were in Poe County uh, as we 
saw citrus growers recovering from Hurricane Ian, uh, as well as the research. So we need to get you the resources so that you can lead and do what we need to do for USDA. Also with our ranchers, we've heard a lot about um, beef competition and processors, uh, vaccine banks, even uh, our bipartisan bill uh, on um, black vulture population control. Uh, how key is, is competition to um, making sure we have the best prices at the grocery store while still making sure our, our ranchers make a good living? It's critically important, which is why we're investing hundreds of millions of dollars in, in expanded capacity and in providing uh, opportunities for existing processing facilities to sell uh, to a wider market. And in fact, under your leadership, we're going to see a new one near Central Florida that I know our ranchers are very excited about after many years of, of uh, really dealing with a big four. Uh, and, uh, and that's just un-American to not have that kind of competition. And then, of course, the SNAP program. Uh, we heard a lot about that already, but strengthening the temporary emergency food assistance program. I've heard from so many of our food banks in the area, as did uh, uh, Deputy Secretary Torres Small, disaster SNAP. And, uh, and what I really was excited about is all your focus on improving farm income. Uh, I'm thinking of the small family ranches in my district that are under 1,000 acres with a few hundred head of cattle. You mentioned conservation and new products like aviation and fuel. But what I'm most excited about is your concept for SNAP and school lunch through regional food centers. Uh, so for talking to local ranchers at home, how would these regional food centers help local ranchers and, and blueberry farmers and, and citrus growers connect to their local school programs better? We're eventually going to set up a series of centers across the country which, in which people who are interested in developing a local and regional food system and the supply chain would be able to get the technical assistance and the financial assistance to make that happen. Uh, we know it's complicated, and so we want to try to break it down by having places where people can go and get the information they need and, and assistance that they need to make sure that they get access to resources. And the paperwork's complicated, as well as the logistics to make sure we're getting food to our schools in time, right, while it's still fresh. That, that's basically what this is designed to do, is designed to simplify that process and break down the barriers that exist. Well, in one of our first hearings, we had the president of the American Farm Bureau here talking about that critical link between our local farmers and providing food to the SNAP program and how both of those are critical to the Farm Bill. So thank you for your testimony, Mr. Secretary, and I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Now recognize the uh, gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Van Norden, for five Thank you, Mr. Seven. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I'd like to briefly address this uh, SNAP issue we've been talking about. Um, I was raised in abject rural poverty by a single mother, and uh, we depended on the SNAP program. And then as an active duty Navy SEAL in combat getting shot at, my wife and I utilized the WIC program to feed our children. So I don't want anybody thinking and saying things like, we are beating up the poor and trying to penalize the poor. Those statements are inflammatory and they are not productive and I will not be lectured. That's just not gonna happen. So, Mr. Secretary, I find some of your comments in the written statement disturbing as you mentioned the word equity five times, some form of transform eight times, but you failed to mention the word equality or excellence. Um, we don't need to fundamentally change American agriculture. Our farmers feed the nation and the world. And unfortunately, some of the policies of the Biden administration are, are proposing and setting, we're on track to be a net food importer as early as 2026. That is not bottom up, middle out, that is bottoming out. The only thing that needs to fundamentally transform is the Biden administration's attempt, attempted regulatory overreach and a war on energy that is killing our farms particularly curtailing natural gas production for fertilizer and the 58% increase in diesel fuel since President Biden has taken office. Um, to put a seed in the ground, to water it, foster that, get it out of the ground, get it to a processing facility, and then get that to a market is all predicated on diesel fuel. So until the Biden administration figures out what they're doing and lowers diesel fuel costs, none of these food costs are gonna go down. And it's devastating. So I have a question for you, sir. Um, this committee is in coordination with our uh, brothers and sisters on the Education and Workforce Development Committee. We're working diligently to get whole milk and cheese, and I am the cheese king of Congress, just ask the chairman. 
we're trying to get this back into schools. Will you please champion this effort with us? Uh, you know, uh, Congressman, this is an issue that uh, we've, I've talked to the dairy industry about this, and I think yeah. uh, part of the challenge uh, that you're going to face with this is the cost, the cost associated with it. And I think as uh, the dairy industry comes forward to this committee and to me uh, with changes in the milk marketing order, which I think are overdue, long overdue, yeah. um, I, would, I, I would imagine and I anticipate that they will probably make some effort to try to address the cost issue. Will you help champion this with and us? We'll, we'll, I'll be happy to work with folks on this. Thank you. Uh, but that is, a, that, that, is, that is a challenge. There's, there's a second issue here in terms of milk consumption generally, and it has to do with the containers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's, there are a lot of things that have improved in the world since I, I was in school a lot. One thing that hasn't changed are those containers. Those yes, sir. Milk um, containers. If you, I have limited time, I understand. I, you're spot on. Um, <laughs> We introduced the Dairy Pride Act that's designed to make the FDA follow their own definitions that basically state that milk comes from a mammal. This promotes truth in advertising and allows Americans to understand what they're consuming and promotes the consumption of wholesome dairy products. In your professional opinion, does milk come from a mammal? <laughs> if you use the term milk, it has a nutritional a, a nutritional uh, uh, brand. I like where you're going. And I think... If you're going to use the term, then you ought to be able to establish that the nutritional value of whatever it is you're trying to say is milk is equal to or better than. So should the FDA have to follow their own definitions? Well, I, I, mean, I know I, you're not. I, we talked about sir. No, I, I, you got I, it? I, I think the, the regulation's on the books, and, and uh, if they want to change the regulation, that's up to them. Right on. But at the end of the day, I think the key here, the key here really is making sure that whenever people use these terms, that the nutritional value, the consumer's not confused. Yes, sir. And then my final uh, question is, you use the term build new and better market opportunities multiple times. Um, there are 1.5 billion Indians on the subcontinent. According to Pew Institute, 81% limit their meat consumption. That's 1.2 billion people. 39% report, self-report as vegetarian. That's 585 million people. The number of Indians who exercise dairy restrictions is nominal. So will you go on the record today saying that you'll go with me, some of my buddies from this committee, and some from uh, whoever else is appropriate, probably from Ways and Means, uh, to go to India to try to open up these markets for dairy products, and also not just for our farmers, but to help reduce the Chinese strategic advantage that they currently hold in the Indo-Pacific region? I'd love to host you. I, I, I'm happy to work with you on this, and, and I've, I had this job before. I know. And, uh, for eight years, I, I pounded on that door. Yeah. I went to India. I traveled to India. Uh, I, I think the opportunity with the, the, uh, the preference, uh, the, the generalized preferences, uh, India is very concerned about having lost that capacity. That is a leverage that ought to be used uh, to help open up those markets. Well, let's go. I'll take that as a yes. Thank you, sir. The uh, gentleman's time has expired, and his designation as the cheese king is accepted without objection. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. We now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Cesar, for five minutes. Thank you much, very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for spending uh, all this time with us and for recently uh, spending time with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. I, I learned a lot from from you and from your time as secretary. Uh, I appreciate how at the beginning of your remarks today you laid out how in the past there's been this view of get big or get out uh, that has really hurt our consumers and our small farmers and small ranchers. And now we're looking at a more bottom up and middle out uh, philosophy. I also noticed in your testimony we've talked about in past committee meetings how, for example, four uh, corporations controlling over 80% of the beef industry and meatpacking uh, really hurts our consumers in particular. And the question that I have, have starting for you is, it seems that at four, we have a large amount, enormous amount of co corporate concentration. Would it be even worse if we were at three or at two? Well, obviously. And do you think that it would be a, a helpful exercise for us in this committee as we work on things like the Farm Bill to find ways to better examine and potentially slow down continued concentration so that we don't go, for example, from four to three or to two? 
Well, I, I, I think that's part of it, but I think also uh, something that this committee could do and ought to do is continue to figure out ways in which we can help competition uh, uh, grow. In other words, help small and, and independently owned processing facilities be able to be located in appropriate areas. Uh, so I think it's a combination of, of making sure that consolidation doesn't occur when it's inappropriate, but also making sure that you're providing financial resources to expand competition. And the reason I ask the question is because I think there's been a good amount of continued conversation and good support for us to say, let's support those uh, smaller operations. Let's make sure that they can make it through. Let's make sure that even on sometimes uneven playing field of corporate concentration, that they can still make it. But I think there's been a little bit less focus on, well, this corporate concentration has continued to occur over the years. Um, when does it stop? Could it get worse from in, the, in this one particular area, go from four to three to two? What kind of, I know there's been some number of, of bills and amendments that have been discussed over the years on how we can uh, slow that form of, concent, of corporate concentration. What ideas uh, get kicked around in your department uh, on what the Congress could do to better uh, slow the continued concentration that makes it harder uh, for those small farms and small ranchers to keep competing? Well, one of the things that we attempt to do is to try to work closely with our uh, colleagues at the Department of Justice to make sure that they have information and data. Because at the end of the day, they're the ones who are making the decision about whether or not something makes sense or doesn't make sense, something is uh, anti-competitive or not. But in order for them to make a, a rational decision about that, they have to have data and information. And that's where we come into play. So the ability for us to have information and data that's accurate, that's comprehensive, that's current, becomes incredibly important. So that's one area in particular that I'd focus on in terms of the jurisdiction of this particular committee. I appreciate that. And we'll be, uh, you know, I'm brand new to the Congress, but seen uh, excellent work from uh, Abigail Spamberger and Ro Khanna and Mark Pocan and others uh, on trying to figure out how we can support both the DOJ's work but also USDA's work uh, to slow that corporate concentration while we support the, the smaller operators. So thank you for your time. Uh, and Chairman, I yield back the uh, remainder of my time to the ranking member. Uh, well, the ranking member is uh, not here. <laughs> well, if you'd like. Anyone else you want to okay. yield? I'll just, I'll just yield back, Chairman. Yield? I'm just trying right. to be polite. All right. <laughs> And the gentleman's politeness is appreciated, and uh, he yields back. Uh, now I recognize the gentlelady from Oregon, uh, Congresswoman Chavez de Reamer, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Um, I feel like I should invite you to Oregon. I don't know if you've been, but since everybody else is inviting you, I'm thinking <laughs> that should be the first thing I should do instead of waiting to the end. I know that I have the chairman uh, coming out with uh, the committee to see exactly what we offer there. So thank you for appearing today. Um, this little mic, I'm a little short, there you go. Um, I wanna talk about an industry that I often find um, that is left out of a conversation despite the contribution to both American and worldwide markets and consumers. Like many other members on the committee, I represent a state that produces an abundance of specialty crops. Our specialty crop producers face unique hurdles when interacting with the USDA. I've heard from many of our producers that the current offerings of the crop insurance program do not meet their needs or align with industry-specific risks they face. The program still largely operates as a one-size-fits-all. Uh, what steps in your administration take, uh, are you taking to improve these programs to better meet the needs of these specialty crop growers? Well, one of the things that's occurred uh, is a fairly significant expansion of uh, risk management tools for specialty crop producers. And when I first got this job back in 2009, the, there were very limited options. Now there are over 600 uh, policies that are being offered. To the extent that we can have information and data, we are very open to creating new programs or to take a look at existing programs. I know on the organic side, for, in, for, for example, we, we looked at the pricing mechanisms and realized that there, there needed to be some adjustments. Uh, the NAEP coverage also provides additional resources and, and uh, the, the way in which we're, we're uh, uh, administering the ERP program phase two also speaks to specialty crop producers. So, so we're open uh, to any uh, suggestions or information that people have about how we can improve uh, that effort. We, we're obviously interested in doing that. Great, thank you. I do have a follow-up um, on that. Uh, specialty crops have a smaller market share than commodity crops, which makes it more difficult for producers to access buyers and secure fair prices for their goods. What is your team at the USDA doing to support the development and promotion of those markets for those specialty crops? 
Well, there's the local uh, food promotion program. There's the regional promotion program. There's the establishment of regional uh, food business centers, which I talked about, uh, which will create opportunities to, so, to create the supply chain for local and regional food systems. There's an effort that we now have underway of, uh, as we provide resources for food banks and for school meals, we're directing a portion of those monies be spent with local and regional producers. Oftentimes, those are especially crop producers. Um, so there are a variety of, of, of assistance that, that we're providing. We're also taking a look at ways in which we can create more processing capacity in that area. Uh, there's been a lot of focus, obviously, on meat, poultry, and processed eggs in terms of uh, our, our, our efforts uh, at USDA. But we're going to—you'll see this summer on what we refer to as a competitive food uh, initiative, which is designed to expand processing capacity for uh, non-meat and poultry uh, products, which will provide opportunities as well. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm going to switch directions a little bit. Um, I recently held a farm bill listening session in my home state of Oregon, where I heard from many women farmers that they, like many other women in America, struggle to find accessible childcare. I thought that was unique when I heard that. We, we hear it often across the country, but in, in different industries. My office has been looking into options to ease the burdens for moms who farm, such as incentivizing the development of childcare facilities and services in rural areas. Make no mistake, the ag industry would suffer without their involvement, as you very well know. In your is your administration aware of, the, aware of this? If not, I suppose you could stop there. But if you have heard this, um, what is the department doing to ensure that all families have access to the support they need to, th to thrive both on and off the farm? Well, the one thing we can do at USDA is to provide assistance to develop, to equip, and to locate child, child care facilities to reduce the cost of actually starting up a child care operation in rural places. We have a community facility grant and loan program, which has pretty broad application, including the ability to finance child care centers and to equip those child care centers. That's an important consideration for us. Thank you. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. General Lay yields back. My intention here is to recognize Mr. Davis from North Carolina for his line of questioning. And then votes have been called. And so uh, I will recess after that, but we'll reconvene. We have a number of members who have yet to, to ask questions. That uh, There's only two votes, I think. Um, and so we'll gavel back in as, as soon as uh, the, uh, we complete those two votes. So now please recognize uh, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, and um, also to the Secretary for being with us today. First question is uh, for district that is role as mine. Members have just put in for uh, community uh, project funds request, and I look at the USDA community facilities account, and it's an invaluable funding source, especially in areas such as mine. However, the sliding scale for cost sharing under this account is considerably steep. Uh, Mr. Secretary, can you? Give me a sense of what criteria are used to determine these cost share requirements and what, if any, procedures are in place at USDA uh, to regularly review these requirements. Uh, Congressman, I'll be a general in my answer uh, and we'll provide you more specifics uh, because your question is pretty technical. Uh, but I think part of what we're attempting to do is to try to distinguish uh, areas uh, of, of persistent uh, and uh, long-term poverty uh, in an effort to try to make sure that we're providing resources in those areas. Um, but in terms of the, the criteria, uh, I think that's one, one criteria where if, if we know that this is an area of persistent poverty, uh, then we take a look at what we can do and how we can reduce the, the, imp the financial impact uh, to the community and try to provide as much support as help but, but as possible. But I, I, honestly, I, I'll have to get you more detailed information about the scoring criteria. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Housing is a major issue in Eastern North Carolina and USDA um, has been very helpful um, to provide vital assistance to the elderly in rural areas uh, with repairs and re rehab to their homes. Um, how has USDA responded to the increase in rising costs and inflation um, to help the elderly uh, with, with this assistance? Well, it's a, it's a budget issue, uh, Congressman. To the extent that we've got additional resources or additional capacity, we can provide additional help. If the resources are limited, then obviously we're going to continue to have the limitations that we have uh, because we want to be able to try to provide as much help as we can. 
And Mr. Secretary, I was um, using my time wisely here because I know votes have been called. So there's been a, a lot of comments made that you visit di certain districts and then others have made requests. And I think I even heard a request to India. I'm just going to make my request for Eastern North Carolina. How about that one? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. You'll back. Thank the gentleman for yielding back. Unfortunately, votes have been called. And the good news is there's only uh, one vote. Is that right? Uh, there's two. Uh, so we will return quickly to get through the rest of our members' questions, and we appreciate your patience, Mr. Secretary. Uh, with that, the committee stands in recess, subject to the call of the chair. We really thank you for being here. Uh, we've got just about uh, five or six more that we'd like to ask questions, and so uh, with that, uh, Mr. Langworthy from New York, you've got five minutes. Thank you much, very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for, for being here. And uh, this is a, a very important hearing as uh, USDA has gone unchecked over these past two years and speaking with farmers back in western New York and the southern tier and the western end of uh, New York State that I represent, the number one issue facing their operations are skyrocketing energy costs. Uh, in addition to this uh, administration's egregious green climate agenda, which also they're getting double hit by uh, the state government, it's putting our farmers' backs against the wall, and frankly, it's going to end up running some of them right out of business. Uh, our farmers have been left uh, with uncertainty in a lot of cases, and what we've gotten so far is very little transparency and honesty from this administration, uh, but I, I, I very much uh, am optimistic, uh, you know, that we can change that. Uh, is this farm bill will have consequences and impact on how farm policy is shaped uh, over these next five years. Um, and with that, uh, Mr. Secretary, I uh, wanted to discuss rural broadband. Um, as you know, rural development in the farm bill is critical as it provides funding for infrastructure and small businesses and job creations. I have a very rural district. Uh, and across the board, around 75% of my constituents uh, uh, live uh, have, have no access to the internet in, 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 in a broad uh, way. Uh, what steps can USDA take to improve broadband infrastructure uh, to support those that live in, in very rural areas, including farmers and their agricultural operations? Uh, Congressman, I'm familiar with your area. I went to school in upstate New York and um, uh, went to law school in Albany um, and lived in Richfield Springs on Route 20, so I'm, I'm familiar with the area. Um, we have a reconnect program, which is our principal broadband uh, assistance program. It's really designed uh, to uh, provide resources to communities to be able to improve access by increasing uh, upload and download speeds uh, and by providing uh, resources to be able to do that. Uh, we received about uh, almost $2 billion from the infrastructure law, and I'm proud to say that we will have uh, all of those resources obligated uh, by, the, uh, by this summer. Uh, so that money will be available uh, to projects as they unfold, and that should, that should begin to, to bridge the time when uh, the Department of Commerce and the Federal Communications Commission provide the resources to fill in the gaps uh, operating through uh, state governments to provide resources for expanded broadband access. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And I know that the Department continues to uh, state that the thrifty food plan revaluation was data-driven and science-based. Uh, however, the GAO highlighted the key role that policy decisions played. Um, as Secretary, what was your role in making decisions for the revaluation? Well, this is interesting. I'm glad you brought this up, Congressman, because if we had followed the prescription and direction of the, uh, the GAO, the increase would have been significantly higher than it was. It would have been uh, roughly 17, 18 percent higher uh, because they were asking us to use a different data set. Uh, we used the more conservative data set. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the calculations, when you don't do something for 45 years, it, it's not surprising that there would be an increase. But you look at basically the consumption patterns of American families. We're not we don't see families spending an hour to an hour and a half preparing food from scratch like we did back in the 1970s. Things have changed. That has to be factored. Uh, the choices that people have at the grocery store. We used information from uh, fr from specific purchasing. Uh, to be able to provide as an accurate a picture of what a family has to actually go through to be able to provide food for their family. So we, we, we very strongly believe that we followed the right prescription, we followed the law, and we came up with the collusion we came up with. And if we'd followed GAO, it would have been a, even higher. 
Now, was it you that authorized the acceleration of the revaluation? It wasn't we, we, it wasn't, we didn't authorize the acceleration. We were required by law by the 2008 Food and Farm uh, Bill that was passed by Congress to do this by 2022, which is what we did. Congress directed us to do it by 2022. Uh, according to the GAO, and I, and I know you took some numbers here, when the USDA accelerated the thrifty food plan revaluation in 21, it was done without having key project management elements in place. And the USDA missed um, a lot of good opportunities to identify ways to measure project success and to set clear expectations for stakeholders. And secondly, USDA developed a project schedule, but not a comprehensive project management plan uh, that included certain elements, such as a plan for ensuring quality you know, through the process. And then thirdly, the agency did not employ a dedicated project manager to ensure that key practices in project management were generally followed. We, so um, I'm, I'm out of time here, but, but thank you very much for your testimony. I yield back. <coughs> Thank you. The gentleman yields back. And now we go to Illinois for Mr. Jackson. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I feel obligated to also call you uh, my governor from a great neighboring state. And uh, my father and family sends their greetings to you. Appreciate your candor and your uh, preparedness for these questions. On rural broadband is the question I have for you. Uh, is there anything else that we can do uh, that needs to be done to speed up the facilitation of access and implementation for rural broadband? Uh, you know, Congressman, I think uh, what I, if I were in your shoes, uh, I would be reaching out to my governor uh, to make sure that he uh, and his administration are prepared to quickly review the maps that are being presented uh, and will be presented this year uh, to determine where the unserved and underserved areas are left in, the st in your state and make sure that they're accurate, because that, that's gonna drive where the resources go, um, the resources under the uh, infrastructure law. Uh, so that's number one. And number two, that they're prepared once they get the resources from the federal government. This is gonna be funneled through the state governments, that the state governments are prepared to quickly appropriate those resources. The other question, sitting from your position, and this seems like it's gonna be a hot button issue on SNAP, I'm hearing a lot of uh, people in my district that where we're having still grocery store closures, there are 6,500 tracks according to the United States Census where people are food insecure, they simply don't have transportation, mobility, or they may have the higher levels of poverty where our grocery markets aren't able to work and have profitable groceries. That's a longer term issue I'd like to discuss with you. But what is the benefit of SNAP that you would tell everyone in the Congress that we should know about why there, it should be increased and maintained. There's data that indicates, obviously, that SNAP is a poverty-reducing, uh, one of the most effective poverty-reducing programs, if not the most effective poverty-reducing program we have. There's also uh, ongoing uh, data collection and research that indicates that uh, with adequate SNAP benefits, health outcomes, particularly for children, are improved. Uh, obviously, uh, there are uh, you know, circumstances as well where employment is tied to the supply chain um, to, to the ability to have uh, adequate SNAP benefits. Um, it's, a, it's a process that is, uh, I, I think, uh, creates, uh, you know, if you look at the troubled places in the world today, they have two things in common. They have a lot of unemployed people and a lot of hungry people. Uh, and to the extent that we can avoid um, opportunity, we provide opportunities for employment and we provide opportunities for people to, to avoid hunger, uh, I think it makes us a, a, a safer place. Uh, so I think it, it helps to stabilize our, our democracy, which I think is pretty important right now. Can we talk about the growing need for college students to have access to SNAP and nutritional programs? Hunger amongst college students, I think, is an overlooked topic by many. Well, I think one of the things that's changed is the character of the person going to college. Um, we have a lot of, uh, of, of uh, single parents uh, that are trying to get themselves uh, an education and trying to get themselves uh, an opportunity for uh, advancement. Uh, and so the SNAP program can be uh, incredibly important to those college students um, who are uh, playing by the rules and doing what they're supposed to do and trying to get a better education. Um, you know, the reality is it also provides a little bit of help in terms of the cost associated with college, as we know, pretty expensive, um, and sometimes these young people are laden with debt as a result. Um, so it's an effective tool. And the last question is, do you think the SNAP work requirement rules are sufficient, 
or if they were to change, would it be have a negative, I, uh, unintended consequence? No, I, I get the I get the messaging part of this, but honestly, I don't think I, you know if we're really seriously interested about this. What we should be doing is working with states uh, to improve the employment and training programs that we finance under SNAP. Uh, we know that there are some states that do a particularly good job of helping uh, able-bodied individuals who are capable of working uh, to be able to find employment. I mean, it is the state governments that know who is receiving SNAP. It is the state governments that know where the workforce opportunities are. And so the, the question is, why aren't we you know, at the state level doing a better job of connecting the people who need the job with the, with, with the jobs that are available, especially in this labor market today. So it seems to me that's where the focus ought to be. If you restrict the capacity of a governor to respond to a particular crisis, uh, plant closing in a community that can, make, can be devastating, the loss of a major employer, I, I think you're going to find that, th that that's not at the end of the day the best thing by restricting the governor's capacity. I think the challenge here is to say to the governors, let's do a better job of using the millions of dollars we're providing for employment and training. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. back, and now we go to Florida with uh, Representative Kamek. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here today. I know last time we jumped right in on talking about some dairy programs that, in as you know, Florida, it's a pretty unique situation. And as you know, our dairymen and women have suffered doubly this past year. First, with the aftermath of devastation from Hurricanes Ian and Nicole and the residual impacts of the pandemic market volatility assistance caps that left them with massive shortfalls and disparities from farm to farm as a result of how the payments were calculated. I'm glad that USDA has made announcements on both fronts to provide additional payments from funds that Congress has provided, but none of those payments have gone out. Can you update us on the status of both of these programs and let us know what we can be doing to help get as much of this assistance of uh, as much of this assistance needed out the door and onto the farm? Uh, I anticipate uh, the the margin uh, dairy margin protection coverage uh, that, in, that that we increased recently will be going out very very shortly. Uh, what is very very shortly? Well. Uh, let me get back to you in terms of, of the actual time, but I, we're not talking about months and months and months. We're talking about something less than that. Can you commit to me that you'll have an answer by the close of business today? Uh, you know, I'll get you the answer as quickly as I can because I don't know, I might still be here by the close of business today. <laughs> <laughs> I think for everyone in this room, we hope that you aren't. Uh, and, but how about we, this? We, we'll get you. We'll, we'll, we'll compromise. By the end of the week, if you could have an answer back to my, sure. my office, I surely would appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Um, also, as you know, Hurricane Irma, as it ripped through the heart of Florida, um, our ag communities in 2017, um, they were absolutely devastated, particularly the citrus industry. Much like Ian and Nicole, it literally blew away an entire crop, leaving Florida growers with absolutely nothing. I was there when the announcement came on anticipated boxes for the year, and it was like being in the middle of a, a bad dream that you couldn't wake up from. So as you know, we've been working together on a block grant to make sure that the delivery of federal disaster money made it to the citrus industry. Can you commit to working with us as we seek to give the USDA the authority to, again to make sure that the citrus industry can participate in the disaster funding that was recently appropriated by Congress? If you direct us and give us the power to do so, we'll, be try to, we'll do everything we can to get the resources to people who are, in, who are in need as quickly as we can. Okay. You know, at the end of this, I'm just going to jump right to it. At the end of this, would you commit to meeting with me before the end of the month or the end of April? Because there's a lot of Florida-related specific items that I think need to be addressed that a lot of our producers are concerned about. The, the only reason I'm hesitating is because a significant amount of, of uh, the first part of April, I'll be traveling to the G7 meeting in Japan and, that, and Vietnam uh, on, on some trade issues. Uh, so that... That has a tendency. It makes it more difficult for me to, to commit to being in, a, in D.C. in a particular time. But we will certainly make an arrangement. I'll tell you, what I can commit is maybe a phone call. Uh, that would that be will a suffice. little bit easier. That, that, will, that, that can be arranged, I believe, in 30 days, okay. certainly. 
And shifting now to rural utility service, um, our U.S. and the uh, NTIA's BEAD program, which has really been working with the state broadband programs. I know that you guys have signed a memorandum of understanding and taken steps to coordinate NTIA and the FCC and on the broadband funding issue. Um, but what are the results of that coordination? Have you been able to assure that the funding will not be going to areas that are already connected because overbuilding has been a, con a constant concern? We're, we're sensitive to the overbuilding concern uh, and we're providing information uh, to, uh, to the other uh, entities in the MOU about where we are making investments under our ReConnect program mm -hmm. so that they're aware of where we are investing uh, as they put their maps together and as they make decisions about the allocation of the bulk of resources under the infrastructure law. Okay, and that's something that I'll definitely follow up with you on, talking about the broadband deployment issues when we have our call before the end of April, just putting that on the record. <laughs> uh, and then finally, turning to um, some of the, the more concerning news that's been coming out of Brazil. Um, obviously, I'm sure you know that the test samples were submitted to the World Health Organization for Animal, animal Health, and they tested positive um, for BSE. And that was on February 22nd of this year, um, but it indicates that the event of BSE started on January 18th, which was a difference of 35 days. Unfortunately, Brazil has a history of delayed reporting, which, as you know, could have devastating consequences for our markets. Considering their track record is basically a failed one of, to re of reporting on animal diseases in compliance with the standards, Will your administration, your agency, take appropriate action to suspend Brazilian beef imports until we can verify an equivalent level of safety and credible reporting in Brazil's food safety and animal health systems? I think that would be a mistake, Congresswoman. And the reason it would be is because we're talking about an atypical BSE incident, which we've also had in the United States. And if we were to restrict trade because of that atypical uh, incident that is not recognized by WTO as a, as a actionable interest, we would be exposing our own industry to significant disruption. Um, we have expressed concerns to Brazil about the lateness, and we've also made sure that our surveillance at the border is, is as appropriate as it needs to be to protect our industry. Mr. Secretary, respectfully, I think that's a mistake. This is billions of dollars that we will be susceptible to loss of. So uh, with that, I yield back. I'm over my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back, and now we go to California. and. Uh, Congressman Duarte. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Sec Mr. Secretary, for being here today. Um, let's talk a little about WOTUS and the risks of uh, farm operations with the new WOTUS rule coming down and uh, perhaps other regulatory issues, but I think we're going to focus on WOTUS for the most part today. Okay. Uh, I'm a farmer who was uh, prosecuted with threats of criminal penalties for planting wheat in a wheat field under the 2008 WOTUS rule. So this goes way back before before Obama, before Trump, before the new Biden rule. And one of the concerns with the expanded WOTUS rule that's coming is farmers just don't know what the rules are. Uh, we don't know what prior converted cropland standards are. There's no universal definition that I'm aware of. There's no universal definition of what crop rotation means um, or how farmers are to work under the new WOTUS rule to, in my case, I planted wheat in a wheat field that had been planted 20 years prior, uh, and wheat markets in 2011 were, were high. There was a global food crisis, similar to what we, we stumbled on with the uh, Ukraine invasion here recently. So we recommissioned idled farmland that had been grazed in agricultural use, but hadn't been planted to wheat for a couple decades, simply because markets didn't warrant that it be planted to wheat. Um, have you worked with the administration or have you worked within your, the USDA to actively promote what exactly are the rules that farmers need to follow to be compliant with the new WOTUS rule as published? Uh, Congressman, I encouraged uh, EPA to, uh, first and foremost, as they're developing uh, a response to a court directive to develop this rule, uh, to make sure that they met with farmers. Uh, and I was pleased to see that there were literally dozens of meetings that EPA had with ag organizations uh, that, in fact, they put together a farmer and rural advisory committee that included 30 farmers and ag stakeholders that made recommendations that were incorporated in the rule, that they had 10 regional uh, roundtables, three of which were led by Farm Bureau presidents, state presidents, in North Carolina, Arizona, and California. So to me, that's the first responsibility I have is to make sure that they are listening to farmers. 
Um, and then secondly, as, as they develop whatever the rule is going to be, whenever it ultimately gets mm -hmm. finalized, our job at USDA is to say, okay, how can we help? How can we help farmers with conservation resources or whatever it might sure. be to be able to comply? This is the, 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 the challenge is we're going to continue to go back and forth. Well, let me, let me ask you this. Um, you, you use the EPA as your lead agency to define what a wetland is or isn't and, and to it's communicate standards. They're not often interfacing with farmers. The USDA um, is, is oftentimes the lead agency interfacing with farmers, and many farmers plant their crops without a consultation of the EPA, as it was the case with me. Another issue I'd, I'd love you to answer is I was prosecuted by the Army Corps of Engineers when I wasn't under an Army Corps of Engineers permit, and when the EPA wouldn't pick up the case and prosecute me, they went to the Department of Justice Division of Environment and Water and got them to prosecute me because the EPA wouldn't prosecute under our, our set of facts. Are you going to agencies outside the EPA and looking for what their guidance is in terms of what cases will be prosecuted by, by them if the EPA demurs? Well, I think the first order of business, Congressman, is to get a rule. And we don't have that, really. We have, we have multiple rules in multiple jurisdictions. There's a, a great deal of uncertainty. And my, my, my plea is that we get some degree of certainty in this process. Well, I, I, would, I would venture then, the rule is written and the Obama rule was very similar. They defined wetlands with a lot of latitude given to the actual field agent at the very bottom of the organizational chart, as far as I understand, the Army Corps of Engineers and EPA, to determine based on their experience and expertise what is or isn't a jurisdictional wetland. So you not only have multiple agencies prosecuting with and without subject matter jurisdiction, but you also have field agents determining what is or isn't a wetland on their, quote, ex experience and expertise kind of on the fly. So I don't know how the, the administration seeks to have a unifying rule when, when they leave it really up to the field agent. Well, uh, I, I think there is an effort to try to be as responsive as we possibly can and get this thing fin uh, finally done. I mean, we've been talking about this for literally decades. Uh, and the reality is it's a result of a law that was passed in 1972, the Clean Water Act. I think everybody wants clean water. The courts have directed EPA to do this, and they have to do it. So the question is, when are we going to have the rules in place that we actually know what the rules are? We constantly have important I, stuff. Back I would offer, as, as long as we look for an expansive definition of what is and or isn't a jurisdictional wetland under the Clean Water Act, you're going to have pushback, and it's going to continue to vacillate back and forth. If the Army Corps of Engineers or EPA wants to regulate farmland in a way that's pretty much specifically excluded by the Clean Water Act in the 404 permit amendment that was done later, then I suggest they come back to Congress and seek that jurisdiction. I don't know if I'm supposed to respond. The time is up. But the reality is the Supreme Court has basically created this this directive and federal courts are directing the EPA to do this. It's not like the EPA is doing this on their own. They're being directed to do this. They've got court direction. Well, they've had a single judge that said something about a significant nexus. We can go into this. It's a federal so, judge. So when the, when the Sackett decision comes down here in a few days, weeks, months, the administration will take that direction, reopen this rule, and provide compliant uh, rulemaking for that decision? I'm sure that the EPA will do whatever the court directs them to do, because that's what you have to do. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. And now we go to uh, Representative Melanaro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. I, would, uh, I just would, would argue that uh, there was certainty as it related to, uh, uh, to jurisdictional wetlands. That was gummed up. Uh, I, I live in the state of New York, serve in the state of New York, and, and quite frankly, in fact, the state of New York uh, 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 guide rails were, were sufficient. But I'm not here to talk, talk about that particular topic. Uh, you would not recall, there's no reason to, uh, but uh, I uh, joined uh, then Congressman, I think, Gibson and, and perhaps uh, even Congresswoman Gillibrand in welcoming you to upstate New York some, some years ago. Uh, I don't recall in what, what role, but I, I want to... Um, uh, uh, focus on some of the challenges in upstate New York in particular, and, and thanks for your time uh, today. Uh, so my first question is uh, as it relates to the risk management agency's proposed rule. Uh, this drastically changes uh, apple crop insurance, as I'm sure you're aware. 
Uh, New York is the second largest apple producing state in the country. I'm kind of partial to Cortland apples myself, uh, as they uh, are principally in the 19th Congressional District. Uh, and there are approximately uh, seven, uh, 600 commercial producers across New York, including uh, dozens in my district alone. Uh, many of those growers have expressed concern regarding uh, the proposed rule, uh, as it is uh, uh, to them and to us det detrimental to apple farmers uh, throughout the Northeast. Uh, it doesn't take into account uh, varying conditions of uh, uh, regional family farms like ours. Uh, many of the growers have expressed that crop insurance uh, will no longer uh, be available to, uh, or, or a viable option uh, should the proposal be implemented as, it's, uh, as is. Uh, the RMA held an initial public comment period uh, and is now conducting a series of uh, listening tours across the country. Um, I'd, I'd like to know if the RMA is still considering significant revisions to the rule to incorporate that feedback, uh, whether or not there's an update on the timeline, and as I understand it, some of those listening sessions had, had to be rescheduled uh, due to the same weather the farmers deal with, and I'm hopeful that that period ex is extended to accommodate uh, additional concerns. I'm happy to provide you with details about this, uh, uh, Congressman, but I would hope that RMA uh, w would take into consideration what they're hearing uh, out there in the field. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy to check on this and, and get back to you. So some of the reporting requirements, and as I understand it, um, the, uh, in particular, uh, apple farmers are, are concerned they just won't be able to meet the standard as, as, as it's been initially proposed. So the hope would be, more than, than, than listening, that they accommodate some of those very unique challenges that uh, Northeast apple farms uh, face. Um, uh, broadening that particular uh, topic, fruit farmers in general uh, have concern regarding accessing crop insurance, and I wonder if there's an effort uh, to ease some of the reporting requirements to accommodate uh, their accessing that coverage. Well, you'd have to be, uh, if you could help us by being a bit more specific about what you mean. Okay. Uh, what I'd love to do offline is, is provide you uh, very specifically what, what they've identified. Uh, and if you're open to it, would love to talk uh, more in more detail. And we don't need to use a hearing sure. for that. Uh, and I and I appreciate that. Um, the uh, I want to just, if I could, uh, address uh, some concerns uh, in the area of farm labor, uh, specifically uh, revision to the uh, the adverse effect wage uh, rate uh, released by the Department of Labor. Uh, I don't. Um, I know from New York farmers that some of those changes uh, add an administrative burden that severely limits the flexibility of H-2A workers. Um, and of course, uh, uh, that's a challenge for all of us. Considering uh, that particular, uh, uh, those particular changes and, 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 and the rate is calculated based on USDA farm labor survey data, uh, I'd like to know if USDA had uh, input in the Department of Labor's rulemaking process uh, and what, if anything, USDA has expressed on behalf of those farmers. Well, I'll tell you what the USDA has expressed, which is passed the Farm Worker Modernization Act, which would have saved farmers hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. I, that's the answer, Congressman. Honestly, that is the answer. That's a broad answer, but we have obviously this specific concern. No, I don't the, wanna, the, the, this in, the, a, in the interim, Mr. Secretary, has, the, would the USDA? We provide information and data, and the Department of Labor obviously then makes calculations, and they basically run it through a process and a formula. And that's precisely why the Farm Workers Modernization Act is so important, because it creates a... a, a I appreciate your advocating for peaceful well, legislation. I'm, that I'm just, is the answer. I understand. In the interim, uh, having uh, USD... In the interim, having USDA at least advocate uh, within that rulemaking process uh, until such time would be reassuring and helpful to the farmers that are affected. Well, the... the <laughs> I'm happy to advocate for farmers, and that's what I'm advocating for, is a process that provides greater predictability than what we have today. So USDA is not, in this particular rulemaking case, making any advocacy or simply advocating for the broad, broad change of legislation? When you in say this rulemaking, rulemaking case, case, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. This is, uh, well, my time is, uh, is, is up, and I, I apologize. I'd be happy to uh, communicate with you off, offline. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Well, I thank the gentleman. Now recognize the gentleman from Ohio. Mr. Miller, for five minutes. You've been patient. <laughs> well, Mr. Secretary, it's uh, been a long day for both of us. Is my on? Is your mic, mic right. on? Is that working? It there is now. Uh, yeah, running back and forth between hearings is fun for everyone. But thank you for your patience, and thank you for being here today. Agriculture is one of Ohio's largest industries. Max, I don't think that you're, it is one. Sorry. All right. Does that work? There you go. 
All right. Yeah. Man, you really got to hug this thing. Can I get some time back <laughs> on the clock? Maybe it's like 20 seconds. I, I'm okay with giving your time back. We'll Thank get you a fresh chairman. start. You know, it's like in football, right? You throw a flag, got to get some time back. All right. That's right. Uh, well, thank you. I recently heard firsthand from our farmers and livestock producers regarding key priorities to farm economies throughout Northeast Ohio when I convened an ad ad agriculture advisory council of farm sector leaders. Volatile commodity markets, rising fertilizer and crop inputs, regulatory uncertainty, threats from animal disease, instable trading markets, and other issues continue to pressure the farm safety net, impacting Ohio agriculture. Runaway inflation in the last two years is having a terrible impact on America's farmers and ranchers. The spiraling energy and farm diesel costs are taking their toll on our ability to produce. Ohio ranks number nine in the, number nine in the nation in the number of farms, and nearly 90% of those farms are run by families or individuals. However, the U.S. Department of Agriculture's most recent farm income forecast indicates a decrease in farm income from the last year of $25.9 billion, or down 15.9% in 23. I look forward to working with you, Mr. Secretary, as well as members of this committee on the upcoming Farm Bill policies to provide an opportunity to address the broad range of challenges to the farmers and livestock producers in my congressional district and throughout the country. While international trade is a critical market component impacting Ohio agricultural producers, I understand the U.S. Department of Agriculture forecasts U.S. agricultural exports to be $5.5 billion, less than had been forecasted back in November. USDA anticipates exports for all major commodity groups to be reduced with the largest decreases projected for corn, sorghum, and soybeans. And this was from USDA Economic Research Service, February uh, 23, 23. Mr. Secretary, you have called publicly for reauthorization of Trade Promotion Authority, an important tool in the negotiation of international trade agreements. Absent Trade Promotion Authority, how can we best help expand our overseas markets? A uh, couple of things, uh, uh, Congressman. First of all, Keys to trade are people, uh, presence, and promotion. Uh, expanded trade missions are, are one strategy for getting more information out and, and getting opportunities, uh, making sure that we continue to support the uh, foreign market development programs, the MAP program, to be able to provide resources for cooperators so that they, in turn, can be out there marketing U.S. products, uh, looking for opportunities to break down barriers, uh, whether it's in the Indo-Pacific economic framework, looking at trade barriers that exist, SPS issues that exist, breaking them down similar to what we've done, uh, for example, in, in, in uh, Japan with uh, increased beef uh, opportunities by, by uh, adjusting the beef, uh, the beef quota. Uh, so there are a multitude of ways in which we can make a difference in terms of trade um, with, without necessarily fo focusing solely on trade agreements. And that's, that's what we're focused on right now. I can tell you in the last two years, $15 billion of new or expanded market access has been created by virtue of what we've been doing at USDA. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. And if you can help me work uh, with our, our ally to the north and get our tariffs off dairy uh, from the USDA well, agreement that they the, violated. No, no that's, and that's why we've, we've gone to the consultation route not, not once but twice with our Canadian friends. And we're going to continue to focus on that until we finally Thank get – a decent implementation of USMCA. And that's important because that's what builds trust in trade, uh, is the fact that when you have a trade agreement, you actually live by it. Right. Uh, and that's pr precisely why we're pursuing our friends in Canada as well as our friends down south. Big dairy producers down in Wayne County in the 7th. So I'd love to see that go away. In the absence of new agricultural market access opportunities, the enforcement of existing trade agreements becomes even more important, including Canada's adherence to its dairy market access, as I just touched on, obligations under the USMCA. Can you provide an update on when we can expect a ruling on the ongoing USMCA Dairy Dispute Settlement Panel? Additionally, if the United States were to win this second panel, will you commit to working with other administration officials and our overseas counterparts to ensure Canadian compliance? We will continue to work until we get a satisfactory response from our Canadian friends. Uh, the, the timing of, of the consultation and the, and the, the uh, decision-making process, uh, I, and I don't want to give you uh, precise because I'm not sure, it, it depends. Uh, but I can tell you as soon as that, that process is completed, if in fact we are successful, we will press Canada for meaningful changes to their uh, tariff uh, quota and, their, uh, and the way in which they implement this quota. Uh, they play games, and they've been playing games forever, and uh, this is the first time we've actually called them on it. Um, we weren't satisfied with the first response from the first consultation process. That's why we brought the second one. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I do have a couple more questions, but I want to be respectful of your time and everyone else's. So, Chairman, I yield back and thank you.
I thank the gentleman. He yields back. Now recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Congressman Bacon, for five minutes. Thank you, sir, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, from your neighbor from Nebraska. I have a couple of questions dealing with foot mouth disease, trade, E15. So we'll start off with foot mouth disease. It was largely my initiative back in the last farm bill to try to get that in the farm bill. Can you just give us an update how we're doing? Are we operational with the foot mouth disease vaccine bank and what else do we need to do to even make it better? Uh, we are operational. We are in the process of purchasing vaccine and stockpiling it. And we're in the process of making the conversion from Plum Island to Manhattan, Kansas in terms of the MBATH facility, okay. which should probably be completed sometime in 2024. That's where the vaccine bank will be housed. That's where our counter uh, surveillance measures and so forth will also be, uh, will, will be uh, operated out of. I think that's a success for our ranchers, and I, I appreciate that. How are we coming along with African swine fever? Are we nearing a spot where we can start doing vaccines, or is there more research needs to be done? Uh, there, I think there are three efforts that need to be addressed here. First, uh, the need to try to rectify the circumstances in the Dominican Republic and Haiti. We've invested resources, we've invested time and personnel to try to do that. Uh, more progress in the Dominican Republic than Haiti simply because of the nature of uh, the government down there. Uh, having said that, we need to, and we have, bolstered our bio uh, surveillance and security uh, on our own border. Uh, we've created the zone within Puerto Rico. We are uh, increasing our canine presence in, in uh, uh, airports and in and ports of entry uh, to make sure that nothing is coming in that could potentially create a problem. And we continue to work on vaccine. Uh, there's a vaccine uh, study in, in Vietnam uh, that uh, has promising results. We're not quite there yet, but we're going to continue to focus on trying to figure out uh, 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 at, that, at the MBATH facility uh, what we can do in terms of ultimately getting to a point where we've got a vaccine. Thank you. A trade is obviously a top priority for Iowa farmers, ranchers, as well as Nebraska. How is China doing with its meeting its agreements? W with its China is China meeting its that love the the first phase agreements or the, are they they're, falling they're, short? They're continuing to purchase at a at a, at, at an, you know a pretty significant rate, which uh, allows us at this point in time to look like we might have a trade surplus as opposed to a deficit, which was originally projected. Mm -hmm. Having said that, they are not at where they where they promised to be, which is no, no surprise. Yeah. How about Mexico with what I would say, the break in the treaty agreements when it comes to the corn? Are, are, we, are we making progress with them? Well, we, we have started the consultation process because frankly, we weren't satisfied with the reaction and response to the questions and concerns we expressed uh, to, and I've made two visits to Mexico to speak directly to the president of Mexico about this. Uh, they're, they're continuing to purchase our corn, uh, not the white corn, but mm -hmm. uh, certainly the yellow corn. Uh, but this is a very important issue for us. We have to make sure that we are very firm about this because it underlines our entire approach to, to trade. You have to have a science-based system. If you basically begin to inject culture, or you inject things that are non-scientific, it, it's going to be very destructive to the trade system globally. So this is a very important case for us. So we're going to continue to push it. I'll just make a statement on the E15. You know how important it is for Iowans and Nebraskans. So we appreciate you helping us make that a year-round requirement for E15. Um, I'd like to go down to something we call the cliff effect with SNAP, but it affects a lot of our social programs. Uh, we had a, a hearing in the last Congress. Uh, the Democrat experts, two of the three, said there was a cliff, cliff effect. One said not. And the Republican witness said there was. Bottom line is you get a certain point in earnings. If you earn a dollar more, you could lose 400 to $600 in benefits. So it seems to me that that's a reality. Would you be interested in working with us to find a way to decrement the, the support so that we can incentivize full-time work and promotions so someone feels like they're not taking a pay cut if they, if they get more money? I, I, you know, I'm happy to take a take a look at what you mm -hmm. what you're uh, concerned about, uh, Congressman. I you know I think we we all, always ought to be open to taking a look at things. Uh, I'm happy to 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 make sure our team works with your team to see what what works and what doesn't. I just think we have an opportunity instead of someone taking a dollar more and losing 400. If we decremented that down a bits at a time, uh, then they're not taking a pay cut when they get the pay raise or the full time job. And I think that's what we need right now. We want to incentivize people to, to feel like they can achieve their dreams and not be held down. And I think we, so we have an opportunity to make improvement here, I believe. And I'd like us to look at it, and I appreciate your willingness to take a look at it. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. 
gentleman yells back, and now I recognize the chairman of the subcommittee on conservation, research, and biotechnology, uh, Congressman Dr. Baird, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate that. And uh, Mr. Secretary, we sure appreciate you being here. And I've heard a lot of folks mention uh, mention inviting you to, the, to their state, Iowa for one, and Illinois, Nebraska. So uh, I want to extend a, a, a very good Hoosier welcome to you to come to Indiana. And you know, you as you well know, Indiana has uh, quite a significant agricultural presence. And so, and I know you've been there before. So. I extend that invitation. I guess I've got a couple of questions that uh, I think you'll find relatively easy uh, with all the other questions you've had. Um, but, but, the, but the USDA laid out a 24 budget uh, to develop a science-based regulatory pathway. And so I'm getting around to animal biotechnology and I'm really seized, pleased uh, to see this development uh, which the budget described as secretarial, high priority. And uh, this proposal addresses the concerns raised by myself and Congresswoman Plaskett in a letter to you. And while I'm supportive, I don't uh, see that we've made any plans and it seems to be unclear. So my question is, can you clarify USDA's proposal and timeline for implementing a plan to develop a science-based regulatory pathway for products of animal biotechnology at USDA? Uh, Congressman, we're still in the process of trying to uh, distinguish responsibilities between the USDA and the FDA um, in terms of uh, animals that are being produced for food production, animals that are being produced for uh, potential health benefits. Uh, and we're in the process of negotiating and conversating, having conversations with the FDA uh, my hope is that in the very near future, uh, those conversations will ultimately lead to an agreement in terms of jurisdiction uh, so that we provide some degree of clarity and certainty to the industry. I understand the importance of getting this done quickly because the industry wants to move forward and move ahead. They need to know what the rules are, and we're working on it. Very good. I'm glad to hear that because I think that is an issue some folks are concerned about. So my second question deals with animal feed ingredient innovation and regulation. Uh, you know, it's a similar question to the first one uh, regarding a science-based regulatory pathway for products of animal biotechnology. And regulatory hurdles are preventing FDA's approval of innovative feed ingredients with forward-leaning environmental benefits. And I'm thinking about the methane uh, reduction in cattle for those ingredients. And so I think we're falling behind because of this uh, slow process. So my question is, how has USDA engaged uh, with FDA to help modernize the agency's approval process so that the farmers can have access to these feed additives? And it's very similar to your last question, but give me an opportunity to. Yeah, on that specific issue, um, we've really, first and foremost, we've tried to advise uh, our friends at FDA about the reaction and attitude of other countries uh, in terms of this same feed additive and what, how they've approached it as a feed additive as opposed to a pharmaceutical. Uh, part of the problem with our current uh, structure is FDA is treating this as a pharmaceutical and not necessarily as a feed additive, which, which creates more time, more expense. Um, New Zealand, uh, the EU, uh, see this differently, and as a result, they're putting it into the market more quickly, which provides them uh, potentially a, a, a market advantage. And we've tried to explain that to our friends at the FDA. We'll continue to do that. Um, and hopefully, uh, eventually, they get it done. <laughs> because it is a, a significant reducer of methane, uh, which obviously we're all interested in, in having. So uh, I appreciate, I uh, hope you will continue that conversation with them. And I know you will. And so with that, uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Well, I thank the gentleman uh, for yielding back. And uh, 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 Mr. Secretary, thank you again for uh, making sure I, didn't, I don't see anybody else sitting here, so we're good. Uh, thank you for your patience and your endurance. Uh, and as always, we appreciate your engagement. 
and I look forward to a productive partnership as we continue crafting an effective farm bill that works for all of agriculture. I'm, I'm proud to be the, uh, uh, oh, the, the third uh, member of Congress from Pennsylvania to ever chair the House Agriculture Committee. We had the first one in 1820. And then we had one just prior to the Civil War. I'm hoping that person didn't contribute to the Civil War. Uh, I don't know much anything about them. Uh, and, I'm, uh, and I'm the third. And uh, based on my review of the facts, you are the first member of Congress to be, or first U.S. Secretary of Agriculture to be born in Pennsylvania. And, uh, and so we're uh, kind of, I know Iowa claims you, but we're pretty proud of that fact too. So uh, um, we, uh, uh, on behalf of the ranking member who had obligations he really tried to get out of but he couldn't, and myself, I want to, th uh, I want to thank, thank you, Secretary, for you and your staff uh, for your preparation, your time, your work, your endurance, and your service. Uh, I want to thank our members. Uh, we had great participation today. Uh, I want to thank our staff because we couldn't do any of this without all of our, our committee staff and our personal staff and much appreciated. As we prepare for the 2023 Farm Bill, this hearing and our future hearings and listening sessions are instrumental, especially bringing the voices from those who produce, process, and quite frankly, consume our food, fiber, energy, and building resources. And Mr. Secretary, I appreciate uh, the words that you used in your opening statement in concert. And that, that which is done, quite frankly, because that describes uh, how we're gonna do the best possible job uh, with this coming farm bill. Uh, and quite frankly, all the responsibilities that we have outside the farm bill as well, uh, that maybe folks, some people aren't familiar with, but we have that responsibility as the House Committee on Agriculture. Uh, uh, in concert is important to me because I believe that that which is done unilaterally is destined to fail in fulfilling the intended purpose. Uh, so I appreciate your commitment to work in partnership and in concert as we move forward. Uh, we heard questions identifying important issues that will be addressed in the Farm Bill from, from our members, and thank you for your responses. Uh, alphabetically, I couldn't identify anything with a Z. There was probably something out there, but we, uh, we went from uh, animal health to yellow corn. And uh, uh, I want to note for our members that uh, you know there were a lot of questions outside the jurisdiction of what you have control over with the EPA and some of their actions, which quite frankly have hurt American farmers. Uh, and I'm pleased to announce that um, Administrator Reagan has uh, accepted an invitation to come and, and be before the committee. So we, we have some of the questions you received, or we'll, we have a, maybe a more appropriate place to, to, uh, to ask those questions here sometime in, in the future. Uh, uh, we heard about nutrition. And quite frankly, farmers feed and nutrition matters. Uh, there are... Uh, I, I'm an old Boy Scout, so I, everything I do, I use principle-based leadership, and we've used that now for over two years in the committee, and we define our principles ahead of time, and we use that on, like the true north arrow on a compass to, to keep us pointed in the right direction. Uh, and uh, quite frankly, there are a lot of distractions and disruptions when you're serving in Congress, but this keeps us focused. When it comes to the nutrition title, four pretty simple uh, uh, principles. Number one, this is 2023, we should be look to, to leverage whatever flexibility and innovation we can uh, within that nutrition title. Now, which is a lot more than, than uh, SNAP EBT. You know, it's, uh, um, as we know, it's support for, for uh, um, uh, food banks and food pantries. It's, uh, uh, there's some great programs well beyond uh, the SNAP program, which is a great program. Uh, number two, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, the, the Congress, uh, and past administrations, as we've had farm bills uh, enacted or passed and enacted into law, have always been committed to helping these uh, these folks uh, through work op uh, work opportunities um, and moving people towards independence, uh, financial independence. Um, and so, financial independence is something we should obviously is the right thing to do for for folks who are struggling financially. Number number three is program integrity. Uh, you know, we have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that uh, I personally don't believe, as I've looked at the data, there's a tremendous amount of widespread fraud uh, within the SNAP program. But we know that some, like in all programs, always exists, and, and we have an obligation to, to, to do our best to, uh, to address even the smallest amount of fraud that may be out there. And number four, 
And I think we all share this commitment to healthy foods and healthy eating. So those are the four principles that, uh, that uh, as far as I'm concerned, will guide us uh, as we go through this process on Title IV, the nutrition title. There's a lot on the line as well. Um, uh, uh, as we strive for a bipartisan, bicameral, on-time, and highly effective farm bill, um, a lot on the line for those that, that produce, those who process, and quite frankly, those who consume. Well, that would be everybody uh, in, the, in the country. And the bottom line, if, if farm families fail, all American families will fail in the end. Uh, as we close today, I did want to briefly circle, not really looking for a response, but I just want to make sure I just fully teed up uh, a, uh, a topic that I ran out of time to, to touch on earlier. Uh, but as been mentioned in several times today, the pending Packers and Stockyards uh, regulation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, your comments earlier to Ms. Spanberger about the expanding powers of the Packers and Stockyards Act underscores the concern I mentioned in my opening statement about unilateral administrative action exceeding the bounds of congressional intent and statutory authority. You're obviously knowledgeable and passionate about these so-called gypsum rules, having pushed them three different times during your terms as secretary. And given your experience, you're also acutely aware of the controversial nature of these uh, rules and widespread concerns about these their unintended market consequences. And so far during this round of rulemaking, we've only seen two parts of the plan and are still waiting on a third. So without all three proposals in hand, it's, it's impossible to evaluate their full impact at this point. But frankly, I'm concerned about this piecemeal approach and, and what I see is a chilling effect on the public input and informed feedback to the department. So Mr. Secretary, it's unlikely we're ever gonna fully agree on these policies, but at a minimum, I hope you're, uh, uh, quite frankly, uh, uh, the, uh, I'm hoping you're willing to commit to two, two things. The first ensuring is USDA will evaluate the costs of all these rules in their totality. And, and secondly, ensuring stakeholders have the opportunity to provide input on the full suite of rules well ahead of any, uh, any of the individual components being finalized. That's obviously that's the best way we all work. And with that, I appreciate you really taking that into consideration. And seeing, uh, um, and with that, under the rules of the committee, the record of today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days to receive additional materials and supplementary written responses from the, the witness to any of the questions posed by a member. This hearing of the Committee on Agriculture is adjourned.